Section 29 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 6, Chapter 5, Of Oaths. Oaths of Office and Duty. Their Absurdity. There are moral consequences. Oaths of evidence, less atrocious. Opinion of the liberal and resolve respecting them. Their essential features. Contempt of veracity. False morality. Their particular structure. Abstract principles assumed by them to be true. Their inconsistency with these principles. The same arguments that prove the injustice of tests may be applied universally to all oaths of duty and office. If I entered upon the office without an oath, what would be my duty? Can the oath that is imposed upon me make any alteration in my duty? If not, does not the very act of imposing it, by implication, assert a falsehood? Will this falsehood have no injurious effect upon a majority of the persons concerned? What is the true criterion that I shall faithfully discharge the office that is conferred upon me? Surely my past life, not any protestations I may be compelled to make. If my life had been unimpeachable, this compulsion is an unmerited insult. If it had been otherwise, it is something worse. It is with no common disapprobation that a man of undebauched understanding will reflect upon the prostitution of oaths, which marks the history of modern European countries, and particularly of our own. This is one of the means that government employs to discharge itself of its proper functions by making each man security for himself. It is one of the means that legislators have provided to cover the inefficiency and absurdity of their regulations by making individuals promise the execution of that which the police is not able to execute. It holds out, in one hand, the temptation to do wrong, and in the other, the obligation imposed not to be influenced by that temptation. It compels a man to engage, not only for his own conduct, but for that of all his dependents. It obliges certain officers, church wardens in particular, to promise an inspection beyond the limits of human faculties and to engage for a proceeding on the part of those under their jurisdiction which they neither intend nor are empowered to enforce. Will it be believed in after ages that every considerable trader in excisable articles in this country is induced by the constitution of its government to reconcile his mind to the guilt of perjury as to the condition upon which he is allowed to exercise his profession? There remains only one species of oaths to be considered, which have found their advocates among persons sufficiently speculative to reject every other species of oath. I mean, oaths administered to a witness in a court of justice. These are certainly free from many of the objections that apply to oaths of fidelity, duty, or office. They do not call upon a man to declare his assent to a certain proposition, which the legislator has prepared for his acceptance. They only require him solemnly to pledge himself to the truth of assertions, dictated by his own comprehension of things, and expressed in his own words. They do not require him to engage for something future, and, of consequence, to shut up his mind against further information as to what his conduct in that future ought to be, but merely to pledge his veracity to the apprehended order of things past. These considerations palliate the evil, but do not convert it into good. Wherever, in any quarter of the globe, men of peculiar energy and dignity of mind have existed, they have felt the degradation of binding their assertions with an oath. The English Constitution recognizes in a partial and imperfect manner, the force of this principle, and therefore provides that, while the common herd of mankind shall be obliged to confirm their declarations with an oath, nothing more shall be required from the order of nobles, in the very function which in all other cases has emphatically received the appellation of juror than a declaration upon honor. Will reason justify this distinction? Can there be a practice more pregnant with false morality than that of administering oaths in a court of justice? The language it expressly holds is, you are not to be believed upon your mere word, and there are few men, firm enough, resolutely to preserve themselves from contamination, when they are accustomed, upon the most solemn occasions, to be treated with contempt. To the unthinking it comes like a plenary indulgence, to the occasional tampering with veracity in affairs of daily occurrence, that they are not upon their oath, and we may affirm, without risk of error, that there is no cause of insincerity prevarication and falsehood more powerful than that we are here considering. It treats veracity in the scenes of ordinary life as a thing not to be looked for. It takes for granted that no man, 
at least the plebeian rank, is to be credited upon his bare affirmation, and what it thus takes for granted, it has an irresistible tendency to produce. Add to this, a feature that runs through all the abuses of political institution, it saps the very foundations of moral principle. Why is it that I am bound to be more especially careful of what I affirm in a court of justice, because the subsistence, the honest reputation, or the life of a fellow man, is there peculiarly at issue? All these genuine motives are, by the contrivance of human institution, thrown into shade, and we are expected to speak the truth, only because government demands it of us, upon oath, and that the times in which government has thought proper, or recollected, to administer this oath. All attempts to strengthen the obligations of morality by fictitious and spurious motives will, in the sequel, be found to have no tendency, but to relax them. Men will never act without liberal justice and conscious integrity, which are their highest ornament, till they come to understand what men are. He that contaminates his lips with an oath must have been thoroughly fortified with previous moral instruction, if he be able afterwards to understand the beauty of an unconstrained and simple integrity. If our political institutors had been but half as judicious in perceiving the manner in which excellence and worth were to be generated, as they have been ingenious and indefatigable in the means of depraving mankind, the world, instead of a slaughterhouse, would have been a paradise. Let us leave for a moment the general consideration of the principle of oaths to reflect upon their particular structure and the precise meaning of the term. They take for granted, in the first place, the existence of an invisible governor of the world, and the propriety of our addressing petitions to him, both which a man may deny, and yet continue a good member of society. What is the situation in which the institution of which we treat places this man? But we must not suffer ourselves to be stopped by trivial considerations. Oaths are also so constructed as to take for granted the religious system of the country, whatever it may happen to be. Now what are the words with which we are taught, in this instance, to address the Creator, whose existence we have thus recognized, so help me God, and the contents of His holy word? It is the language of imprecation. I pray Him to pour down His everlasting wrath and curse upon me if I utter a lie. It were to be wished that the name of that man had been recorded, who first invented this mode of binding men to veracity. He had surely himself very slight and contemptuous notions of the Supreme Being who could thus tempt men to insult him by braving his displeasure. If it be thought to be our duty to invoke his blessing, yet surely it must be a most hardened profaneness that can thus be content to put all the calamity with which he is able to overwhelm us to the test of one moment's rectitude or frailty. End of section 29. Recording by Arden. Section 30 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 6, Chapter 6 of Libels. Public Libels. In justice of an attempt to prescribe the method in which public questions shall be discussed, its pusillanimity, invitations to tumult, private libels, reasons in favor of their being subjected to restraint. Answer. 1. It is necessary the truth should be told. Salutary effects of the unrestrained investigation of character. Objection. Freedom of speech would be productive of calumny, not of justice. Answer. Future history of libel. 2. It is necessary men should be taught to be sincere. Extent of the evil which arises from a command to be insincere. The mind spontaneously shrinks from the prosecution of a libel. Conclusion. In the examination already bestowed upon the article of heresy, political and religious, footnote, chapter 3, end footnote, we have anticipated one of the heads of the law of libel, and if the arguments there adduced be admitted for valid, it will follow that no punishment can justly be awarded against any writing or words derogatory to religion or political government. It is impossible to establish any solid ground of distinction upon this subject, or to lay down rules in conformity to which controversies, political or religious, must be treated. It is impossible to tell me 
when I am penetrated with the magnitude of the subject that I must be logical and not eloquent, or when I feel the absurdity of the theory I am combating, that I must not express it in terms that shall produce feelings of ridicule in my readers. It were better to forbid me the discussion of the subject altogether than forbid me to describe it in the manner I conceive to be most suitable to its merits. It would be a most tyrannical species of candor to tell me, you may write against the system we patronize, provided you will write in an imbecile and ineffectual manner. You may inquire and investigate as much as you please, provided when you undertake to communicate the result, you carefully check your ardor and be upon your guard that you do not convey any of your own feelings to your readers. In subjects connected with the happiness of mankind, the feeling is the essence. If I do not describe the miserable effects of fanaticism and abuse, if I do not excite in the mind a sentiment of aversion and ardor, I had better leave the subject altogether, for I am betraying the cause of which I profess to be the advocate. Add to this that rules of distinction, as they are absurd in relation to the dissidents, will prove a continual instrument of usurpation and injustice to the ruling party. No reasonings will appear fair to them, but such as are futile. If I speak with energy, they will deem me inflammatory. And if I describe censurable proceedings in plain and homely but pointed language, they will cry out upon me as a buffoon. It must be truly a deplorable case if truth, favored by the many and patronized by the great, should prove too weak to enter the lists with falsehood. It is in a manner self-evident that that which will stand the test of examination cannot need the support of penal statutes. After our adversaries have exhausted their eloquence and exerted themselves to mislead us, truth has a clear, nervous, and simple story to tell, which, if force be excluded on all sides, will not fail to put down their arts. Misrepresentation will speedily vanish if the friends of truth be but half as alert as the advocates of falsehood. Surely, then, it is a most ungracious plea to offer. We are too idle to reason with you, and are therefore determined to silence you by force. So long as the adversaries of justice confine themselves to expostulation, there can be no ground for serious alarm. As soon as they begin to act with violence and riot, it will be time enough to encounter them with force. There is, however, one class of libel that seems to demand a separate consideration. A libel may either not confine itself to any species of illustration of religion or government, or it may leave illustration entirely out of its view. Its object may be to invite a multitude of persons to assemble as the first step towards acts of violence. A public libel is any species of writing in which the wisdom of some established system is controverted, and it cannot be denied that a dispassionate and severe demonstration of its injustice tends, not less than the most alarming tumult, to the destruction of such institutions. But writing and speech are the proper and becoming methods of operating changes in human society, and tumult is an improper and equivocal method. In the case, then, of the specific preparations of riot, it should seem that the regular force of the society may lawfully interfere. But this interference may be of two kinds. It may consist of precautions to counteract all tumultuous concourse, or it may arraign the individual for the offense he has committed against the peace of the community. The first of these seems sufficiently commendable and wise, and would perhaps, if vigilantly exerted, be, in almost all cases, adequate to the purpose. A firm and explicit language as to the preceding steps, a careful attention to avoid unnecessary irritation and violence, and a temperate display of strength in case of extremity, might be expected always to extricate the government in safety in these delicate exigencies. It must be a very uncommon occasion, in which the mass of the sober and effective part of the community will not be found inimical to disorderly and tumultuous proceedings. The second idea, that of bringing the individual to account for a proceeding of this sort, is of a more doubtful nature. A libel the avowed intention of which is to lead to immediate violence is altogether different from a publication in which the general merits of any institution are treated with the utmost freedom, and may well be supposed to fall under different rules. The difficulty here arises from the consideration of the general nature of punishment, which is abhorrent to the true principles of mind, and ought to be restrained within as narrow limits as possible, if not immediately abolished. Footnote. See the following book. End footnote. A distinction to which observation and experience 
in cases of judicial proceeding, have uniformly led, is that between crimes that exist only in intention and over acts, so far as prevention only is concerned, the former would seem, in many cases, not less entitled to the animadversion of society than the latter, but the evidence of intention usually rests upon circumstances equivocal and minute, and the friend of justice will tremble to erect any grave proceeding upon so uncertain a basis. Footnote, Book 7, Chapter 7, End Footnote. These reasonings on exhortations to tumult will also be found applicable with slight variation to incendiary letters addressed to private persons. But the law of libel, as we have already said, distributes itself into two heads, libels against public establishments and measures, and libels against private character. Those who have been willing to admit that the first ought to pass unpunished have generally asserted the propriety of counteracting the latter by censures and penalties. It shall be the business of the remainder of this chapter to show that they were erroneous in their decision. The arguments upon which their decision is built must be allowed to be both popular and impressive. There is no external possession more solid or more valuable than an honest fame. My property, in goods or estate, is appropriated only by convention. Its value is, for the most part, the creature of a debauched imagination. And if I were sufficiently wise and philosophical, he that deprived me of it would do me very little injury. He that inflicts a stab upon my character is a much more formidable enemy. It is a very serious inconvenience that my countrymen should regard me as destitute of principle and honesty. If the mischief were entirely to myself, it is not possible to be regarded with levity. I must be void of all sense of justice. If I am callous to the contempt and detestation of the world, I must cease to be a man. If I am unaffected by the calumny that deprives me of the friend I love, and leaves me, perhaps, without one bosom in which to repose my sympathies. But this is not all. The same stroke that annihilates my character extremely abridges, if it do not annihilate, my usefulness. It is in vain that I would exert my good intentions and my talents for the assistance of others, if my motives be perpetually misinterpreted. Men will not listen to the arguments of him they despise. He will be spurned during life, and execrated as long as his memory endures. What then are we to conclude, but that to an injury, greater than robbery, greater perhaps than murder, we ought to award an exemplary punishment? The answer to this statement may be given in the form of an illustration of two propositions. First, that it is necessary the truth should be told. Secondly, that it is necessary men should be taught to be sincere. First, it is necessary the truth should be told. How can this ever be done, if I be forbidden to speak upon more than one side of a question? The case is here exactly similar to the case of religion and political establishment. If we must always hear the praise of things as they are, and allow no man to urge an objection, we may be lulled into torpid tranquility, but we never can be wise. If a veil of partial favor is to be drawn over the indiscretions and faults of mankind, it is easy to perceive whether virtue or vice will be the gainer. There is no terror that comes home to the heart of vice like the terror of being exhibited to the public eye. On the contrary, there is no reward worthy to be bestowed upon eminent virtue, but this one, the plain, unvarnished proclamation of its excellence in the face of the world, if the unrestrained discussion of abstract inquiry be of the highest importance to mankind, the unrestrained investigation of character is scarcely less to be cultivated. If truth were universally told of men's dispositions and actions, gibbets and wheels might be dismissed from the face of the earth. The knave unmasked would be obliged to turn honest in his own defense. Nay, no man would have time to grow a knave. Truth would follow him in his first irresolute essays, and public disapprobation arrest him in the commencement of his career. There are many men at present who pass for virtuous, that tremble at the boldness of a project like this. They would be detected in their effeminacy and imbecility, their imbecility is the growth of that inauspicious secrecy, which national manners and political institutions at present draw over the actions of individuals. If truth were spoken without reserve, there would be no such men in existence. Men would act with clearness and decision, if they had no hopes and concealment, if they saw at every turn that the eye of the world was upon them. How great would be the magnanimity of the man 
who was always sure to be observed, sure to be judged with discernment, and to be treated with justice. Feebleness of character would hourly lose its influence in the breasts of those over whom it now domineers. They would feel themselves perpetually urged, with an auspicious violence, to assume manners more worthy of the form they bear. To these reasonings it may perhaps be rejoined, this indeed is an interesting picture. If truth could be universally told, the effects would no doubt be of the most excellent nature, but the expectation is to be regarded as visionary. Not so. The discovery of individual and personal truth is to be effected, in the same manner as the discovery of general truth, by discussion. From the collision of disagreeing accounts, justice and reason will be produced. Mankind seldom think much of any particular subject, without coming to think right at last. Is it then to be supposed that mankind will have the discernment and the justice of their own accord to reject the libel? Yes, libels do not at present deceive mankind from their intrinsic power, but from the restraint under which they labor. The man who from his dungeon is brought to the light of day cannot accurately distinguish colors, but he that has suffered no confinement feels no difficulty in the operation. Such is the state of mankind at present. They are not exercised to employ their judgment, and therefore they are deficient in judgment. The most improbable tale now makes a deep impression. But then men would be accustomed to speculate upon the possibilities of human action. At first, it may be, if all restraint upon the freedom of writing and speech were removed, and men were encouraged to declare what they thought, as publicly as possible, every press would be burdened with an inundation of scandal, but the stories, by their very multiplicity, would defeat themselves. No one man, if the lie were successful, would become the object of universal persecution. In a short time, the reader, accustomed to the dissection of character, would acquire discrimination. He would either detect the imposition by its internal absurdity, or at least would attribute to the story no further weight than that to which its evidence entitled it. Libel, like every other human concern, would soon find its level, if it were delivered from the injurious interference of political institution. The libeler, that is, he who utters an unfounded calumny, either invents the story he tells, or delivers it with a degree of assurance to which the evidence that has offered itself to him is by no means entitled. In each case, he would meet with his proper punishment in the judgment of the world. The consequences of his error would fall back upon himself. He would either pass for a malignant accuser or for a rash and headlong censurer. Anonymous scandal would be almost impossible in a state where nothing was concealed. But if it were attempted, it would be wholly pointless, since, where there could be no honest and rational excuse for concealment, the desire to be concealed would prove the baseness of the motive. Secondly, force ought not to intervene for the suppression of private libels, because men ought to learn to be sincere. There is no branch of virtue more essential than that which consists in giving language to our thoughts. He that is accustomed to utter what he knows to be false, or to suppress what he knows to be true, is in a state of perpetual degradation. If I have had particular opportunity to observe any man's vices, justice will not fail to suggest to me that I ought to admonish him of his errors, and to warn those whom his errors might injure. There may be very sufficient ground for my representing him as a vicious man, though I may be totally unable to demonstrate his vices, so as to make him a proper subject of judicial punishment. Nay, it cannot be otherwise, for I ought to describe his character exactly as it appears to be, whether it be virtuous or vicious, or of an ambiguous nature. Ambiguity would presently cease if every man avowed his sentiments, it is here as in the intercourses of friendship. A timely explanation seldom fails to heal a broil. Misunderstandings would not grow considerable were we not in the habit of brooding over imaginary wrongs. Laws for the suppression of private libels are, properly speaking, laws to restrain men from the practice of sincerity. They create a warfare between the genuine dictates of unbiased private judgment and the apparent sense of the community throwing obscurity upon the principles of virtue, and inspiring an indifference to the practice. This is one of those consequences of political institution that presents itself at every moment. 
Morality is rendered the victim of uncertainty and doubt. Contradictory systems of conduct contend with each other for the preference, and I become indifferent to them all. How is it possible that I should imbibe the divine enthusiasm of benevolence and justice, when I am prevented from discerning what it is in which they consist? Other laws assume for the topic of their animadversion actions of unfrequent occurrence, but the law of libels usurps the office of directing me in my daily duties, and by perpetually menacing me with the scourge of punishment, undertakes to render me habitually a coward, continually governed by the basest and most unprincipled motives. Courage consists more in this circumstance than in any other, the daring to speak everything, the uttering of which may conduce to good. Actions, the performance of which requires an inflexible resolution, call upon us but seldom. But the virtuous economy of speech is our perpetual affair. Every moralist can tell us that morality eminently consists in the government of the tongue. But this branch of morality has long been inverted. Instead of studying what we shall tell, we are taught to consider what we shall conceal. Instead of an active virtue going about doing good, we are instructed to believe that the chief end of man is to do no mischief. Instead of fortitude, we are carefully imbued with maxims of artifice and cunning, misnamed prudence. Let us contrast the character of those men with whom we are accustomed to converse, with the character of men such as they ought to be and will be. On the one side, we perceive a perpetual caution that shrinks from the observing eye, that conceals what a thousand folds the genuine emotions of the heart, and that renders us unwilling to approach the men that we suppose accustomed to read it and to tell what they read. Such characters as ours are the mere shadows of men, with a specious outside, perhaps, but destitute of substance and soul. When shall we arrive at the land of realities, where men shall be known for what they are, by energy of thought and intrepidity of action? It is fortitude that must render a man superior alike to caresses and threats, enable him to derive his happiness from within, and accustom him to be, upon all occasions, prompt to assist and to inform. Everything, therefore, favorable to fortitude must be of inestimable value. Everything that inculcates dissimulation, worthy of our fullest disapprobation. There is one thing more that is of importance to be observed upon this subject of libel, which is the good effects that would spring from every man's being accustomed to encounter falsehood with its only proper antidote, truth. After all the arguments that have been industriously accumulated to justify prosecution for libel, every man that will retire into himself feels himself convinced of their insufficiency. The modes in which an innocent and a guilty man would repel an accusation against them might be expected to be opposite, but the law of libel confounds them. He that was conscious of his rectitude and undebauched by ill systems of government would say to his adversary, Publish what you please against me. I have truth on my side, and will confound your misrepresentations. His sense of fitness and justice would not permit him to say, I will have recourse to the only means that are congenial to guilt. I will compel you to be silent. A man, urged by indignation and impatience, may commence a prosecution against his accuser, but he may be assured the world, that is a disinterested spectator, feels no cordiality for his proceedings. The language of their sentiments upon such occasions is, What? He dares not even let us hear what can be said against him. The arguments in favor of justice, however different, may be the views under which it is considered, perpetually run parallel to each other. The recommendations under this head are precisely the same as those under the preceding, the generation of activity and fortitude. The tendency of all false systems of political institution is to render the mind lethargic and torpid. Were we accustomed not to recur either to public or individual force, but upon occasions that unequivocally justified their employment, we should then come to have some respect for reason, for we should know its power. How great must be the difference between him who answers me with a writ of summons or a challenge, and him who employs the sword and the shield of truth alone. He knows that force only is to be encountered with force, an allegation with allegation, and he scorns to change places with the offender by being the first to break the peace. He does that which, were it not for the degenerate habits of society, 
would scarcely deserve the name of courage, dares to meet, upon equal ground, with the sacred armor of truth, an adversary who possesses only the perishable weapons of falsehood. He calls up his understanding, and does not despair of baffling the shallow pretenses of calumny. He calls up his firmness, and knows that a plain story, every word of which is marked with the emphasis of sincerity, will carry conviction to every hearer. It were absurd to expect that truth should be cultivated, so long as we are accustomed to believe that it is an impotent encumbrance. It would be impossible to neglect it, if we knew that it was as impenetrable as adamant and as lasting as the world. End of section 30. Recording by Arden. Section 31 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 6, Chapter 7. Of Constitutions. Distinction of regulations constituent and legislative. Supposed character of permanence that ought to be given to the former. Inconsistent with the nature of man. Source of the error. Remark. Absurdity of the system of permanence. Its futility. Mode to be pursued in framing a constitution. Constituent laws not more important than others. In what manner the consent of the districts is to be declared. Tenancy of the principle which requires this consent. It would reduce the number of constitutional articles. Parcel out the legislative power and produce the gradual extinction of law. Objection. Answer. A question, intimately connected with the political superintendence of opinion, is presented to us relative to a doctrine which has lately been taught upon the subject of constitutions. It has been said that the laws of every regular state naturally distribute themselves under two heads, fundamental and temporary. Laws, the object of which is the distribution of political power, and directing the permanent forms according to which public business is to be conducted. And laws, the result of the deliberations of powers already constituted. This distinction being established in the first instance, it has been inferred that these laws are of very unequal importance, and that, of consequence, those of the first class ought to be originated with much greater solemnity, and to be declared much less susceptible of variation than those of the second. The French National Assembly of 1789 pushed this principle to the greatest extremity, and seemed desirous of providing every imaginable security for rendering the work they had formed immortal. It was not to be touched, upon any account, under the term of ten years. Every alteration it was to receive must be recognized as necessary by two successive national assemblies of the ordinary kind. After these formalities, an assembly of revision was to be elected, and they to be forbidden to amend the constitution in any other points than those which had been previously marked out for their consideration. It is easy to perceive that these precautions are in direct hostility with the principles established in this work. Man and forever was the motto of the labors of this assembly. Just broken loose from the thick darkness of an absolute monarchy, they assume to prescribe lessons of wisdom to all future ages. They seem not so much as to have dreamed of that purification of intellect, that climax of improvement, which may very probably be the destiny of posterity. The true state of man, as has been already said, is not to have his opinions bound down in the fetters of an eternal quietism, but flexible and unrestrained, to yield with facility to the impressions of accumulating observation and experience. That form of society will, of consequence, appear most eligible, which is least founded in a principle of permanence. But if this view of the subject be just, the idea of giving permanence to what is called the constitution of any government, and rendering one class of laws, under the appellation of fundamental, less susceptible of change than another, must be founded in misapprehension and error. The era probably originally sprung out of the forms of political monopoly, which we see established over the whole civilized world. Government could not justly flow, in the first instance, but from the choice of the people. Or perhaps, more accurately speaking, 
ought to be adjusted in its provisions to the prevailing apprehensions of equity and truth. But we see government at present administered, either in whole or in part, by a king and a body of noblesse, and we reasonably say that the laws made by these authorities are one thing, and the laws from which they derive their existence another. Now this, and indeed every species of exclusive institution, presents us with a dilemma, memorable in its nature and hard of solution. If the prejudices of a nation are decisively favorable to a king or a body of noblesse, it seems impossible to say that a king or a body of noblesse should not form part of their government. But then, on the other hand, the moment you admit this species of exclusive institution, you counteract the purpose for which it was admitted, and deprive the sentiments of the people of their genuine operation. If we had never seen arbitrary and capricious forms of government, we should probably never have thought of cutting off certain laws from the code under the name of constitutional. When we behold certain individuals or bodies of men exercising an exclusive superintendence over the affairs of a nation, we inevitably ask how they came by their authority, and the answer is, by the Constitution. But if we saw no power existing in the state but that of the people, having a body of representatives and a certain number of official secretaries and clerks acting in their behalf, subject to their revisal and renewable at their pleasure, the question, how the people came by this authority, would never have suggested itself. A celebrated objection that has been urged against the governments of modern Europe is that they have no constitutions. Footnote, Paine's rights of man. End footnote. If, by this objection, it be understood that they have no written code bearing this appellation, and that their constitutions have been less an instantaneous than a gradual production, the criticism seems to be rather verbal than of essential moment. In any other sense, it is to be suspected that the remark would amount to an eulogium, but an eulogium to which they are certainly by no means entitled. But to return to the question of permanence, whether we admit or reject the distinction between constitutional and ordinary legislation, it is not less true that the power of a nation to change its constitution, morally considered, must be strictly and universally coeval with the existence of a constitution. The language of permanence, in this case, is the grossest absurdity. It is to say to a nation, are you convinced that something is right, perhaps immediately necessary, to be done? It shall be done ten years hence. The folly of this system may be further elucidated, if further elucidation be necessary, from the following dilemma. Either a people must be governed according to their own apprehensions of justice and truth, or they must not. The last of these assertions cannot be avowed, but upon the unequivocal principles of tyranny. But, if the first be true, then it is just as absurd to say to a nation, this government, which you chose nine years ago, is the legitimate government, and the government which your present sentiments approve, the illegitimate, as to insist upon their being governed by the dicta of their remotest ancestors, or even of the most insolent usurper. It is extremely probable that a national assembly, chosen in the ordinary forms, is just as well entitled to change the fundamental laws as to change any of the least important branches of legislation. This function would never, perhaps, be dangerous, but in a country that still preserved a portion of monarchy or aristocracy, and in such a country, a principle of permanence would be found a very feeble antidote against the danger. The true principle upon the subject is that no assembly, though chosen with the most unexampled solemnity, is competent to impose any regulations, contrary to the public apprehension of right, and a very ordinary authority, fairly originated, will be sufficient to facilitate the harmonious adoption of a change that is dictated by national opinion. The distinction of constitutional and ordinary topics will always appear in practice unintelligible and vexatious. The assemblies of more frequent recurrence will find themselves arrested in the intention of conferring eminent benefit on their country, by the apprehension that they shall invade the Constitution. In a country where the people are habituated to sentiments of equality, and where no political monopoly is tolerated, there is little danger that any national assembly should be disposed to enforce a pernicious change, and there is still less that the people should submit to the injury, or not possess the means, easily, and with small interruption of public tranquility to avert it. The language of reason, 
on this subject is, give us equality and justice, but no constitution. Suffer us to follow, without restraint, the dictates of our own judgment, and to change our forms of social order, as fast as we improve in understanding and knowledge. The opinion upon this head, most popular in France at the time, 1792, that the National Convention entered upon its functions, was that the business of a convention extended only to the presenting the draft of a constitution, to be submitted in the sequel to the approbation of the districts, and, subsequently, only to that approbation, to be considered as law. This opinion is deserving of a serious examination. The first idea that suggests itself respecting it is that, if constitutional laws ought to be subjected to the revision of the districts, then all laws ought to undergo the same process, understanding by laws all declarations of a general principle, to be applied to particular cases as they may happen to occur, and even including all provisions for individual emergencies that will admit of the delay incident to the revision in question. It is a mistake to imagine that the importance of these articles is in a descending ratio, from fundamental to ordinary, and from ordinary to particular. It is possible for the most odious injustice to be perpetrated by the best constituted legislature that ever was framed. A law, rendering it capital to oppose the doctrine of transubstantiation, would be more injurious to the public welfare than a law changing the duration of the national representative from two years to one year or to three. Taxation has been shown to be an article rather of executive than legislative administration. Footnote. Book 5, Chapter 1. End footnote. And yet a very oppressive and unequal tax would scarcely be less ruinous than any single measure that could possibly be devised. It may further be remarked that an approbation demanded from the districts to certain constitutional articles, whether more or less numerous, will be either real or delusive according to the mode adopted for that purpose. If the districts be required to decide upon these articles by a simple affirmative or negative, it will then be delusive. It is impossible for any man or body of men, in the due exercise of their understanding, to decide upon any complicated system in that manner. It can scarcely happen, but that there will be some things that they would approve, and some that they would disapprove. On the other hand, if the articles be unlimitedly proposed for discussion in the districts, a transaction will be begun, to which it is not easy to foresee a termination. Some districts will object to certain articles, and if these articles be modeled to obtain their approbation, it is possible that the very alteration introduced to please one part of the community may render the code less acceptable to another. How are we to be assured that the dissidents will not set up a separate government for themselves? The reasons that might be offered to persuade a minority of districts to yield to the sense of a majority are by no means so perspicuous and forcible as those which sometimes persuade the minority of members in a given assembly to that species of concession. It is desirable, in all cases of the practical adoption of any given principle, that we should fully understand the meaning of the principle and perceive the conclusions to which it inevitably leads. This principle of a consent of districts has an immediate tendency, by a salutary gradation perhaps, to lead to the dissolution of all government. What then can be more absurd than to see it embraced by those very men who are, at the same time, advocates for the complete legislative unity of a great empire? It is founded upon the same basis as the principle of private judgment, which, in proportion as it impresses itself on the minds of men, may be expected, perhaps, to supersede the possibility of the action of society in a collective capacity. It is desirable that the most important acts of the national representatives should be subject to the approbation or rejection of the districts whose representatives they are, for exactly the same reason that it is desirable that the acts of the districts themselves should, as speedily as practicability will admit, be in force only so far as relates to the individuals by whom those acts are approved. The first consequence that would result not from the delusive, but the real establishment of this principle, would be the reduction of the Constitution to a very small number of articles, the impracticability of obtaining the deliberate approbation of a great number of districts to a very complicated code, would speedily manifest itself. In reality, the Constitution of a state, governed either in whole or in part by a political monopoly, must necessarily be complicated. 
but what need of complexity in a country where the people are destined to govern themselves. The whole constitution of such a country ought scarcely to exceed two articles. First, a scheme for the division of the whole into parts equal in their population. And secondly, the fixing of stated periods for the election of a national assembly. Not to say that the latter of these articles may very probably be dispensed with. A second consequence that results from the principle of which we are treating is as follows. It has already appeared that the reason is no less cogent for submitting important legislative articles to the revisal of the districts than for submitting the constitutional articles themselves. But, after a few experiments of this sort, it cannot fail to suggest itself that the mode of sending laws to the districts for their revision, unless in cases essential to the general safety, is a proceeding unnecessarily circuitous, and that it would be better, in as many instances as possible, to suffer the districts to make laws for themselves without the intervention of the National Assembly. The justness of this consequence is implicitly assumed in the preceding paragraph, while we stated the very narrow bounds within which the constitution of an empire, such as that of France, for example, might be circumscribed. In reality, provided the country were divided into convenient districts with a power of sending representatives to the General Assembly, it does not appear that any ill consequences would ensue to the common cause, from these districts being permitted to regulate their internal affairs, in conformity to their own apprehensions of justice. Thus, that which was, at first, a great empire with legislative unity, would speedily be transformed into a confederacy of lesser republics, with a general congress or amphictyonic council, answering the purpose of a point of cooperation upon extraordinary occasions. The ideas of a great empire and legislative unity are plainly the barbarous remains of the days of military heroism. In proportion as political power is brought home to the citizens and simplified into something of the nature of parish regulation, the danger of misunderstanding and rivalship will be nearly annihilated. In proportion as the science of government is divested of its present mysterious appearances, social truth will become obvious, and the districts pliant and flexible to the dictates of reason. A third consequence, sufficiently memorable from the same principle, is the gradual extinction of law. A great assembly, collected from the different provinces of an extensive territory, and constituted the sole legislator of those by whom the territory is inhabited, immediately conjures up to itself an idea of the vast multitude of laws that are necessary for regulating the concerns of those whom it represents. A large city, impelled by the principles of commercial jealousy, is not slow to digest the volume of its bylaws and exclusive privileges, but the inhabitants of a small parish, living with some degree of that simplicity which best corresponds to the real nature and wants of a human being, would soon be led to suspect that general laws were unnecessary and would have judged the causes that came before them, not according to certain axioms previously written, but according to the circumstances and demand of each particular cause. It was proper that this consequence should be mentioned in this place. The benefits that will arise from the abolition of law will come to be considered in detail in the following book. Footnote, Book 7, Chapter 8, End Footnote The principal objection that is usually made to the idea of confederacy considered as the substitute of legislative unity, is the possibility that arises of the members of the confederacy detaching themselves from the support of the public cause. To give this objection every advantage, let us suppose that the seat of the confederacy, like France, is placed in the midst of surrounding nations, and that the governments of these nations are anxious, by every means of artifice and violence, to suppress the insolent spirit of liberty that has started up among this neighbor people. It is to be believed that, even under these circumstances, the danger is more imaginary than real. The National Assembly, being precluded by the supposition from the use of force against the malcontent districts, is obliged to confine itself to expostulation, and it is sufficiently observable that our powers of expostulation are tenfold increased the moment our hopes are confined to expostulation alone. They have to display with the utmost perspicuity and simplicity, the benefits of independence, to convince the public at large that all they intend is to enable every district, and as far as possible, every individual, to pursue unmolested its own ideas of propriety, and that, under their auspices, there shall be no tyranny, 
no arbitrary punishments, such as proceed from the jealousy of councils and courts, no exactions, almost no taxation. Some ideas respecting this last subject will speedily occur. Footnote, page 150, 151, end footnote. It is not possible, but that, in a country rescued from the inveterate evils of despotism, the love of liberty should be considerably diffused. The adherents, therefore, of the public cause will be many, the malcontents few. If a small number of districts were so far blinded as to be willing to surrender themselves to oppression and slavery, it is probable they would soon repent. Their desertion would inspire the more enlightened and courageous with additional energy. It would be a fascinating spectacle to see the champions of the general welfare eagerly declaring that they desired none but willing supporters. It is not possible that so magnanimous a principle should not contribute more to the advantage than the injury of their cause. End of section 31 Recording by Arden Section 32 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 6, Chapter 8. Of National Education. Arguments in Its Favor. Answer. 1. It produces permanence of opinion. Nature of prejudice and judgment described. 2. It requires uniformity of operation. 3. It is the mirror and tool of national government. The right of punishing, not founded in the previous function of instructing. A mode in which government has been accustomed to interfere, for the purpose of influencing opinion, is by the superintendence it has, in a greater or less degree, exerted in the article of education, it is worthy of observation that the idea of this superintendence has obtained the countenance of several of the zealous advocates of political reform. The question relative to its propriety or impropriety is entitled, on that account, to the more deliberate examination. The arguments in its favor have been already anticipated. Can it be justifiable in those persons who are appointed to the functions of magistracy, and whose duty it is to consult for the public welfare? to neglect the cultivation of the infant mind, and to suffer its future excellence or depravity to be at the disposal of fortune? Is it possible for patriotism and the love of the public to be made the characteristic of a whole people in any other way so successfully as by rendering the early communication of these virtues a national concern? If the education of our youth be entirely confided to the prudence of their parents, or the accidental benevolence of private individuals, Will it not be a necessary consequence that some will be educated to virtue, others to vice, and others again entirely neglected? To these considerations it has been added that the maxim which has prevailed in the majority of civilized countries, that ignorance of the law is no apology for the breach of it, is in the highest degree iniquitous, and that government cannot justly punish us for our crimes when committed unless it have forewarned us against their commission which cannot be adequately done without something of the nature of public education. The propriety or impropriety of any project for this purpose must be determined by the general consideration of its beneficial or injurious tendency. If the exertions of the magistrate, on behalf of any system of instruction, will stand the test, as conducive to the public service, undoubtedly he cannot be justified in neglecting them. If, on the contrary, they conduce to injury, it is wrong and unjustifiable that they should be made. The injuries that result from a system of national education are, in the first place, that all public establishments include in them the idea of permanence. They endeavor, it may be, to secure and to diffuse whatever of advantageous to society is already known, but they forget that more remains to be known. If they realize the most substantial benefits at the time of their introduction, they must inevitably become less and less useful as they increase in duration, but to describe them as useless is a very feeble expression of their demerits. They actively restrain the flights of mind, and fix it in the belief of exploded errors. It has frequently been observed of universities, and extensive establishments for the purpose of education, that the knowledge taught there is a century behind the knowledge 
which exists among the unshackled and unprejudiced members of the same political community. The moment any scheme of proceeding gains a permanent establishment, it becomes impressed as one of its characteristic features, with an aversion to change. Some violent concussion may oblige its conductors to change an old system of philosophy for a system less obsolete, and they are then as pertinaciously attached to the second doctrine as they were to the first. Real intellectual improvement demands that mind should, as speedily as possible, be advanced to the height of knowledge already existing among the enlightened members of the community, and start from thence in the pursuit of further acquisitions. But public education has always expended its energies in the support of prejudice. It teaches its peoples not the fortitude that shall bring every proposition to the test of examination, but the art of indicating such tenets as may chance to be established. We study Aristotle, or Thomas Aquinas, or Bellarmin, or Chief Justice Coke, not that we may detect their errors, but that our minds may be fully impregnated with their absurdities. This feature runs through every species of public establishment, and even in the petty institution of Sunday schools. The chief lessons that are taught are a superstitious veneration for the Church of England, and to bow to every man in a handsome coat. All this is directly contrary to the true interests of mankind. All this must be unlearned before we can begin to be wise. It is the characteristic of mind to be capable of improvement. An individual surrenders the best attribute of man. The moment he resolves to adhere to certain fixed principles, for reasons not now present to his mind, but which formerly were. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 5, Page 32. End footnote. The instant in which he shuts upon himself the career of inquiry is the instant of his intellectual decease. He is no longer a man. He is the ghost of departed man. There can be no scheme more egregiously stamped with folly than that of separating a tenet from the evidence upon which its validity depends. If I cease from the habit of being able to recall this evidence, my belief is no longer a perception, but a prejudice. It may influence me like a prejudice, but cannot animate me like a real apprehension of truth. The difference between the man thus guided and the man that keeps his mind perpetually alive is the difference between cowardice and fortitude. The man who is, in the best sense, an intellectual being, delights to recollect the reasons that have convinced him, to repeat them to others, that they may produce conviction in them, and stand more distinct and explicit in his own mind. And he adds to this a willingness to examine objections, because he takes no pride in consistent error. The man who is not capable of this salutary exercise, to what valuable purpose can he be employed? Hence it appears that no vice can be more destructive than that which teaches us to regard any judgment as final and not open to review. The same principle that applies to individuals applies to communities. There is no proposition at present apprehended to be true, so valuable as to justify the introduction of an establishment for the purpose of inculcating it on mankind. Refer them to reading, to conversation, to meditation, but teach them neither creeds nor catechisms, either moral or political. Secondly, the idea of national education is founded in an inattention to the nature of mind. Whatever each man does for himself is done well. Whatever his neighbors or his country undertake to do for him is done ill. It is our wisdom to incite men to act for themselves, not to retain them in a state of perpetual pupillage. He that learns because he desires to learn will listen to the instructions he receives and apprehend their meaning. He that teaches because he desires to teach will discharge his occupation with enthusiasm and energy. But the moment political institution undertakes to assign to every man his place, the functions of all will be discharged with supineness and indifference. Universities and expensive establishments have long been remarked for formal dullness. Civil policy has given me the power to appropriate my estate to certain theoretical purposes, but it is an idle presumption to think I can entail my views as I can entail my fortune. Remove those obstacles which prevent men from seeing and which restrain them from pursuing their real advantage, but do not absurdly undertake to relieve them from the activity which this pursuit requires. What I earn, what I acquire only because I desire to acquire it, I estimate at its true value. But what is thrust upon me may make me indolent, but cannot make me respectable. It is an extreme folly to endeavor to secure to others, independently of exertion on their part, the means of being happy. This whole proposition of a national education is founded upon a supposition 
which has been repeatedly refuted in this work, but which has recurred upon us in a thousand forms. That unpatronized truth is inadequate to the purpose of enlightening mankind. Thirdly, the project of a national education ought uniformly to be discouraged, on account of its obvious alliance with national government. This is an alliance of a more formidable nature than the old and much contested alliance of church and state. Before we put so powerful a machine under the direction of so ambiguous an agent, it behooves us to consider well what it is that we do. Government will not fail to employ it to strengthen its hands and perpetuate its institutions. If we could even suppose the agents of government not to propose to themselves an object which will be apt to appear in their eyes, not merely innocent, but meritorious, the evil would not the less happen. Their views as institutors of a system of education will not fail to be analogous to their views in their political capacity. The data upon which their conduct as statesmen is vindicated will be the data upon which their instructions are founded. It is not true that our youth ought to be instructed to venerate the Constitution, however excellent. They should be led to venerate truth, and the Constitution only so far as it corresponds with their uninfluenced deductions of truth. Had the scheme of national education been adopted when despotism was most triumphant, it is not to be believed that it could have forever stifled the voice of truth, but it would have been the most formidable and profound contrivance for that purpose that imagination can suggest. Still, in the countries where liberty chiefly prevails, it is reasonably to be assumed that there are important errors, and a national education has the most direct tendency to perpetuate those errors and to form all minds upon one model. It is not easy to say whether the remark that government cannot justly punish offenders unless it have previously informed them what is virtue and what is offense be entitled to a separate answer. It is to be hoped that mankind will never have to learn so important a lesson through so incompetent a channel. Government may reasonably and equitably presume that men who live in society know that enormous crimes are injurious to the public weal without its being necessary to announce them as such, by laws to be proclaimed by heralds or expounded by curates. It has been alleged that mere reason may teach me not to strike my neighbor, but will never forbid my sending a sack of wool from England or printing the French constitution in Spain. This objection leads to the true distinction upon the subject. All real crimes that can be supposed to be the fit objects of judicial animadversion are capable of being discerned without the teaching of law. All supposed crimes, not capable of being so discerned, are truly and unalterably placed beyond the cognizance of a sound criminal justice. It is true that my own understanding would never have told me that the exportation of wool was a crime. Neither do I believe it is a crime, now that a law has been made affirming it to be such. It is a feeble and contemptible palliation of iniquitous punishments to signify to mankind beforehand that you intend to inflict them. Men of a lofty and generous spirit would almost be tempted to exclaim, destroy us if you please, but do not endeavor by a national education to destroy in our understandings the discernment of justice and injustice. The idea of such an education, or even perhaps of the necessity of a written law, would never have occurred if government and jurisprudence had never attempted the arbitrary conversion of innocence into guilt. End of section 32. Recording by Arden. Section 33 of Enquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 6, Chapter 9, of Pensions and Salaries. Reasons by which they are vindicated. Labor and its usual acceptation, and labor for the public compared. Immoral effects of the institution of salaries. Source from which they are derived. Unnecessary for the subsistence of the public functionary. For dignity. Salaries of inferior officers may also be superseded. Taxation. Qualifications. An article which deserves the maturest consideration 
and by means of which political institution does not fail to produce the most important influence upon opinion, is that of the mode of rewarding public services. The mode, which has obtained in all European countries, is that of pecuniary reward. He who is employed to act in behalf of the public is recompensed with a salary. He who retires from that employment is recompensed with a pension. The arguments in support of this system are well known. It has been remarked that indeed it may be creditable to individuals to be willing to serve their country without a reward, but that it is a becoming pride on the part of the public to refuse to receive as an alms that for which they are well able to pay. If one man animated by the most disinterested motives be permitted to serve the public upon these terms, another will assume the exterior of disinterestedness as a step towards the gratification of a sinister ambition. If men be not openly and directly paid for the services they perform, we may rest assured that they will pay themselves by ways a thousand times more injurious. He who devotes himself to the public ought to devote himself entire. He will therefore be injured in his personal fortune and ought to be replaced. Add to this that the servants of the public ought, by their appearance and mode of living, to command respect both from their countrymen and from foreigners, and that this circumstance will require an expense for which it is the office of their country to provide. Footnote. The substance of these arguments may be found in Burke's speech on economical reform. End footnote. Before this argument can be sufficiently estimated, it will be necessary for us to consider the analogy between labor and its most usual acceptation and labor for the public service. What are the points in which they resemble and in which they differ? If I cultivate a field, the produce of which is necessary for my subsistence, this is an innocent and laudable action. The first object it proposes is my own emolument, and it cannot be unreasonable that that object should be much in my contemplation while the labor is performing. If I cultivate a field, the produce of which is not necessary to my subsistence, but which I propose to give and barter for a garment, the case becomes different. The action here does not, properly speaking, begin in myself. Its immediate object is to provide food for another, and it seems to be, in some degree, a perversion of intellect that causes me to place, in an inferior point of view, the inherent quality of the action, and to do that which is, in the first instance, beneficent, from a partial retrospect to my own advantage. Still the perversion here, at least to our habits of reflecting and judging, does not appear violent. The action differs only in form from that which is direct. I employ that labor in cultivating a field which must otherwise be employed in manufacturing a garment. The garment I propose to myself as the end of my labor. We are not apt to conceive of this species of barter and trade as greatly injurious to our moral discernment. But then this is an action, in the slightest degree indirect. It does not follow because we are induced to do some actions immediately beneficial to others from a selfish motive that we can admit of this in all instances with impunity. It does not follow, because we are sometimes inclined to be selfish, that we must never be generous. The love of our neighbor is the great ornament of a moral nature. The perception of truth is the most solid improvement of an intellectual nature. He that sees nothing in the universe deserving of regard but himself is a consummate stranger to the dictates of general and impartial reason. He that is not influenced in his conduct by the real and inherent nature of things is rational to no purpose. Admitting that it is venial to do some actions, immediately beneficial to my neighbor, from a partial retrospect to myself, surely there must be other actions in which I ought to forget or endeavor to forget myself. This duty is most obligatory and actions most extensive in their consequences. If a thousand men are to be benefited, I ought to recollect that I am only an atom in the comparison and to reason accordingly. These considerations may enable us to decide upon the article of pensions and salaries. Surely it ought not to be the end of a good political institution to increase our selfishness, instead of suffering it to dwindle and decay. If we pay an ample salary to him who is employed in the public service, how are we sure that he will not have more regard to the salary than to the public? If we pay a small salary, yet the very existence of such a payment will oblige men to compare the work performed and the reward bestowed, and all the consequence that will result will be to drive the best men from the service of their country, a service first degraded by being paid, and then paid with an ill-timed parsimony. Whether the salary be large or small, if a salary exists, many will desire the office for the sake of its appendage. Functions the most extensive in their consequences will be converted into a trade, 
how humiliating will it be to the functionary himself, amidst the complication and subtlety of motives, to doubt whether the salary were not one of his inducements to the accepting the office. If he stand acquitted to himself, it is, however, still to be regretted that grounds should be afforded to his countrymen, which tempt them to misrepresent his views. Another consideration of great weight in this instance is that of the source from which salaries are derived, from the public revenue, from taxes imposed upon the community. The nature of taxation has perhaps seldom been sufficiently considered. By some persons, it has been supposed that the superfluities of the community might be collected and placed under the disposition of the representative or executive power. But this is a gross mistake. The superfluities of the rich are, for the most part, inaccessible to taxation. The burthen falls almost exclusively upon the laborious and the poor. All wealth in a state of civilized society is the produce of human industry. Footnote. Book 8, Chapter 2. End footnote. To be rich is merely to possess a patent entitling one man to dispose of the produce of another man's industry. Taxation, therefore, can no otherwise fall upon the rich, but so far as it operates to diminish their luxuries. But this it does in a very few instances, and in a very small degree. Its genuine operation is to impose a new portion of labor upon those whom labor has already plunged deep in ignorance, degradation, and misery. The higher and governing part of the community are like the lion who hunted in concert with the weaker beasts, the landed proprietor first takes a very disproportionate share of the produce to himself. The capitalist follows and shows himself equally voracious. Both these classes, in the form in which they now appear, might under a different mode of society be dispensed with. Taxation comes in next and lays a new burthen upon those who are bowed down to the earth already. Who is there allowed the choice of an alternative in possessing the spirit of a man that would choose to be thus fed? with the hard-earned morsel that through the medium of taxation is wrested from the grip of the peasant. Too much stress, however, is not to be laid upon this argument. There is no profession, there is perhaps no mode of life compatible with liberal and intellectual pursuits that does not include in it a portion of iniquity. It is one of the evils of a corrupt state of society that it forces the most enlightened and the most virtuous unwillingly to participate in its injustice. It would be weakness and not magnanimity that should teach us to view these things with a microscopical scrupulosity and to refuse to be useful because no usefulness is pure. The most important objection to emoluments flowing from a public revenue is built upon their tendency to corrupt the mind of the receiver and the views of the spectators. Let us proceed to consider the extent of the difficulty that would result from the abolition of salaries. The majority of persons nominated to eminent employments under any state of mankind approaching to the present will possess a personal fortune adequate to their support. Those selected from a different class will probably be selected for extraordinary talents, which will naturally lead to extraordinary resources. It has been deemed dishonorable to subsist upon private liberality, but this dishonor is produced only by the difficulty of reconciling this mode of subsistence and intellectual independence. It is true that the fortunes of individuals, like public salaries, are merely a patent empowering them to engross the produce of other men's labor. But large private fortunes cannot cease to exist till a spirit of sobriety and reflection, hitherto unknown, has been infused into the great mass of mankind. In the meantime, the possessors of them are bound to consider of the best mode of disposing of their incomes for the public interest. But it would perhaps be difficult to point out a better than that here alluded to. By this method, no new addition would be made to the burthens of the laborious, and the distribution would perhaps produce a better effect than if it were made in douceurs and prizes to the more ordinary classes of mankind. As to the receiver, he, by the supposition, receives no more than his due, and therefore prejudice alone can represent him as degraded, or imbue him with servility. This source of emolument is free from many of the objections that have been urged against the public stipend. I ought to receive your superfluity as my due, while I am employed in affairs more important than that of earning a subsistence, but at the same time to receive it with a total indifference to personal advantage, taking only what I deem necessary for the supply of my wants. He that listens to the dictates of justice and turns a deaf ear to the suggestions of pride will probably wish that the customs of his country should cast him for support on the virtue of individuals, rather 
than on the public revenue, that virtue may be expected, in this, as in all other instances, to increase, the more it is called into action. But what if he have a wife and children? Let many aid him, if the aid of one be insufficient. Let him do in his lifetime what Eudemitus did at his decease, bequeath his daughter to be subsisted by one friend, and his mother by another. This is the only true taxation, which he, in whom civil policy has vested the means, assesses on himself, not which he endeavors to discharge upon the shoulders of the poor. It is a striking example of the power of venal governments in generating prejudice, that this scheme of serving the public functions without salaries, so common among the ancient republicans, should by liberal-minded men of the present day be deemed impracticable. Nor let us imagine that the safety of the community will depend upon the services of an individual. In the country in which individuals fit for the public service are rare, the post of honor will probably be his, not that fills an official situation, but that from his closet endeavors to waken the sleeping virtues of mankind. In the country where they are frequent, it will not be difficult, by the short duration of the employment, to compensate for the slenderness of the means of him that fills it. It is not easy to describe the advantages that must result from this proceeding. The public functionary would, in every article of his charge, recollect the motives of public spirit and benevolence. He would hourly improve in the vigor and disinterestedness of his character. The habits created by a frugal fare and a cheerful poverty, not hid as now in obscure retreats, but held forth to public view and honored with public esteem, would speedily pervade the community and auspiciously prepare them for still further improvements. The objection that it is necessary for him who acts on the part of the public to make a certain figure and to live in a style calculated to excite respect is scarcely to be considered as deserving a separate answer. The whole spirit of this inquiry is in direct hostility to such an objection. If therefore it have not been answered already, it would be in vain to attempt an answer in this place. It is recorded of the burghers of the Netherlands, who conspired to throw off the Austrian yoke, that they came to the place of consultation, each man with his knapsack of provisions. Who is there that feels inclined to despise this simplicity and honorable poverty? Who would not exclaim but the imperial minister when he viewed the spectacle, men thus resolute and austere, are neither to be despised nor subdued? The abolition of salaries would doubtless render necessary the simplification and abridgment of public business. This would be a benefit, and not a disadvantage. It will further be objected that there are certain functionaries in the lower departments of government, such as clerks and tax-gatherers, whose employment is perpetual, and whose subsistence ought for that reason to be made the result of their employment. If this objection were admitted, its consequences would be of subordinate importance. The office of a clerk or a tax-gatherer is considerably similar to those of mere barter and trade, and therefore to degrade it altogether to their level would have little resemblance to the fixing such a degradation upon offices that demand the most elevated character. The annexation of a stipend to such employments, if considered only as a matter of temporary accommodation, might perhaps be endured. But the exception, if admitted, ought to be admitted with great caution. He that is employed in an affair of direct public necessity ought to be conscious, while he discharges it, of its true character. We should never allow ourselves to undertake an office of a public nature without feeling ourselves animated with a public zeal. We shall otherwise discharge our trust with comparative coldness and neglect, nor is this all. The abolition of salaries would lead to the abolition of those offices to which salaries are thought necessary. If we had neither foreign wars nor domestic stipends, taxation would be almost unknown. And if we had no taxes to collect, we should want no clerks to keep an account of them. In the simple scheme of political institution which reason dictates, we could scarcely have any burthensome offices to discharge. And if we had any that were so in their abstract nature, they might be rendered light by the perpetual rotation of their holders. If we have no salaries, for a still stronger reason, we ought to have no pecuniary qualifications, or in other words, no regulation requiring the possession of a certain property as a condition to the right of electing, or the capacity of being elected. It is an uncommon strain of tyranny to call upon men to appoint for themselves a delegate and at the same time forbid them to appoint exactly the man whom they may judge fittest for the office. Qualification in both kinds is a most flagrant injustice. It asserts the man to be of less value than his property. It furnishes to the candidate 
a new stimulus to the accumulation of wealth, and this passion, when once set in motion, is not easily allayed. It tells him, your intellectual and moral qualifications may be of the highest order, but you have not enough of the means of luxuries and vice. To the non-elector it holds the most detestable language. It says, you are poor, you are unfortunate. The institutions of society oblige you to be the perpetual witness of other men's superfluity. Because you are sunk this low, we will trample you yet lower. You shall not even be reckoned for a man. You shall be passed by as one of whom society makes no account, and whose welfare and moral existence she disdains to recollect. End of section 33 Recording by Arden Section 34 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 6, Chapter 10. Of the Modes of Deciding a Question on the part of the community. Decision by lot, its origin, founded in moral imbecility, or cowardice. Decision by ballot, inculcates timidity and hypocrisy. Decision by vote, its recommendations. What has been here said upon the subject of qualifications naturally leads to a few observations upon the three principal modes of determining public questions in elections, by sortition, ballot, and vote. The idea of sortition was first introduced by the dictates of superstition. It was supposed that when human reason piously acknowledged its insufficiency, the gods, pleased with so unfeigned a homage, interfered to guide the decision. This imagination is now exploded. Every man who pretends to philosophy will confess that wherever sortition is introduced, the decision is exclusively guided by the laws of impulse and gravitation. Strictly speaking, we know of no such thing as contingence, but so far as relates to the exercise of apprehension and judgment on the particular question to be determined, all decision by law is the decision of contingence. The operations of impulse and gravitation either proceed from a blind and unconscious principle, or if they be the offspring of a superintending mind, it is mind executing general laws, not temporizing with every variation of human caprice. All reference of public questions and elections to lot includes in it one of two evils, moral imbecility or cowardice. There is no situation in which we can be placed that has not its corresponding duties. There is no alternative that can be offered to our choice that does not include in it a better and a worse. The idea of sortition therefore springs either from an effeminacy that will not inquire or a timidity that dares not pronounce its decision. The path of virtue is simple and direct. The first attributes of a virtuous character are a mind awake and a quick and observant eye. A man of right dispositions will inquire out the lessons of duty. The man, on the contrary, who is spoiled by stupidity or superstition, will wait till these lessons are brought to him in a way that he cannot resist. A superficial survey will perhaps lead him to class a multitude of human transactions among the things that are indifferent. But if we be indefatigably benevolent, we shall for the most part find, even among things that ordinarily so denominated, a reason for preference. He may well be concluded to have but a small share of moral principle, who easily dispenses himself from seeking the occasion to exercise it. Add to which they are not trifles but matters of serious import, that it has been customary to commit to the decision of lot. But supposing us to have a sentiment of preference, or a consciousness that to attain such a perception is our duty, if we afterwards desert it, this is the most contemptible cowardice, Nothing can be more unworthy than a propensity to take refuge in indolence and neutrality, simply because we have not the courage to encounter the consequences of ingenuousness and sincerity. Ballot is a mode of decision still more censurable than sortition. It is scarcely possible to conceive a political institution that includes a more direct and explicit patronage of vice. It has been said that ballot may in certain cases be necessary to enable a man of a feeble character to act with ease and independence, and to prevent bribery, corrupt influence, and fashion. Hypocrisy is an ill remedy to apply to the cure of weakness. A feeble and irresolute character might before be accidental, 
Ballant is a contrivance to render it permanent, and to scatter its seeds over a wider surface. The true remedy for a want of constancy in public spirit is to inspire firmness, not to inspire timidity. Sound and just conceptions, if communicated to the mind with perspicuity, may be expected to be a sufficient basis for virtue. To tell men that it is necessary they should form their decision by ballot is to tell them that it is necessary they should be ashamed of their integrity. If sortition taught us to desert our duty, ballot teaches us to draw a veil of concealment over our performance of it. It points out to us a method of acting unobserved. It incites us to make a mystery of our sentiments. If it did this in the most trivial article, it would not be easy to bring the mischief it would produce within the limits of calculation. But it dictates this conduct in our most important concerns. It calls upon us to discharge our duty to the public with the most virtuous constancy, but at the same time directs us to hide our discharge of it. One of the most beneficial principles in the structure of the material universe will perhaps be found to be in its tendency to prevent our withdrawing ourselves from the consequences of our own actions. A political institution that should attempt to counteract this principle would be the only true impiety. How can a man have the love of the public in his heart without the dictates of that love flowing to his lips? When we direct men to act with secrecy, we direct them to act with frigidity. Virtue will always be an unusual spectacle among men till they shall have learned to be at all times ready to avow their actions and assign the reasons upon which they are founded. If then sortition and ballot be institutions pregnant with vice, it follows that all social decisions should be made by open vote, that wherever we have a function to discharge, we should reflect on the purpose for which it ought to be exercised, and that whatever conduct we are persuaded to adopt, especially in affairs of general concern, should most certainly in matters of routine and established practice be adopted in the face of the world. End of section 34 Recording by Arden. Section 35 of Enquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anonymous Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness Volume 2 by William Godwin Book 7 of Crimes and Punishments Chapter 1 Limitations of the Doctrine of Punishment which Result from the Principles of Morality Definition of Punishment Nature of Crime Retributive justice not independent and absolute, not to be vindicated from the system of nature. Force of the term, desert. Conclusion The subject of punishment is perhaps the most fundamental in the science of politics. Men associated for the sake of mutual protection and benefit. It has already appeared that in the internal affairs of such associations are of an inexpressibly higher importance than their external. Footnote. Book 5, Chapter 20. End of footnote. It has appeared that the action of society in conferring rewards and superintending opinion is of pernicious effect. Footnote. Book 5, Chapter 12. Book 6 throughout. End of footnote. Hence it follows that government, or the action of society in its corporate capacity, can scarcely be of any utility, except so far as it is requisite for the suppression of force by force. For the prevention of the hostile attack of one member of the society upon the person or property of another, which prevention is usually called by the name of criminal justice or punishment. Before we can properly judge the necessity or urgency of this action of government, it will be of some importance to consider the precise import of the word punishment. I may employ force to counteract the hostility that is actually committing on me. I may employ force to compel any member of the society to occupy the post that I conceive most conducive to the general advantage. 
either in the mode of impressing soldiers and sailors or by obliging a military officer or a minister of state to accept or retain his appointment. I may put a valuable man to death for the common good, either because he is infected with a pestilential disease or because some oracle has declared it essential to the public safety. None of these, though they consist in the exertion of force for some moral purpose, comes within the import of the word punishment. Punishment is also often used to signify the voluntary infliction of evil upon a vicious being, not merely because the public advantage demands it, but because there is apprehended to be a certain fitness and propriety in the nature of things that render suffering, abstractedly from the benefit to result, the suitable concomitant of vice. The justice of punishment, however, in this import of the word, can only be a deduction from the hypothesis of free will, if indeed that hypothesis will sufficiently support it, and must be false if human actions are necessary. Mind, as was sufficiently apparent when we treated of that subject, footnote, volume 1, book 4, chapter 8, end of footnote is an agent in no other sense than matter is an agent. It operates and is operated upon, and the nature, the force and line of direction of the first, is exactly in proportion to the nature, force, and line of direction of the second. Morality, in a rational and designing mind, is not essentially different from morality in an inanimate substance. A man of certain intellectual habits is fitted to be an assassin. A dagger of a certain form is fitted to be his instrument. The one or the other excites a greater degree of disapprobation in proportion as its fitness for mischievous purposes appears to be more inherent and direct. I view a dagger on this account with more disapprobation than a knife which is perhaps equally adapted for the purposes of the assassin, because the dagger has few or no beneficial uses to weigh against those that are hurtful, and because it has a tendency by means of association to the exciting of evil thoughts. I view the assassin with more disapprobation than the dagger, because he is more to be feared, and it is more difficult to change his vicious structure, or to take from him his capacity to injure. The man is propelled to act by necessary causes and irresistible motives, which, having once occurred, are likely to occur again. The dagger has no quality adapted to the contradiction of habits, and, though it have committed a thousand murders, is not more likely, unless so far as those murders, being known, may operate as a slight associated motive with the possessor, to commit murder again except in the articles here specified, the two cases are exactly parallel. The assassin cannot help the murder he commits any more than the dagger. These arguments are merely calculated to set in a more perspicuous light a principle, which is admitted by many by whom the doctrine of necessity has never been examined, that the only measure of equity is utility, and whatever is not attended with any beneficial purpose is not just. This is so evident that few reasonable and reflecting minds will be found inclined to deny it. Why do I inflict suffering on another? If neither for his own benefit nor the benefit of others, can I be right? Will resentment, the mere indignation and horror I have conceived against vice, justify me in putting a being to useless torture? But suppose I only put an end to his existence. What, with no prospect of benefit either to himself or others? The reason the mind more easily reconciles itself to this supposition is that we conceive existence to be less a blessing than a curse to a being incorrigibly vicious. But, in that case, the supposition does not fall within the terms of the question. I am in reality conferring a benefit. It has been asked if we conceive to ourselves two beings, each of them solitary, but the first virtuous and the second vicious, 
the first inclined to the highest acts of benevolence if his situation were changed for the social, the second to malignity, tyranny, and injustice. Do we not feel that the first is entitled to felicity in preference to the second? If there be any difficulty to the question, it is wholly caused by the extravagance of the supposition. No being can be either virtuous or vicious, who has no opportunity of influencing the happiness of others. He may indeed, though now solitary, recollect or imagine a social state, but in this sentiment and the propensities it generates can scarcely be vigorous unless he have hopes of being, at some future time, restored to that state. The true solitaire cannot be considered as a moral being unless the morality we contemplate be that which has relation to his own permanent advantage. But if that be our meaning, punishment, unless for reform, is peculiarly absurd. His conduct is vicious because it has a tendency to render him miserable. Shall we inflict calamity upon him for this reason only, because he has already inflicted calamity upon himself? It is difficult for us to imagine to ourselves a solitary intellectual being whom no future accident shall ever render social. It is difficult for us to separate, even in idea, virtue and vice from happiness and misery, and of consequence, not to imagine that when we bestow a benefit upon virtue, we bestow it where it will turn to account. And when we bestow a benefit upon vice, we bestow it where it will be unproductive. For these reasons, the question of desert, as it relates to a solitary being, will always have a tendency to mislead and perplex. It has sometimes been alleged that the course of nature has annexed suffering to vice, and has thus led us to the idea of punishment here referred to. Arguments of this sort should be listened to with great caution. It was by reasonings of a similar nature that our ancestors justified the practice of religious persecution. Heretics and unbelievers are the object of God's indignation. It must therefore be meritorious in us to maltreat those whom God has cursed. We know too little of the system of the universe, are too liable to error respecting it, and see too small a portion to entitle us to form our moral principles upon an imitation of what we conceive to be the course of nature. Thus it appears, whether we enter philosophically into the principle of human actions, or merely analyze the ideas of restitude and justice which have the universal consent of mankind, that, in the refined and absolute sense in which the term has frequently been employed, there is no such thing as desert. In other words, it cannot be just that we should inflict suffering on any man, except so far as it tends to good. Hence it follows also that punishment, in the last of the senses enumerated towards the beginning of this chapter, by no means accords with any sound principles of reasoning. It is right that I should inflict suffering in every case where it can be clearly shown that such infliction will produce an overbalance of good. But this infliction bears no reference to the mere innocence or guilt of the person upon whom it is made. An innocent man is the proper subject of it, if it tend to good. A guilty man is the proper subject of it, under no other point of view. To punish him, upon any hypothesis, for what is past and irrecoverable, and for the consideration of that only, must be ranked among the most pernicious exhibitions of an untutored barbarism. Every man upon whom discipline is employed is to be considered as to the purpose of this discipline as innocent. The only sense of the word punishment that can be supposed to be compatible with the principles of the present work is that of the pain inflicted on a person convicted of past injurious action for the purpose of preventing future mischief. It is of the utmost importance that we should bear these ideas constantly in mind during our examination of the theory of punishment. This theory would, in the past transactions of mankind, have been totally different if they had divested themselves of the emotions of anger and resentment, 
if they had considered the man who torments another for what he has done, as upon a par with the child who beats the table. If they had conjured up to their imagination and properly estimated the man who should shut up in prison and periodically torture some atrocious criminal, from the mere consideration of the abstract congruity of crime and punishment, without a possible benefit to others or to himself. If they had regarded punishment as that which was to be regulated solely, by a dispassionate calculation of the future without suffering of the past, on its own account, for a moment to enter into the proceeding. End of section 35「Section 36 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anonymous Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness Volume 2 by William Godwin Chapter 2 General Disadvantages of Punishment Conscience in Matters of Religion Considered in the Conduct of Life Best Practical Criterion of Duty Not the Decision of Other Men But of Our Own Understanding Tendency of Coercion Its Various Classes Considered Having thus endeavored to show what denominations of punishment justice, and a sound idea of the nature of man, would invariably proscribe, it belongs to us, in the further prosecution of the subject, to consider merely that coercion, which it has been supposed rightly to employ, against persons convicted of past injurious action, for the purpose of preventing future mischief. And here we will, first, recollect what is the quantity of evil which accrues from all such coercion, and secondly, examine the cogency of the various reasons by which it is recommended. It will not be possible wholly to avoid the repetition of some of the reasons which have occurred in the preliminary discussion of the exercise of private judgment. Footnote. Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 6. End of footnote. But those reasonings will now be extended, and will perhaps derive additional advantage from a fuller arrangement. It is commonly said that no man ought to be compelled, in matters of religion, to act contrary to the dictates of his conscience. Religion is a principle which the practice of all ages has deeply impressed upon the human mind. He that discharges what his apprehensions prescribe to him on the subject stands approved to the tribunal of his own mind and, conscious restitude in his intercourse with the author of nature, cannot fail to obtain the greatest of those advantages, whatever may be their amount, which religion has to bestow. It is in vain that I endeavor, by persecuting statutes, to compel him to resign a false religion for a true. Arguments may convince, but persecution cannot. The new religion, which I oblige him to profess contrary to his conviction, however pure and holy it may be in its own nature, has no benefits in store for him. The sublimest worship becomes transformed into a source of depravity when it is not consecrated by the testimony of pure conscience. Truth is the second object in this respect. Integrity of heart is the first. Or rather, a proposition that, in its abstract nature, is truth itself, converts into rank falsehood and moral poison, if it be professed with the lips only and abjured by the understanding. It is then the foul garb of hypocrisy. Instead of elevating the mind above sordid temptations, it perpetually reminds the worshipper of the degrading subjection to which he has yielded. Instead of filling him with sacred confidence, it overwhelms him with confusion and remorse. The inference that has been made from these reasonings is that criminal law is eminently applied in affairs of religion, 
and that its true province is civil misdemeanors. But this distinction is by no means so satisfactory and well-founded as at first sight it may appear. Footnote. I bid. End of footnote. It is not strange that men should have affirmed religion to be the sacred province of conscience, while moral duty is to be left undefined to the decision of the magistrate. Is it of no consequence whether I be the benefactor of my species or their bitterest enemy? Whether I be an informer or a robber or a murderer? Whether I be employed as a soldier to extirpate my fellow beings? or, as a citizen, contribute my property to their extirpation? Whether I declare the truth, with that firmness and unreserve which an ardent philanthropy will not fail to inspire, or suppress science, lest I be convicted of blasphemy and fact, lest I be convicted of a libel? Whether I contribute my efforts for the furtherance of political improvement, or quietly submit to the exile of a prince of whose claims I am an advocate, or to the subversion of liberty, the most valuable of all human possessions. Nothing can be more clear than that the value of religion, or of any other species of opinion, lies in its moral tendency. If I am to hold as of no account the civil power for the sake of that which is the means, how much more when it rises in contradiction to the end. Of all human concerns, morality is the most interesting. It is the constant associate of all our transactions. There is no situation in which we can be placed, no alternative that can be presented to our choice, respecting which duty is silent. What is the standard of morality and duty? Justice not the arbitrary decrees that are in force in a particular climate, but those laws of reason that are equally obligatory wherever man is to be found. There is an obvious distinction between those particulars in each instance which constitute the permanent nature of the case before us, and those interpositions of a peremptory authority to which it may be prudent to submit but which cannot alter our ideas of the conduct to which independent man ought to adhere. What then are the consequences that will result from the obedience of compulsion and not of the understanding? No principle of moral science can be more obvious and fundamental than that the motive by which we are induced to an action constitutes an essential part of its character. This idea has perhaps sometimes been carried too far. A good motive is of little value when it is not joined to a salutary exertion. But, without a good motive, the most extensively useful action that was ever performed can contribute little to the improvement or honor of him that performs it. We owe him no respect if he has been induced to perform it by ideas of personal advantage or the influence of a bribe. It is, in some respects, Worse if the motive that governed him were the sentiment of fear. If we hold in any estimation the attributes of man, if we desire the improvement of our species, we ought particularly to desire that they should be led in the path of usefulness by generous and liberal considerations, that their obedience should be the obedience of the heart and not that of a slave. Nothing can be of higher importance to the improvement of the human mind than that, wherever the conduct we may be compelled to pursue, we should have distinct and accurate notions of the merits of every moral question in which we may be concerned. In all doubtful questions, there are but two criterions possible, the decisions of other men's wisdom and the decisions of our own understanding. Which of these is conformable to the nature of man? Can we surrender our own understanding? However we may strain after implicit faith, will not conscience, in spite of ourselves, whisper us, this decree is equitable and this is founded in mistake? Will there not be, in the minds of the votaries of superstition, a perpetual dissatisfaction, 
a desire to believe what is dictated to them, accompanied with a want of that in which belief consists, evidence and conviction? If we could surrender our understanding, what sort of beings should we become? The direct tendency of coercion is to set our understanding and our fears, our duty and our weakness, at variance with each other. Coercion first annihilates the understanding of the subject upon whom it is exercised, and then of him who employs it. Dressed in the supine prerogatives of a master, he is excused from cultivating the faculties of a man. What would not man have been, long before this, if the proudest of us had no hopes but an argument, if he knew of no resort beyond, if he were obliged to sharpen his faculties and collect his powers as the only means of effecting his purposes. Let us reflect a little on the species of influence that coercion employs. It avers to his victim that he must necessarily be in the wrong because I am more vigorous or more cunning than he. Will vigor and cunning be always on the side of truth? It appeals to force and represents superior strength as the standard of justice. Every such exertion implies in its nature a species of contest. The contest is often decided before it is brought to open trial by the despair of one of the parties. The ardor and paroxysm of passion being over, the offender surrenders himself into the hands of his superiors and calmly awaits the declaration of their pleasure. But it is not always so. The depredator that by main force surmounts the strength of his pursuers or by stratagem and ingenuity escapes their toils, so far as this argument is valid, proves the justice of his cause. Who can refrain from indignation when he sees justice thus miserably prostituted? Who does not feel, the moment the contest begins, the full extent of the absurdity that the appeal includes? The magistracy, the representatives of the social system that declares war against one of its members, in behalf of justice or in behalf of oppression, appears almost equally, in both cases, entitled to our censure. In the first case, we see truth throwing aside her native arms and her intrinsic advantage and putting herself upon a level with falsehood. In the second, we see falsehood confident in the casual advantage she possesses, artfully extinguishing the newborn light that would shame her in the midst of her usurped authority. The exhibition in both is that of an infant, crushed in the merciless grasp of a giant. No sophistry can be more gross than that which pretends to bring the parties to an impartial hearing. Observe the consistency of this reasoning. We first vindicate political coercion because the criminal has committed an offense against the community at large, and then pretend, while we bring him to the bar of the community, the offended party, that we bring him before an impartial umpire. Thus in England, the king by his attorney is the prosecutor, and the king by his representative is the judge. How long shall such inconsistencies impose on mankind? The pursuit commenced against the supposed offender is the posse comitatus, the armed force of the whole, drawn out in such portions as may be judged necessary, and when seven millions of men have gotten one poor, unassisted individual in their power, they are then at leisure to torture or to kill him, and to make his agonies a spectacle to glut their ferocity. The argument against political coercion is equally strong, against the infliction of private penalties between master and slave and between parent and child. There was, in reality, not only more of gallantry, but more of reason in the Gothic system of trial by duel than in these. The trial of force is over in these, as we have already said, before the exertion of force has begun. All that remains is the leisurely infliction of torture, my power to inflict it being placed in my joints and in my sinews. 
This whole argument seems liable to an irresistible dilemma. The right of the parent over his offspring lies either in his superior strength or his superior reason. If in his strength, we have only to apply this right universally, in order to drive all morality out of the world. If in his reason, in that reason let him confide. It is a poor argument of my superior reason that I am unable to make justice be apprehended and felt in the most necessary cases without the intervention of blows. Let us consider the effect that coercion produces upon the mind of him against whom it is employed. It cannot begin with convincing. It is no argument. It begins with producing the sensation of pain and the sentiment of distaste. It begins with violently alienating the mind from the truth with which we wish to be impressed. It includes in it a tacit confession of imbecility. If he who employs coercion against me could mold me to his purposes by argument, no doubt he would. He pretends to punish me because his argument is strong, but he really punishes me because his argument is weak. End of section 36「Section 37 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 7, Chapter 3, Of the Purposes of Punishment. Nature of defense considered. Punishment for restraint. For reformation. Supposed uses of adversity. Defective. Unnecessary. Punishment, for example. 1. Nugatory. 2. Unjust. Unfeeling character of the species of coercion. Let us proceed to consider the three principal ends that punishment proposes to itself. Restraint, reformation, and example. Under each of these heads the arguments on the affirmative side must be allowed to be cogent, not irresistible. Under each of them, considerations will occur that will oblige us to doubt universally of the propriety of punishment. The first and most innocent of all the classes of coercion is that which is employed in repelling actual force. This has but little to do with any species of political institution, but may nevertheless deserve to be first considered. In this case, I am employed. Suppose, for example, a drawn sword is pointed at my own breast or that of another, with threats of instant destruction, in preventing a mischief that seems about inevitably to ensue. In this case, there appears to be no time for experiments, and yet, even here, a strict research will suggest to us important doubts. The powers of reason and truth are yet unfathomed. That truth which one man cannot communicate in less than a year, another can communicate in a fortnight. The shortest term may have an understanding commensurate to it. When Marius said, with a stern look and a commanding countenance, to the soldier, that was sent down into his dungeon to assassinate him. Wretch, have you the temerity to kill Marius? And with these few words, drove him to flight. It was that the grandeur of the idea conceived in his own mind made its way with irresistible force to the mind of his executioner. He had no arms for resistance. He had no vengeance to threaten. He was debilitated and deserted. It was by the force of sentiment only that he disarmed his destroyer. If there were falsehood and prejudice mixed with the idea communicated, in this case, can we believe that truth is not still more powerful? It would be well for the human species if they were all, in this respect, like Marius, all accustomed to place an intrepid confidence in the single energy of intellect. Who shall say what there is that would be impossible to men thus bold, and actuated only by the purest sentiments? Who shall say how far the whole species might be improved, did they cease to respect force in others, and did they refuse to employ it for themselves? The difference, however, between the species of coercion and the species which usually bears the denomination of punishment is obvious. Punishment is employed against an individual whose violence is over. He is, at present, engaged in no hostility against the community or any of its members. He is quietly pursuing, it may be, those occupations which are beneficial to himself and injurious to none. Upon what pretense is this man to be the subject of violence? For restraint. Restraint from what? 
from some future injury, which it is to be feared he will commit. This is the very argument which has been employed to justify the most execrable tyrannies. By what reasonings have the Inquisition, the employment of spies, and the various kinds of public censure directed against opinion been vindicated? By recollecting that there is an intimate connection between men's opinions and their conduct, that immoral sentiments lead, by a very probable consequence, to immoral actions, there is not more reason, in many cases at least, to apprehend that the man who has once committed robbery will commit it again, than the man who has dissipated his property at the gaming table, or who is accustomed to profess that upon any emergency he will not scruple to have recourse to this expedient. Nothing can be more obvious than that, whatever precautions may be allowable with respect to the future, justice will reluctantly class among these precautions a violence to be committed on my neighbor. Nor is it oftener unjust than it is superfluous. Why not arm myself with vigilance and energy? instead of locking up every man whom my imagination may bid me fear, that I may spend my days in undisturbed inactivity. If communities, instead of aspiring, as they have hitherto done, to embrace a vast territory and glut their vanity with ideas of empire, were contented with a small district, with a proviso of confederation in cases of necessity, every individual would then live under the public eye, and the disapprobation of his neighbors, a species of coercion, not derived from the caprice of men, but from the system of the universe, would inevitably oblige him either to reform or to emigrate. The sum of the argument under this head is that all punishment for the sake of restraint is punishment upon suspicion, a species of punishment, the most abhorrent to reason, and arbitrary in its application that can be devised. The second object which punishment may be imagined to propose to itself is reformation. We have already seen various objections that may be offered to it in this point of view. Coercion cannot convince, cannot conciliate, but on the contrary, alienates the mind of him against whom it is employed. Coercion has nothing in common with reason, and therefore can have no proper tendency to the cultivation of virtue. It is true that reason is nothing more than a collation and comparison of various emotions and feelings, but they must be the feelings originally appropriate to the question, not those which an arbitrary will stimulated by the possession of power, may annex to it. Reason is omnipotent. If my conduct be wrong, a very simple statement, flowing from a clear and comprehensive view, will make it appear to be such. Nor is it probable that there is any perverseness that would persist in vice, in the face of all the recommendations with which virtue might be invested, and all the beauty in which it might be displayed. But to this it may be answered that this view of the subject may indeed be abstractedly true but that it is not true relative to the present imperfection of human faculties. The grand requisite for the reformation and improvement of the human species seems to consist in the rousing of the mind. It is for this reason that the school of adversity has so often been considered as the school of virtue. Footnote, Book 5, Chapter 2, Page 4, End Footnote. In an even course of easy and prosperous circumstances, the faculties sleep, but when great and urgent occasion is presented, it should seem that the mind rises to the level of the occasion. Difficulties awaken vigor and engender strength, and it will frequently happen that the more you check and oppress me, the more will my faculties swell till they burst all the obstacles of oppression. The opinion of the excellence of adversity is built upon a very obvious mistake. If we will divest ourselves of paradox and singularity, we shall perceive that adversity is a bad thing but that there is something else that is worse. Mind can neither exist nor be improved without the reception of ideas. It will improve more in a calamitous than a torpid state. A man will sometimes be found wiser at the end of his career, who has been treated with severity than with neglect. But because severity is one way of generating thought, it does not follow that it is the best. It has already been shown that coercion, absolutely considered, is injustice. Can injustice be the best mode of disseminating principles of equity and reason. Oppression, exercised to a certain extent, is the most ruinous of all things. What is it but this, that has habituated mankind to so much ignorance and vice for so many thousand years? Is it probable that that which has been thus terrible in its consequences should, under any variation of circumstances, be made a source of eminent good? All coercion sours the mind. He that suffers it 
is practically persuaded of the want of a philanthropy sufficiently enlarged in those with whom he has intercourse. He feels that justice prevails only with great limitations, and that he cannot depend upon being treated with justice. The lesson which coercion reads to him is, Submit to force, and abjure reason. Be not directed by the convictions of your understanding, but by the basest part of your nature, the fear of personal pain, and a compulsory awe of the injustice of others. It was thus Elizabeth of England and Frederick of Prussia were educated in the school of adversity. The way in which they profited by this discipline was by finding resources in their own minds, enabling them to regard, with an unconquered spirit, the violence employed against them. Can this be the best mode of forming men to virtue? If it be, perhaps it is further requisite that the coercion we use should be flagrantly unjust, since the improvement seems to lie, not in submission, but resistance. But it is certain that truth is adequate to excite the mind, without the aid of adversity. By truth is here understood a just view of all the attractions of industry, knowledge, and benevolence. If I apprehend the value of any pursuit, shall I not engage in it? If I apprehend it clearly, shall I not engage in it zealously? If you would awaken my mind in the most effectual manner, speak to the genuine and honorable feelings of my nature. For that purpose, thoroughly understand yourself, that which you would recommend to me. Impregnate your mind with its evidence and speak from the clearness of your view and the fullness of conviction. Were we accustomed to an education in which truth was never neglected from indolence or told in a way treacherous to its excellence in which the preceptor subjected himself to the perpetual discipline of finding the way to communicate it with brevity and force, but without prejudice and acrimony, it cannot be believed but that such an education would be more effectual for the improvement of the mind than all the modes of angry or benevolent coercion that ever were devised. The last object which punishment proposes is example. Had legislators confined their views to reformation and restraint, their exertions of power, though mistaken, would still have borne the stamp of humanity. But the moment vengeance presented itself as a stimulus on the one side, or the exhibition of a terrible example on the other, no barbarity was thought too great. Ingenious cruelty was busied to find new means of torturing the victim or of rendering the spectacle impressive and horrible. It has long since been observed that this system of policy constantly fails of its purpose. Further refinements in barbarity produce a certain impression, so long as they are new, but this impression soon vanishes, and the whole scope of a gloomy invention is exhausted in vain. Footnote. Beccaria, de deliti e della pene. End footnote. The reason of this phenomenon is that, Whatever may be the force with which novelty strikes the imagination, the inherent nature of the situation speedily recurs and asserts its indestructible empire. We feel the emergencies to which we are exposed, and we feel, or think we feel, the dictates of reason inciting us to their relief. Whatever ideas we form in opposition to the mandates of law, we draw with sincerity, though it may be with some mixture of mistake, from the essential conditions of our existence. We compare them with the despotism which society exercises in its corporate capacity. And the more frequent is our comparison, the greater are our murmurs and indignation against the injustice to which we are exposed. But indignation is not a sentiment that conciliates. Barbarity possesses none of the attributes of persuasion. It may terrify, but it cannot produce in us candor and docility. Thus ulcerated with injustice, our distresses, our temptations, and all the eloquence of feeling present themselves again and again. Is it any wonder they should prove victorious? Punishment, for example, is liable to all the objections which are urged against punishment for restraint or reformation, and to certain other objections peculiar to itself. It is employed against the person not now in the commission of offense, and of whom we can only suspect that he ever will offend. It supersedes argument, reason, and conviction, and requires us to think such a species of conduct our duty, because such is the good pleasure of our superiors, and because, as we are taught by the example in question, they will make us rue our stubbornness if we think otherwise. In addition to this, it is to be remembered that when I am made to suffer as an example to others, I am myself treated with supercilious neglect, as if I were totally incapable of feeling and morality. If you inflict pain upon me, you are either just or unjust. If you be just, it should seem necessary that there should be something in me 
that makes me the fit subject of pain, either absolute desert, which is absurd, or mischief I may be expected to perpetrate, or lastly, a tendency in what you do to produce my reformation. If any of these be the reason why the suffering I undergo is just, then example is out of the question. It may be an incidental consequence of the procedure, but it forms no part of its principle. It must surely be a very inartificial and injudicious scheme for guiding the sentiments of mankind to fix upon an individual as a subject of torture or death, respecting whom this treatment has no direct fitness, merely that we may bid others look on and derive instruction from his misery. This argument will derive additional force from the reasoning of the following chapter. End of section 37. Recording by Arden. Section 38 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 7, Chapter 4. Of the Application of Punishment. Delinquency and punishment incommensurable. External action no proper subject of criminal animadversion. How far capable of proof. Iniquity of this standard and immoral. And in a political view. Propriety of a retribution to be measured by the intention of the offender considered. Such a project would overturn criminal law. Would abolish punishment. Inscrutability. One of motives. Doubtfulness of history. Declarations of sufferers. 2. Of the future conduct of the offender. Uncertainty of evidence. Either of the facts or the intention. Disadvantages of the defendant in a criminal suit. A further consideration calculated to show not only the absurdity of punishment for example, but the iniquity of punishment in general, is that delinquency and punishment are in all cases, incommensurable. No standard of delinquency ever has been, or ever can be, discovered. No two crimes were ever alike. And therefore, the reducing them, explicitly or implicitly, to general classes, which the very idea of example implies, is absurd. Nor is it less absurd to attempt to proportion the degree of suffering to the degree of delinquency, when the latter can never be discovered. Let us endeavor to clear the truth of these propositions. Man, like every other machine, the operations of which can be made the object of our senses, may, in a certain sense, be affirmed to consist of two parts, the external and the internal. The form which his actions assume is one thing, the principle from which they flow is another. With the former, it is possible we should be acquainted. Respecting the latter, there is no species of evidence that can adequately inform us. Shall we proportion the degree of suffering to the former or the latter, to the injury sustained by the community, or to the quantity of ill intention conceived by the offender? Some philosophers, sensible of the inscrutability of intention, have declared in favor of our attending to nothing but the injury sustained. The humane and benevolent Beccaria has treated this as a truth of the utmost importance, unfortunately neglected by the majority of political institutors and preserved only in the dispassionate speculation of philosophers. Footnote. Questa è una de quelle palpabili verita, che per una ma vigliosa combinazione di circostanza non sono condecisa sicurezza conosciute, che da alcuni pochi pensatori uomini d'ogni nazione e d'ogni secolo, dei delitti e della penne. End footnote. It is true that we may, in many instances, be tolerably informed respecting external actions, and that there will, at first sight, appear to be no great difficulty in reducing them to general rules. Murder, according to this system, suppose, will be the exertion of any species of action affecting my neighbor, so as that the consequences terminate in death. The difficulties of the magistrate are much abridged upon this principle though they are by no means annihilated. 
it is well known how many subtle disquisitions, ludicrous or tragical, according to the temper with which we view them, have been introduced to determine in each particular instance whether the action were or were not the real occasion of the death. It never can be demonstratively ascertained. But dismissing this difficulty, how complicated is the iniquity of treating all instances alike in which one man has occasioned the death of another? Shall we abolish the imperfect distinctions, which the most odious tyrannies have hitherto thought themselves compelled to admit, between chance medley, manslaughter, and malice prepense? Shall we inflict on the man who, in endeavoring to save the life of a drowning fellow creature, oversets a boat and occasions the death of a second, the same suffering as on him who, from gloomy and vicious habits, is incited to the murder of his benefactor? In reality, the injury sustained by the community is by no means the same in these two cases. The injury sustained by the community is to be measured by the antisocial dispositions of the offender, and if that were the right view of the subject, by the encouragement afforded to similar dispositions from his impunity. But this leads us at once from the external action to the unlimited consideration of the intention of the actor. The iniquity of the written laws of society is of precisely the same nature, though not of so atrocious a degree, in the confusion they actually introduce between various intentions, as if this confusion were unlimited. One man shall commit murder to remove a troublesome observer of his depraved dispositions, who will otherwise counteract and expose him to the world. A second, because he cannot bear the ingenuous sincerity with which he is told of his vices. A third, from his intolerable envy of superior merit. A fourth, because he knows that his adversary meditates an act pregnant with extensive mischief, and perceives no other mode by which its perpetration can be prevented. A fifth, in defense of his father's life or his daughter's chastity. Each of these men, except perhaps the last, may act either from momentary impulse or from any of the infinite shades and degrees of deliberation. Would you award one individual punishment to all these varieties of action? Can a system that levels these inequalities and confounds these differences be productive of good, that we may render men beneficent towards each other? Shall we subvert the very nature of right and wrong? Or is not this system, from whatever pretenses introduced, calculated in the most powerful manner, to produce general injury? Can there be a more flagrant injury than to inscribe, as we do in effect, upon our courts of judgment? This is the hall of justice, in which the principles of right and wrong are daily and systematically slighted, and offenses of a thousand different magnitudes are confounded together by the insolent supineness of the legislator and the unfeeling selfishness of those who have engrossed the produce of the general labor to their particular emolument. But suppose, secondly, that we were to take the intention of the offender and the future injury to be apprehended as the standard of inflection. This would no doubt be a considerable improvement. This would be the true mode of reconciling punishment and justice, if for reasons already assigned they were not in their own nature, incompatible. It is earnestly to be desired that this mode of administering retribution should be seriously attempted. It is to be hoped that men will one day attempt to establish an accurate criterion, and not go on forever as they have hitherto done with a sovereign contempt of equity and reason. This attempt would lead, by a very obvious process, to the abolition of all punishment. It would immediately lead to the abolition of all criminal law, an enlightened and reasonable judicature would have recourse, in order to decide upon the cause before them, to no code but the code of reason. They would feel the absurdity of other men's teaching them what they should think, and pretending to understand the case before it happened, better than they who had all the circumstances under their inspection. They would feel the absurdity of bringing every offense to be compared with a certain number of measures previously invented, and compelling it to agree with one of them but we shall shortly have occasion to return to this topic. Footnote, chapter 8, and footnote. The great advantage that would result from men's determining to govern themselves, and the suffering to be inflicted by the motives of the offender, and the future injury to be apprehended, would consist 
in their being taught how vain and presumptuous it is in them to attempt to wield the rod of retribution. Who is it that, in his sober reason, will pretend to assign the motives that influence me in any article of my conduct, and upon them to found a grave, perhaps a capital, penalty against me? The attempt would be iniquitous and absurd, even though the individual who was to judge me had made the longest observation of my character, and been most intimately acquainted with the series of my actions. How often does a man deceive himself in the motives of his conduct, and assign to one principle what in reality proceeded from another? Can we expect that a mere spectator should form a judgment sufficiently correct, when he who has all the sources of information in his hands is nevertheless mistaken? Is it not to this hour a dispute among philosophers whether I be capable of doing good to my neighbor for his own sake? To ascertain the intention of a man, it is necessary to be precisely informed of the actual impression of the objects upon his senses, and of the previous disposition of his mind, both of which vary in different persons, and even in the same person at different times, with a rapidity commensurate to the succession of ideas, passions, and circumstances. Footnote Questa l'intenzione dipende dalla impressione attuale degli oggetti, et dalla precedente disposizione della mente. Esser radiano in tutti gli uomini in ciascum uomo con la velocissima successione delle idee, della passione e della circostanza. He adds, Sarba dumqua necessario formare nun solo un codice particolare per ciascun cittadino ma una nuova lega ad ogni delito, de deliti e della pene. End footnote. Meanwhile the individuals, whose office it is to judge of this inscrutable mystery, are possessed of no previous knowledge, utter strangers to the person accused and collecting their only materials from the information of two or three ignorant and prejudiced witnesses. But a vast train of actual and possible motives enter into the history of a man who has been incited to destroy the life of another. Can you tell how much in these there was of apprehended justice, and how much of inordinate selfishness, how much of sudden passion, and how much of rooted depravity, how much of intolerable provocation, and how much of spontaneous wrong? How much of that sudden insanity, which hurries the mind into a certain action, by a sort of incontinence of nature, almost without any assignable motive, and how much of incurable habits? Consider the uncertainty of history. Do we not still dispute whether Cicero were more a vain or a virtuous man, whether the heroes of ancient Rome were impelled by vain glory or disinterested benevolence, whether Voltaire were the stain of his species, or their most generous and intrepid benefactor? Upon these subjects moderate men perpetually quote the impenetrableness of the human heart. Will moderate men pretend that we have not a hundred times more evidence upon which to found our judgment in these cases than in that of the man who was tried last week at the Old Bailey? This part of the subject will be put in a striking light if we recollect the narratives that have been published by condemned criminals. In how different a light do they place the transactions that prove fatal to them from the construction that was put upon them by their judges, and yet these narratives were written under the most awful circumstances, and many of them without the least hope of mitigating their fate, and with marks of the deepest sincerity. Who will say that the judge, with his slender pittance of information, was more competent to decide upon the motives than the prisoner after the severest scrutiny of his own mind? How few are the trials which an humane and just man can read, terminating in a verdict of guilty, without feeling an uncontrollable repugnance against the verdict. If there be any sight more humiliating than all others, it is that of a miserable victim acknowledging the justice of a sentence, against which every enlightened spectator exclaims with horror. But this is not all. The motive, when ascertained, is a subordinate part of the question, the point upon which only society can equitably animadvert. If it had any jurisdiction in the case, is a point if possible, still more inscrutable than that of which we have been treating. A legal inquisition into the minds of men, considered by itself, all rational inquirers have agreed to condemn. What we want to ascertain is not the intention of the offender, but the chance of his offending again. For this purpose, we reasonably inquire first into his intention. But when we have found this, 
our task is but begun. This is one of our materials, to enable us to calculate the probability of his repeating his offense or being imitated by others. Was this an habitual state of his mind, or was it a crisis in his history, likely to remain and unique? What effect has experience produced on him, or what likelihood is there that the uneasiness and suffering that attend the perpetration of eminent wrong may have worked a salutary change in his mind? Will he hereafter be placed in circumstances that shall impel him to the same enormity? Precaution is, in its own nature, a step in a high degree precarious. Precaution that consists in inflicting injury on another will at all times be odious to an equitable mind. Meanwhile, be it observed, that all which has been said upon the uncertainty of crime tends to aggravate the injustice of punishment for the sake of example. Since the crime upon which I animadvert in one man can never be the same as the crime of another, it is as if I should award a grievous penalty against persons but one eye, to prevent any man in future from putting out his eyes by design. One more argument, calculated to prove the absurdity of the attempt to proportion delinquency and suffering to each other, may be derived from the imperfection of evidence. The veracity of witnesses will, to an impartial spectator, be a subject of continual doubt. Their competence, so far as relates to just observation and accuracy of understanding, will be still more doubtful. Absolute impartiality it would be absurd to expect from them. How much will every word and every action come distorted by the medium through which it is transmitted? The guilt of a man, to speak in the phraseology of law, may be proved either by direct or circumstantial evidence. I am found near to the body of a man newly murdered. I come out of his apartment with a bloody knife in my hand or with blood upon my clothes. If under these circumstances and unexpectedly charged but murder, I falter in my speech, or betray perturbation in my countenance. This is an additional proof. Who does not know that there is not a man in England, however blameless a life he may lead, who is secure that he shall not end it at the gallows? This is one of the most obvious and universal blessings that civil government has to bestow. In what is called direct evidence, it is necessary to identify the person of the offender. How many instances are there upon record of persons condemned upon this evidence, who, after their death, have been proved entirely innocent. Sir Walter Raleigh, when a prisoner in the tower, heard some high words accompanied with blows under his window. He inquired of several eyewitnesses, who entered his apartment in succession, into the nature of the transaction, but the story they told varied in such material circumstances that he could form no just idea of what had been done. He applied this to prove the uncertainty of history. The parallel would have been more striking if he had applied it to criminal pursuits. But, supposing the external action, the first part of the question, to be ascertained, we have next to discover through the same garbled and confused medium the intention. How few men should I choose to entrust with the drawing up a narrative of some delicate and interesting transaction of my life? How few, though corporally speaking, they were witnesses of what was done, would justly describe my motives, and properly report and interpret my words. Yet, in an affair that involves my life, my fame, and future usefulness, I am obliged to trust to any vulgar and casual observer. A man properly confident in the force of truth would consider a public libel upon his character as a trivial misfortune, but a criminal trial in a court of justice is inexpressibly different. Few men, thus circumstanced, can retain the necessary presence of mind and freedom from embarrassment. But if they do, it is with a cold and unwilling ear that their tale is heard. If the crime charged against them be atrocious, they are half condemned in the passions of mankind, before their cause is brought to a trial. All that is interesting to them is decided amidst the first burst of indignation, and it is well if their story be impartially estimated ten years after their body is mouldered in the grave. Why, if a considerable time elapsed between the trial and the execution, do we find the severity of the public changed into compassion? For the same reason that a master, if he do not beat his slave in the moment of resentment, often feels a repugnance to the beating him at all. Not so much, perhaps, as is commonly supposed, from forgetfulness of the offense, as that the sentiments of reason have time to recur 
and he feels, in a confused and indefinite manner, the injustice of punishment. Thus every consideration tends to show that a man tried for a crime is a poor deserted individual, with the whole force of the community conspiring his ruin. The culprit that escapes, however conscious of innocence, lifts up his hands with astonishment, and can scarcely believe his senses, having such mighty odds against him. It is easy for a man who desires to shake off an imputation under which he labors to talk of being put on his trial, but no man ever seriously wished for this ordeal who knew what a trial was. End of section 38 Recording by Arden Section 39 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 7, Chapter 5. Of Punishment Considered as a Temporary Expedient. Arguments in its favor. Answer. It cannot fit men for a better order of society. The true remedy, to private injustice described, is adapted to immediate practice. Duty of the community in this respect. Duty of individuals. Illustration from the case of war. Of individual defense. Application. Disadvantages of anarchy. Want of security. Of progressive inquiry. Correspondent disadvantages of despotism. Anarchy awakens. Despotism depresses the mind. Final result of anarchy. How determined. Supposed purposes of punishment in a temporary view. Reformation. Example. Restraint. Conclusion. Thus much for the general merits of punishment, considered as an instrument to be applied in the government of men. It is time that we should inquire into the apology which may be offered in its behalf as a temporary expedient. No introduction seemed more proper to this inquiry than such a review of the subject upon a comprehensive scale, that the reader might be inspired with a suitable repugnance against so pernicious a system, and prepared firmly to resist its admission, in all cases, where its necessity cannot be clearly demonstrated. The arguments in favor of punishment as a temporary expedient are obvious. It may be alleged that, however suitable an entire immunity in this respect may be, to the nature of mind absolutely considered, it is impracticable with regard to men as we now find them. The human species is at present infected with a thousand vices, the offspring of established injustice. They are full of factitious appetites and perverse habits, headstrong and evil, inveterate in selfishness, without sympathy and forbearance for the welfare of others. In time, they may become accommodated to the lessons of reason, but at present, they would be found deaf to her mandates, and eager to commit every species of injustice. One of the remarks that most irresistibly suggest themselves upon this statement is that punishment has no proper tendency to prepare men for a state in which punishment shall cease. It were idle to expect that force should begin to do that, which it is the office of truth to finish, should fit men, by severity and violence, to enter with more favorable auspices into the schools of reason. But, to omit this gross misrepresentation in behalf of the supposed utility of punishment, it is of importance, in the first place, to observe that there is a complete and unanswerable remedy to those evils, the cure of which has hitherto been sought in punishment, that is, within the reach of every community, whenever they shall be persuaded to adopt it. There is a state of society, the outline of which has been already sketched. Footnote. Book 5. Chapter 22 page 94, end footnote, that, by the mere simplicity of its structure, would lead to the extermination of offense, a state in which temptation would be almost unknown, truth brought down to the level of all apprehensions, and vice sufficiently checked by the general discountenance and sober condemnation of every spectator. Such are the consequences that might be expected to spring from an abolition of the craft and mystery of governing, while, on the other hand, the innumerable murders that are daily committed under the sanction of legal forms are solely to be ascribed to the pernicious notion of an extensive territory, to the dreams of glory, empire, and national greatness, 
which have hitherto proved the bane of the human species, without producing entire benefit and happiness to a single individual. Another observation which this consideration immediately suggests is that it is not, as the objection supposed, by any means necessary that mankind should pass through a state of purification and be freed from the vicious propensities which ill-constituted governments have implanted before they can be dismissed from the coercion to which they are at present subjected. Their state would indeed be hopeless if it were necessary that the cure should be effected before we were at liberty to discard those practices to which the disease owes its most alarming symptoms. But it is the characteristic of a well-formed society not only to maintain in its members those virtues with which they are already imbued, but to extirpate their errors and render them benevolent and just to each other. It frees us from the influence of those phantoms which before misled us, shows us our true advantage as consisting in independence and integrity, and binds us by the general consent of our fellow citizens to the dictates of reason, more strongly than with fetters of iron. It is not to the sound of intellectual health that the remedy so urgently addresses itself as to those who are infected with diseases of the mind. The ill propensities of mankind no otherwise tend to postpone the abolition of coercion than as they prevent them from perceiving the advantages of political simplicity. The moment in which they can be persuaded to adopt any rational plan for this abolition is the moment in which the abolition ought to be effected. A further consequence that may be deduced from the principles that have here been delivered is that a coercion to be employed upon its own members can, in no case, be the duty of the community. The community is always competent to change its institutions and thus to extirpate offense in a way infinitely more rational and just than that of punishment. If, in this sense, punishment has been deemed necessary as a temporary expedient, the opinion admits of satisfactory refutation. Punishment can at no time, either permanently or provisionally, make part of any political system that is built upon the principles of reason. But, though, in this sense, punishment cannot be admitted, for so much as a temporary expedient, there is another sense in which it must be so admitted. Coercion, exercised in the name of the state upon its respective members, cannot be the duty of the community. But coercion may be the duty of individuals within the community. The duty of individuals, in their political capacity, is, in the first place, to endeavor to ameliorate the state of society in which they exist, and to be indefatigable in detecting its imperfections. But, in the second place, it behooves them to recollect that their efforts cannot be expected to meet with instant success, that the progress of knowledge has, in all cases, been gradual, and that their obligation to promote the welfare of society during the intermediate period is certainly not less real than their obligation to promote its future and permanent advantage. Even the future advantage cannot be effectually procured if we be inattentive to the present security. But, as long as nations shall be so far mistaken as to endure a complex government and an extensive territory, coercion will be indispensably necessary to general security. It is therefore the duty of individuals to take an active share upon occasion in so much coercion, and in such parts of the existing system, as shall be sufficient to counteract the growth of universal violence and tumult. It is unworthy of a rational inquirer to say, these things are necessary, but I am not obliged to take my share in them. If they be necessary, they are necessary for the general welfare, of consequence, are virtuous, and what no just man will refuse to perform. The duty of individuals is, in this respect, similar to the duty of independent communities upon the subject of war. It is well known what has been the prevailing policy of princes under this head. Princes, especially the most active and enterprising among them, are seized with an inextinguishable rage for augmenting their dominions. The most innocent and inoffensive conduct on the part of their neighbors will not, at all times, be a sufficient security against their ambition. They indeed seek to disguise their violence under plausible pretenses, but it is well known that, where no such pretenses occur, they are not, on that account, disposed to relinquish the pursuit. Let us imagine, then, a land of freemen invaded by one of these despots. What conduct does it behoove them to adopt? We are not yet wise enough to make the sword drop out of the hands of our oppressors by the mere force of reason. Were we resolved, like Quakers, neither to oppose 
nor where it could be avoided, to submit to them. Much bloodshed might perhaps be prevented, but a more lasting evil would result. They would fix garrisons in our country and torment us with perpetual injustice. Supposing it were even granted that if the invaded nation should demean itself with unalterable constancy, the invaders would become tired of their fruitless usurpation. It would prove but little. At present, we have to do not with nations of philosophers, but with nations of men whose virtues are alloyed with weakness, fluctuation, and inconstancy. At present, it is our duty to consult respecting the procedure which, to such nations, may be attended with the most favorable result. It is therefore proper that we should choose the least calamitous mode of obliging the enemy speedily to withdraw himself from our territories. The case of individual defense is of the same nature. It does not appear that any advantage can result from my forbearance, adequate to the disadvantages of suffering my own life or that of another, a peculiarly valuable member of the community, as it may happen, to become a prey to the first ruffian who inclines to destroy it. Forbearance, in this case, will be the conduct of a singular individual, and its effect may very probably be trifling. Hence, it appears that I ought to arrest the villain in the execution of his designs, though at the expense of a certain degree of coercion. The case of an offender, who appears to be hardened in guilt, and to trade in the violation of social security, is clearly parallel to these. I ought to take up arms against the despot by whom my country is invaded, because my capacity does not enable me by arguments to prevail on him to desist, and because my countrymen will not preserve their intellectual independence in the midst of oppression. For the same reason, I ought to take up arms against a domestic spoiler, because I am unable either to persuade him to desist, or the community to adopt the just political institution by means of which security might be maintained, consistently with the abolition of punishment. To understand the full extent of this duty, it is incumbent upon us to remark that anarchy, as it is usually understood, and a well-conceived form of society without government are exceedingly different from each other. If the government of Great Britain were dissolved tomorrow, unless that dissolution were the result of consistent and digested views of political truth previously disseminated among the inhabitants, it would be very far from leading to the abolition of violence. Individuals, freed from the terrors by which they had been accustomed to be restrained, and not yet placed under the happier and more rational restraint of public inspection, or convinced of the wisdom of reciprocal forbearance, would break out into acts of injustice, while other individuals, who desired only that this irregularity should cease, would find themselves obliged to associate for its forcible suppression. We should have all the evils and compulsory restraint attached to a regular government, at the same time that we were deprived of that tranquility and leisure which are its only advantages. It may not be useless in this place, to consider, more accurately than we have hitherto done, the evils of anarchy. Such a review may afford us a criterion by which to discern, as well the comparative value of different institutions, as the precise degree of coercion which is required for the exclusion of universal violence and tumult. Anarchy, in its own nature, is an evil of short duration. The more horrible are the mischiefs it inflicts, the more does it hasten to a close. But it is nevertheless necessary that we should consider both what is the quantity of mischief it produces in a given period, and what is the scene in which it promises to close. The first victim that is sacrificed at its shrine is personal security. Every man who has a secret foe ought to dread the dagger of that foe. There is no doubt that in the worst anarchy, multitudes of men will sleep in happy obscurity. But woe to him who by whatever means excites the envy, the jealousy, or the suspicion of his neighbor. Unbridled ferocity instantly marks him for its prey. This is indeed the principal evil of such a state, that the wisest, the brightest, the most generous and bold will often be most exposed to an immature fate. In such a state we must bid farewell to the patient lucubrations of the philosopher and the labor of the midnight oil. All is here, like the society in which it exists, impatient and headlong. Mind will frequently burst forth, but its appearance will be like the coruscations of the meteor, not like the mild and equable illumination of the sun. Men, who start forth into sudden energy, will resemble in temper the state that brought them to this unlooked-for greatness. They will be rigorous, unfeeling, and fierce. 
and their ungoverned passions will often not stop at equality, but incite them to grasp at power. With all these evils, we must not hastily conclude that the mischiefs of anarchy are worse than those which government is qualified to produce. With respect to personal security, anarchy is perhaps a condition more deplorable than despotism, but then it is to be considered that despotism is as perennial as anarchy is transitory. Despotism, as it existed under the Roman emperors, marked out wealth for its victim, and the guilt of being rich never failed to convict the accused of every other crime. This despotism continued for centuries. Despotism, as it has existed in modern Europe, has been ever full of jealousy and intrigue, a tool to the rage of courtiers and the resentment of women. He that dared utter a word against the tyrant, or endeavor to instruct his countrymen in their interests, was never secure that the next moment would not conduct him to a dungeon. Pure despotism wreaked her vengeance at leisure, and forty years of misery and solitude were sometimes insufficient to satiate her fury. Nor was this all. An usurpation, that defied all the rules of justice, was obliged to purchase its own safety, by assisting tyranny through all its subordinate ranks. Hence the rights of nobility, of feudal vassalage, of primogeniture, of fines and inheritance. When the philosophy of law shall be properly understood, the true key to its spirit in history will probably be found, not, as some men have fondly imagined, in a desire to secure the happiness of mankind, but in the venal compact by which superior tyrants have purchased the countenance and alliance of the inferior. There is one point remaining in which anarchy and despotism are strongly contrasted with each other. Anarchy awakens thought and diffuses energy and enterprise through the community, though it does not affect this in the best manner as its fruits, forced into ripeness, must not be expected to have the vigorous stamina of true excellence. But in despotism, mind is trampled into an equality of the most odious sort. Everything that promises greatness is destined to fall under the exterminating hand of suspicion and envy. In despotism, there is no encouragement to excellence. Mind delights to expatiate in a field where every species of distinction is within its reach. A scheme of policy, under which all men are fixed in classes, or leveled with the dust, affords it no encouragement to pursue its career. The inhabitants of countries in which despotism is complete are frequently but a more vicious species of brutes. Oppression stimulates them to mischief and piracy, and superior force of mind often displays itself only in deeper treachery or more daring injustice. One of the most interesting questions in relation to anarchy is that of the result in which it may be expected to terminate. The possibilities as to this termination are as wide as the various schemes of society which the human imagination can conceive. Anarchy may and has terminated in despotism, and, in that case, the introduction of anarchy will only serve to afflict us with a variety of evils. It may lead to a modification of despotism, a milder and more equitable government than that which had gone before. It cannot immediately lead to the best form of society, since it necessarily leaves mankind in a state of ferment which requires a strong hand to control, and a slow and wary process to tranquilize. The scene in which anarchy shall terminate principally depends upon the state of mind by which it has been preceded. All mankind were in a state of anarchy, that is, without government, previously to their being in a state of policy. It would not be difficult to find, in the history of almost every country, a period of anarchy. The people of England were in a state of anarchy immediately before the Restoration, the Roman people were in a state of anarchy at the moment of their secession to the sacred mountain. Hence it follows that anarchy is neither so good nor so ill a thing in relation to its consequences, as it has sometimes been represented. Little good can be expected from any species of anarchy that should subsist, for instance, among American savages. In order to anarchy being rendered a seed plot of future justice, reflection and inquiry must have gone before. The regions of philosophy must have been penetrated, and political truth have opened her school to mankind. It is for this reason that the revolutions of the present age, for revolution is a species of anarchy, promise a more auspicious ultimate result than the revolutions of any former period. For the same reason, the more anarchy can be held at bay, the more fortunate will it be for mankind. 
falsehood may gain by precipitating the crisis, but a genuine and enlightened philanthropy will wait with unaltered patience for the harvest of instruction. The arrival of that harvest may be slow, but it is perhaps infallible. If vigilance and wisdom be successful in their present opposition to anarchy, every benefit may ultimately be expected, untarnished with violence and unstained with blood. These observations are calculated to lead us to an accurate estimate of the mischiefs of anarchy, and, of consequence, to show the importance we are bound to attach to the exclusion of it. Government is frequently a source of peculiar evils, but an enlarged view will teach us to endure those evils, which experience seems to events are inseparable from the final benefit of mankind. From the savage state to the highest degree of civilization, the passage is long and arduous, and, if we aspire to the final result, we must submit to that portion of misery and vice which necessarily fills the space between. If we would free ourselves from these inconveniences, unless our attempt be both skillful and cautious, we shall be in danger, by our impatience, of producing worse evils than those we would escape. Now it is the first principle of morality and justice that directs us, where one of two evils is inevitable to choose the least. Of consequence, the wise and just man, being unable, as yet, to introduce the form of society which his understanding approves, will contribute to the support of so much coercion as is necessary to exclude what is worse, anarchy. If then constraint, as the antagonist of constraint, must, in certain cases, and under temporary circumstances, be admitted, it is an interesting inquiry to ascertain which of the three ends of punishment already enumerated, must be selected by the individuals by whom punishment is employed. And here it will be sufficient, very briefly, to recollect the reasonings that have been stated under each of these heads. It cannot be reformation. Reformation is improvement, and nothing can take place in a man worthy the name of improvement otherwise than by an appeal to the unbiased judgment of his mind and the essential feelings of his nature. If I would improve a man's character... Who is there that knows not that the only effectual mode is, by removing all extrinsic influences and incitements, by inducing him to observe, to reason and inquire, by leading him to the forming a series of sentiments that are truly his own, and not slavishly modeled upon the sentiments of another? To conceive that compulsion and punishment are the proper means of reformation is the sentiment of a barbarian. Civilization and science are calculated to explode so ferocious an idea. It was once universally admitted and approved. It is now necessarily upon the decline. Punishment must either ultimately succeed in imposing the sentiments it is employed to inculcate upon the mind of the sufferer, or it must forcibly alienate him against them. The last of these can never be the intention of its employer, or have a tendency to justify its application. If it were so, punishment ought to follow upon deviations from vice, not deviations from virtue. Yet to alienate the mind of the sufferer from the individual that punishes, and from the sentiments he entertains, is perhaps the most common effect of punishment. Let us suppose, however, that its effect is of an opposite nature, that it produces obedience, and even a change of opinion. What sort of a being does it leave the man thus reformed? His opinions are not changed upon evidence. His conversion is the result of fear. Servility has operated that within him, which liberal inquiry and instruction were not able to do. Punishment undoubtedly may change a man's behavior. It may render his external conduct beneficial from injurious, though it is no very promising expedient for that purpose. But it cannot improve his sentiments, or lead him to the form of right proceeding, but by the basis and most despicable motives. It leaves him a slave, devoted to an exclusive self-interest, and actuated by fear, the meanest of the selfish passions. But it may be said, however strong may be the reasons I am able to communicate to a man in order to his reformation, he may be restless and impatient of expostulation, and of consequence render it necessary that I should retain him by force, till I can properly instill these reasons into his mind. It must be remembered that the idea here is not that of precaution, to prevent the mischiefs he might perpetrate, for that belongs to another of the three ends of punishment, that of restraint. But, separately from this idea, the argument is peculiarly weak. 
If the reasons I have to communicate be of an energetic and impressive nature, if they stand forward perspicuous and distinct in my own mind, it will be strange if they do not, at the outset, excite curiosity and attention in him to whom they are addressed. It is my duty to choose a proper season to communicate them, and not to betray the cause of justice by an ill-timed impatience. This prudence I should infallibly exercise if my object were to obtain something interesting to myself. Why should I be less quick-sighted when I propose the benefit of another? It is a miserable way of preparing a man for conviction, to compel him, by violence, to hear an expostulation which he is eager to avoid. These arguments prove, not that we should lose sight of reformation, if punishment for any other reason appear to be necessary, but that reformation cannot reasonably be made the object of punishment. Punishment for the sake of example is a theory that can never be justly maintained. The suffering proposed to be inflicted, considered absolutely, is either right or wrong. If it be right, it should be inflicted for its intrinsic recommendations. If it be wrong, what sort of example does it display? To do a thing for the sake of example is, in other words, to do a thing today, in order to prove that I will do a similar thing tomorrow. This must always be a subordinate consideration. No argument has been so grossly abused as this of example. We found it under the subject of war. Footnote, Book 5, Chapter 16, Page 72. End footnote. Employed to prove the propriety of my doing a thing otherwise wrong. In order to convince the opposite party that I should, when occasion offered, do something else that was right, he will display the best example who carefully studies the principles of justice and assiduously practices them. A better effect will be produced in human society by my conscientious adherence to them than by my anxiety to create a specific expectation respecting my future conduct. This argument will be still further enforced if we recollect what has already been said respecting the inexhaustible differences of different cases and the impossibility of reducing them to general rules. Footnote, chapter 4. End footnote. The third object of punishment according to the enumeration already made is restraint. If punishment be, in any case, to be admitted, this is the only object it can reasonably propose to itself. The serious objections to which, even in this point of view, it is liable, have been stated in another stage of the inquiry. Footnote, chapter 3, end footnote. The amount of the necessity tending to supersede these objections has also been considered. The subject of this chapter is of great importance, in proportion to the length of time that may possibly elapse before any considerable part of mankind shall be persuaded to exchange the present complexity of political institution for a mode which promises to supersede the necessity of punishment. It is highly unworthy of the cause of truth to suppose that, during this interval, I have no active duties to perform, that I am not obliged to cooperate for the present welfare of the community, as well as for its future regeneration. The temporary obligation that arises out of this circumstance exactly corresponds with what was formerly delivered on the subject of duty. Duty is the best possible application of a given power to the promotion of the general good. Footnote. Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 4. End footnote. But my power depends upon the disposition of the men by whom I am surrounded. If I were enlisted in an army of cowards, it might be my duty to retreat, though absolutely considered. It should have been the duty of the army to come to blows. Under every possible circumstance, it is my duty to advance the general good. By the best means, which the circumstances under which I am placed will admit, End of section 39. Recording by Arden. Section 40 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 7, Chapter 6, Scale of Punishment. Its sphere described, its several classes, death with torture, 
death absolutely, origin of this policy, in the corruptness of political institutions, in the inhumanity of the institutors, corporal punishment, its absurdity, its atrociousness, privation of freedom, duty of reforming our neighbor and inferior consideration in this case, its place described, modes of restraint, indiscriminate imprisonment, solitary imprisonment, its severity, its moral effects, slavery, banishment, one, simple banishment, two, transportation, three, colonization. This project has miscarried from unkindness, from officiousness, its permanent evils, recapitulation. It is time to proceed to the consideration of certain inferences that may be deduced from the theory of punishment which has now been delivered. Nor can anything be of greater importance than these inferences will be found to the virtue, the happiness, and improvement of mankind. And, first, it evidently follows that punishment is an act of painful necessity, inconsistent with the true character and genius of mind, the practice of which is temporarily imposed upon us by the corruption and ignorance that reign among mankind. Nothing can be more absurd than to look to it as a source of improvement. It contributes to the generation of excellence just as the keeper of the course contributes to the fleetness of the race. Nothing can be more unjust than to have recourse to it, but upon the most unquestionable emergency. Instead of multiplying occasions of coercion and applying it as the remedy of every moral evil, the true politician will anxiously confine it within the narrowest limits and perpetually seek to diminish the occasions of its employment. There is but one reason which can, in any case, be admitted as its apology, and that is, where the allowing the offender to be at large shall be notoriously hazardous to public security. Secondly, the consideration of restraint as the only justifiable ground of punishment will furnish us with a simple and satisfactory criterion by which to measure the justice of the suffering inflicted. The infliction of a lingering and tormenting death cannot be vindicated upon this hypothesis, for such infliction can only be dictated by sentiments of resentment on the one hand, or by the desire to exhibit a terrible example on the other. To deprive an offender of his life in any manner will appear to be unjust, as it seems always sufficiently practicable, without this, to prevent him from further offense. Privation of life, though by no means the greatest injury that can be inflicted, must always be considered as a very serious injury since it puts a perpetual close upon the prospects of the sufferer as to all the enjoyments, the virtues, and the excellence of a human being. In the story of those whom the merciless laws of Europe doom to destruction, we sometimes meet with persons who, subsequently to their offense, have succeeded to a plentiful inheritance, or who, for some other reason, appear to have had the fairest prospects of tranquility and happiness opened upon them. Their story, with a little accommodation, may be considered as the story of every offender. If there be any man whom it may be necessary, for the safety of the whole, to put under restraint, this circumstance is a powerful plea to the humanity and justice of those who conduct the affairs of the community, in his behalf. This is the man who most stands in need of their assistance. If they treated him with kindness, instead of supercilious and unfeeling neglect, if they made him understand with how much reluctance they had been induced to employ the force of the society against him, if they represented the true state of the case with calmness, perspicuity, and benevolence to his mind, if they employed those precautions, which an humane disposition would not fail to suggest, to keep from him the motives of corruption and obstinacy, his reformation would be almost infallible. These are the prospects to which his wants and his misfortunes powerfully entitle him, and it is from these prospects that the hand of the executioner cuts him off forever. It is a mistake to suppose that this treatment of criminals tends to multiply crimes. On the contrary, few men would enter upon a course of violence with the certainty of being obliged, by a slow and patient process, to amputate their errors. It is the uncertainty of punishment under the existing forms that multiplies crimes. Remove this uncertainty, and it would be as reasonable to expect that a man would willfully break his leg for the sake of being cured by a skillful surgeon. Whatever gentleness the intellectual physician may display, it is not to be believed that men can part with rooted habits of injustice and vice without considerable pain. The true reasons, in consequence of which these forlorn and deserted members of the community are brought to an ignominious death, are, first, the peculiar iniquity of the civil institutions of that community, 
and, secondly, the supineness and apathy of their superiors. In republican and simple forms of government, punishments are rare, and the punishment of death almost unknown. On the other hand, the more there is in any country of inequality and oppression, the more punishments are multiplied. The more the institutions of society contradict the genuine sentiments of the human mind, the more severely is it necessary to avenge their violation. At the same time, the rich and titled members of the community, proud of their fancied eminence, behold, with total unconcern, the destruction of the destitute and the wretched, disdaining to recollect that, if there be any intrinsic difference between them, it is the offspring of their different circumstances, and that the man whom they now so much despise might have been found as accomplished and susceptible as they, if he had only changed situations. When we behold a company of poor wretches brought out for execution, reflection will present to our affrighted fancy all the hopes and possibilities which are thus brutally extinguished. The genius, the daring invention, the unshrinking firmness, the tender charities and ardent benevolence, which have occasionally, under this system, been sacrificed, at the shrine of torpid luxury and unrelenting avarice. The species of suffering commonly known by the appellation of corporal punishment is also prescribed by the system above established. Corporal punishment, unless so far as it is intended for example, appears, in one respect, in a very ludicrous point of view. It is an expeditious mode of proceeding, which has been invented in order to compress the effect of much reasoning and long confinement that might otherwise have been necessary into a very short compass. In another view, it is difficult to express the abhorrence it ought to create. The genuine propensity of man is to venerate mind in his fellow man. With what delight do we contemplate the progress of intellect, its efforts for the discovery of truth, the harvest of virtue that springs up under the genial influence of instruction, the wisdom that is generated through the medium of unrestricted communication. How completely do violence and corporal infliction reverse the scene? From this moment, all the wholesome avenues of mind are closed, and, on every side, we see them guarded with a train of disgraceful passions, hatred, revenge, despotism, cruelty, hypocrisy, conspiracy, and cowardice. Man becomes the enemy of man. The stronger are seized with the lust of unbridled domination, and the weaker shrink, with hopeless disgust, from the approach of a fellow. With what feelings must an enlightened observer contemplate the furrow of a lash imprinted upon the body of a man? What heart beats not in unison with the sublime law of antiquity? Thou shalt not inflict stripes upon the body of a Roman? There is but one alternative in this case, on the part of the sufferer. Either his mind must be subdued by the arbitrary dictates of the superior, for to him all is arbitrary. That does not stand approved to the judgment of his own understanding. He will be governed by something that is not reason, and ashamed of something that is not disgrace, or else every pang he endures will excite the honest indignation of his heart, and fix the clear disapprobation of his intellect, will produce contempt and alienation against his punisher. The justice of punishment is built upon this simple principle. Every man is bound to employ such means as shall suggest themselves, for preventing evils subversive of general security, it being first ascertained either by experience or reasoning, that all milder methods are inadequate to the exigency of the case. The conclusion from this principle is that we are bound, under certain urgent circumstances, to deprive the offender of the liberty he has abused. Further than this, perhaps no circumstance can authorize us. He whose person is imprisoned, if that be the right kind of seclusion, cannot interrupt the peace of his fellows, and the infliction of further evil, when his power to injure is removed, is the wild and unauthorized dictate of vengeance and rage, the wanton sport of unquestioned superiority. When indeed the person of the offender has been first seized, there is a further duty incumbent on his punisher, the duty of endeavoring his reform. But this makes no part of the direct consideration. The duty of every man to contribute to the intellectual health of his neighbor is of general application. Beside which, it is proper to recollect what has been already proved, that coercion of no sort is among the legitimate means of reformation. Restrain the offender, as long as the safety of the community prescribes it, for this is just. Restrain him not an instant, from a simple view to his own improvement, for this is contrary to reason and morality. Meanwhile, there is one circumstance, by means of which restraint and reformation are closely connected. The person of the offender is to be restrained, as long as the public safety would be endangered by his liberation. But the public safety, 
will cease to be endangered as soon as his propensities and dispositions have undergone a change. The connection which thus results from the nature of things renders it necessary that, in deciding upon the species of restraint to be imposed, these circumstances be considered jointly how the personal liberty of the offender may be least entrenched upon, and how his reformation may be best promoted. The most common method pursued in depriving the offender of the liberty he has abused is to erect a public jail, in which offenders of every description are thrust together and left to form among themselves what species of society they can. Various circumstances contribute to imbue them with habits of indolence and vice, and to discourage industry and no effort is made to remove or soften these circumstances. It cannot be necessary to expatiate upon the atrociousness of this system. Jails are, to a proverb, seminaries of vice, and he must be an uncommon proficient in the passion and practice of injustice, or a man of sublime virtue, who does not come out of them a much worse man than he entered. An active observer of mankind, footnote, Mr. Howard, end footnote, with the purest intentions, and who had paid a singular attention to this subject, was struck with the mischievous tendency of the reigning system, and called the attention of the public to a scheme of solitary imprisonment. But this, though free from the defects of the established mode, is liable to very weighty objections. It must strike every reflecting mind as uncommonly tyrannical and severe. It cannot therefore be admitted into the system of mild coercion, which forms the topic of our inquiry. Man is a social animal. How far he is necessarily so will appear if we consider the sum of advantages resulting from the social, and of which he would be deprived in the solitary state, but, independently of his original structure, he is eminently social by his habits. Will you deprive the man you imprison of paper and books, of tools and amusements? One of the arguments in favor of solitary imprisonment is that it is necessary the offender should be called off from wrong habits of thinking, and obliged to enter into himself. This, the advocates of solitary imprisonment probably believe, will be most effectually done. The fewer be the avocations of the prisoner, but let us suppose that he is indulged in these particulars, and only deprived of society. How many men are there that can derive amusement from books? We are, in this respect, the creatures of habit, and it is scarcely to be expected from ordinary men that they should mold themselves to any species of employment, to which in their youth they were strangers. But he that is most fond of study, has his moments when study pleases no longer. The soul yearns, with inexpressible longings, for the society of its like. Because the public safety unwillingly commands the confinement of an offender, must he for that reason never light up this countenance with a smile? Who can tell the sufferings of him who was condemned to uninterrupted solitude? Who can tell that this is not to the majority of mankind, the bitterest torment that human ingenuity can inflict, a mind sufficiently sublime might perhaps conquer this inconvenience, but the powers of such a mind do not enter into the present question. From the examination of solitary imprisonment, in itself considered, we are naturally led to inquire into its real tendency, as to the article of reformation. To be virtuous, it is requisite that we should consider men and their relation to each other. As a preliminary to this study, it is necessary that we should be shut out from the society of men. Shall we be most effectually formed to justice, benevolence, and prudence in our intercourse with each other in a state of solitude? Will not our selfish and unsocial dispositions be perpetually increased? What temptation has he to think of benevolence or justice, who has no opportunity to exercise it? The true soil in which atrocious crimes are found to germinate is a gloomy and morose disposition. Will his heart become much either softened or expanded, who breathes the atmosphere of a dungeon? Surely it would be better, in this respect, to imitate the system of the universe, and, if we would teach justice and humanity, transplant those we would teach into a simple and reasonable state of society. Solitude, absolutely considered, may instigate us to serve ourselves, but not to serve our neighbors. Solitude, imposed under too few limitations, may be a nursery for madmen and idiots, but not for useful members of society. Another idea which has suggested itself with regard to the removal of offenders from the community they have injured is that of reducing them to a state of slavery or hard labor. The true refutation of this system is anticipated in what has been already said. To the safety of the community it is unnecessary. As a means to the reformation of the offender, 
It is inexpressibly ill-conceived. Man is an intellectual being. There is no way to make him virtuous, but in calling forth his intellectual powers. There is no way to make him virtuous, but by making him independent. He must study the laws of nature, and the necessary consequence of actions, not the arbitrary caprice of his superior. Do you desire that I should work? Do not drive me to it with the whip. For, if, before, I thought it better to be idle, this will but increase my alienation. Persuade my understanding, and render it the subject of my choice. It can only be by the most deplorable perversion of reason that we can be induced to believe any species of slavery, from the slavery of the schoolboy to that of the most unfortunate negro in our West India plantations, favorable to virtue. Footnote. The institution of personal slavery has, within a few years, made a considerable progress in the island of Great Britain. The first step was that of sending criminals, whose guilt was of an inferior description, to raise ballast from the bed of the toms. The second step, more serious in its nature, appears to have resulted from the well-intended, but misguided, philanthropy of Mr. Howard. This consisted in the erecting jails of solitary confinement in various parts of the country. The prisoners in these jails spend a large portion of their time shut up in silent and dreary cells, like so many madmen. The rest of their time is employed in what is called hard labor, under the inspection of certain ignorant and insolent taskmasters. It is asserted that, in one of these jails, Clerkenwell New Prison, its unfortunate tenants are engaged for five hours in each day, in trundling a wheelbarrow round in a circle. The cruelty of this imposition is inexpressibly heightened by its impudent uselessness. From this instance, we may perceive that the inventiveness of tyranny did not perish with the race of the Dionysii. Cases of this sort, it is our duty as citizens to notice that the chance of their existing without the knowledge of those to whose province their superintendence belongs may be removed. End footnote. A scheme greatly preferable to any of these, and which has been tried under various forms, is that of transportation or banishment. This scheme, under the most judicious modifications, is liable to objection. It would be strange if any scheme of coercion or violence were not so, but it has been made appear still more exceptionable than it will be found in its intrinsic nature by the crude and incoherent circumstances with which it has usually been executed. Banishment in its simple form, that is, a mere prohibition of residence, has, at least in certain aggravated cases, a strong appearance of injustice. The citizen whose presence we will not endure in our own country, we have a very questionable right to impose upon any other. Banishment has sometimes been joined with slavery. Such was the practice of Great Britain previously to the defection of her American colonies. This cannot stand in need of a separate reputation. A very usual species of banishment is removal to a country yet unsettled. Something may be alleged in favor of this mode of proceeding. The labor by which the undisciplined mind is best weaned from the vicious habits of a corrupt society is the labor not which is prescribed by the mandate of a superior, but which is imposed by the necessity of subsistence. The first settlement of Rome, by Romulus and his vagabonds, is a happy image of this. Whether we consider it as a real history, or as the ingenious fiction of a writer well acquainted with the principles of mind, men who are freed from the injurious institutions of European government and obliged to begin the world for themselves, are in the direct road to be virtuous. Two circumstances have hitherto contributed to render this project abortive. First, that the mother country pursues this species of colony with her hatred. The chief anxiety is, in reality, to render its residents odious and uncomfortable, with the vain idea of deterring offenders. The chief anxiety ought to be to smooth their difficulties and contribute to their happiness. We should recollect that the colonists are men, for whom we ought to feel no sentiments but those of kindness and compassion. If we were reasonable, we should regret the cruel exigence that obliges us to treat them in a manner unsuitable to the nature of mind, and having complied with the demand of that exigence, we should next be anxious to confer upon them every benefit in our power. But we are unreasonable. We harbor a thousand savage feelings of resentment and vengeance. We thrust them out to the remotest corner of the world. We subject them to perish by multitudes with hardship and hunger. Perhaps, if our treatment of such unfortunate men were sufficiently humane, banishment to the Hebrides would prove as effectual as banishment to the Antipodes. Secondly, 
it is absolutely necessary, upon the principles here explained, that these colonists, after having been sufficiently provided in the outset, should be left to themselves. We do worse than nothing if we pursue them into their obscure retreat with the inauspicious influence of our European institutions. Why trouble ourselves with sending magistrates and officers to govern and direct them? Do we suppose that, if left to themselves, they would universally destroy each other? On the contrary, new situations make new minds. The worst criminals, when turned adrift in a body, and reduced to feel the churlish fang of necessity, conduct themselves upon reasonable principles, and have been found to proceed with a sagacity and public spirit that might put the proudest monarchy to the blush. Meanwhile, let us not forget the inherent vices of punishment, which present themselves from whatever point the subject is viewed. Colonization may be thought the most eligible of those expedients which have been stated, but it is attended with considerable difficulties. The community judges of a certain individual, that his residence cannot be tolerated among them consistently with the general safety. In denying him his choice among other communities, do they not exceed their commission? What treatment shall be awarded him if he return from the banishment to which he was sentenced? These difficulties, and many others might be subjoined to these, are calculated to bring back the mind to the absolute injustice of punishment, and to render us inexpressibly anxious for the period at which it shall be abolished. To conclude, the observations of this chapter are relative to a theory which affirmed that it might be the duty of individuals, but never of communities, to exert a certain species of political coercion, and which founded this duty upon a consideration of the benefits of public security. Under these circumstances, then, every individual is bound to judge for himself and to yield his countenance to no other coercion than that which is indispensably necessary. He will, no doubt, endeavor to ameliorate those institutions with which he cannot prevail upon his countrymen to part. He will decline all concern in the execution of such as abuse the plea of public security to atrocious purposes. Laws may easily be found in almost every code, which, on account of of the iniquity of their provisions, are suffered to fall into disuse by general consent. Every lover of justice will, in this way, contribute to the repeal of laws that wantonly usurp upon the independence of mankind, whether by the multiplicity of their restrictions or the severity of their sanctions. End of section 40. Recording by Arden. Section 41 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dykstra, Farragut, Iowa. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 7, Chapter 7, Of Evidence. Difficulties to which this subject is liable. Exemplified in the distinction between overt actions and intentions. Reasons against this distinction. Principle in which it is founded. Having sought to ascertain the decision in which questions of offense against the general safety ought to terminate, it only remains under this head of inquiry to consider the principles according to which the trial should be conducted. These principles may, for the most part, be referred to two points, the evidence that is to be required and the method to be pursued by us in classing offenses. The difficulties to which the subject of evidence is liable have been stated in the earlier divisions of this work. Footnote, particularly chapter 4, end of footnote. It may be worthwhile, in this place, to recollect the difficulties which attend upon one particular class of evidence, it being scarcely possible that the imagination of every reader should not suffice him to apply this text and to perceive how easily the same kind of enumeration might be extended to any other class. It has been asked, why intentions are not subjected to the animadversion 
of criminal justice in the same manner as direct acts of offense. The arguments in favor of their being thus subjected are obvious. The proper object of political superintendence is not the past but the future. Society cannot justly employ punishment against any individual, however atrocious may have been his misdemeanors, from any other than a prospective consideration, that is, a consideration of the danger with which his habits may be pregnant to the general safety. Past conduct cannot properly fall under the animate version of government, except so far as it is an indication of the future. But past conduct appears, at first sight, to afford a slighter presumption as to what the delinquent will do hereafter than declared intention. The man who professes his determination to commit murder seems to be scarcely a less dangerous member of society than he who, having already committed murder, has no apparent intention to repeat his offense. Yet all governments have agreed, either to pass over the menace in silence, or to subject the offender to a much less degree of punishment than they employ against him by whom the crime has been perpetrated. It may be right, perhaps, to yield them some attention when they thus agree in forbearance, though little is probably due to their agreement in inhumanity. This distinction, so far as it is founded in reason, has relation principally to the uncertainty of evidence. Before the intention of any man can be ascertained in a court of justice, from the consideration of the words he has employed, a variety of circumstances must be taken into the account. The witness heard the words which were employed. Does he repeat them accurately, or has not his want of memory caused him to substitute, in the room of some of them, words of his own? Before it is possible to decide upon the confident expectation I may entertain that these words will be followed with correspondent actions, it is necessary I should know the exact tone with which they were delivered and gesture with which they were accompanied. It is necessary I should be acquainted with the context and the occasion that produced them. Their construction will depend upon the quantity of momentary heat or rooted malice with which they were delivered, and words which appear at first sight of tremendous import will sometimes be found, upon accurate investigation, to have had a meaning purely ironical in the mind of the speaker. These considerations, together with the odious nature of punishment in general, and the extreme mischief that may attend our restraining the faculty of speech, in addition to the restraint we conceive ourselves obliged to put on men's actions, will probably be found to afford a sufficient reason why words ought seldom or never to be made a topic of political animadversion. End of section 41. Section 42 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dykstra, Farragut, Iowa. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and its influence on morals and happiness volume two by william godwin book seven chapter eight of law arguments by which it is recommended answer law is one endless particularly in a free state causes of this disadvantage two uncertain instance in questions of property, mode in which it must be studied. 3. Pretends to foretell future events. Laws are a species of promises. Check the freedom of opinion. 
are destructive of the principles of reason. Dishonesty of Lawyers An honest lawyer mischievous. Abolition of law vindicated on the score of wisdom. Of candor. From the nature of man. Future history of political justice. Errors that might arise in the commencement. Its gradual progress. Its effect on criminal law. On property. A further article of great importance in the trial of offenses is that of the method to be pursued by us in classing them, and the consequent apportioning the degree of animadversion to the cases that may arise. This article brings us to the direct consideration of law, which is, without doubt, one of the most important topics upon which human intellect can be employed. It is law that has hitherto been regarded in countries calling themselves civilized as the standard by which to measure all offenses and irregularities that fall under public animadversion. Let us fairly investigate the merits of this choice. The comparison which has presented itself to those by whom the topic has been investigated has hitherto been between law on one side and the arbitrary will of a despot on the other. But if we would estimate truly the merits of law, we should first consider it as it is in itself, and then, if necessary, search for the most eligible principle that may be substituted in its place. It has been recommended as affording information to the different members of the community respecting the principles which will be adopted in deciding upon their actions. It has been represented as the highest degree of iniquity to try men by an ex post facto law, or indeed in any other manner than by the letter of a law, formally made and sufficiently promulgated. How far it will be safe altogether to annihilate this principle, we shall presently have occasion to inquire. It is obvious, at first sight, to remark that it is of most importance in a country where the system of jurisprudence is most capricious and absurd. If it be deemed criminal in any society to wear clothes of a particular texture or buttons of a particular composition, it is unavoidable to exclaim that it is high time the jurisprudence of that society should inform its members what are the fantastic rules by which they mean to proceed. But, if a society be contented with the rules of justice, and do not assume to itself the right of distorting or adding to those rules, there law is evidently a less necessary institution. The rules of justice would be more clearly and effectually taught by an actual intercourse with human society, unrestrained by the fetters of prepossession, than they can be by catechisms and codes. Footnote. Book 6. Chapter 8. End of footnote. One result of the institution of law is that the institution, once begun, can never be brought to a close. Edict is heaped upon edict, and volume upon volume. This will be most the case where the government is most popular, and its proceedings have most in them of the nature of deliberation. Surely this is no slight indication that the principle is wrong, and that, of consequence, the further we proceed and the path marks out to us, the more we shall be bewildered. No task can be less hopeful than that of effecting a coalition between a right principle and a wrong. He that seriously and sincerely attempts it will perhaps expose himself to more palpable ridicule than he who, instead of professing two opposite systems, should adhere to the worst. There is no maxim more clear than this. Every case is a rule to itself. No action of any man was ever the same as any other action, had ever the same degree of utility or injury. It should seem to be the business of justice to distinguish the qualities of men, and not, which has hitherto been the practice, to confound them. But what has been the result of an attempt to do this in relation to law? As new cases occur, the law is perpetually found deficient. How should it be otherwise? 
Lawgivers have not the faculty of unlimited prescience and cannot define that which is boundless. The alternative that remains is either to wrest the law to include a case which was never in the contemplation of its authors, or to make a new law to provide for this particular case. Much has been done in the first of these modes. The quibbles of lawyers and the arts by which they refine and distort the sense of the law are proverbial, but though much is done, everything cannot be thus done. The abuse will sometimes be too palpable. Not to say that the very education that enables the lawyer, when he is employed for the prosecutor, to find out offenses the lawgiver never meant, enables him, when he is employed for the defendant, to discover subterfuges that reduce the law to a nullity. It is therefore perpetually necessary to make new laws. These laws, in order to escape evasion, are frequently tedious, minute, and circumlocutory. The volume in which justice records her prescriptions is forever increasing, and the world would not contain the books that might be written. The consequence of the infinitude of law is its uncertainty. This strikes at the principle upon which law is founded. Laws were made to put an end to ambiguity, and that each man might know what he had to expect. How well have they answered this purpose? Let us instance in the article of property. Two men go to law for a certain estate. They would not go to law if they had not both of them an opinion of their success. But we may suppose them partial in their own case. They would not continue to go to law if they were not both promised success by their lawyers. Law was made that a plain man might know what he had to expect, and yet the most skillful practitioners differ about the event of my suit. It will sometimes happen that the most celebrated pleader in the kingdom, or the first counsel in the service of the crown, shall assure me of infallible success five minutes before another law officer styled the keeper of the king's conscience by some unexpected juggle decides it against me. Would the issue have been equally uncertain if I had had nothing to trust to but the plain, unperverted sense of a jury of my neighbors founded in the ideas they entertained of general justice? Lawyers have absurdly maintained that the expensiveness of law is necessary to prevent the unbounded multiplication of suit. But the true source of this multiplication is uncertainty. Men do not quarrel about that which is evident, but that which is obscure. He that would study the laws of a country, accustomed to legal security, must begin with the volumes of the statutes. He must add a strict inquiry into the common or unwritten law, and he ought to digress into the civil, the ecclesiastical, and canon law. To understand the intention of the authors of a law, he must be acquainted with their characters and views, and with the various circumstances to which it owed its rise, and by which it was modified while under deliberation to understand the weight and interpretation that will be allowed to it in a court of justice, he must have studied the whole collection of records, decisions, and precedents. Law was originally devised that ordinary men might know what they had to expect, and there is not, at this day, a lawyer existing in Great Britain vainglorious enough to pretend that he has mastered the code. Nor must it be forgotten that time and industry even were they infinite, would not suffice. It is a labyrinth without end. It is a mass of contradictions that cannot be disentangled. Study will enable the lawyer to find in it plausible, perhaps unanswerable arguments for any side of almost any question. But it would argue the utmost folly to suppose that the study of law can lead to knowledge and certainty. A further consideration that will demonstrate the absurdity of law in its most general acceptation is that it is of the nature of prophecy. 
Its task is to describe what will be the actions of mankind and to dictate decisions respecting them. Its merits in this respect have already been decided under the head of promises. Footnote. Book 3, Chapter 3. End of footnote. The language of such a procedure is, we are so wise that we can draw no additional knowledge from circumstances as they occur, and we pledge ourselves that, if it be otherwise, the additional knowledge we acquire shall produce no effect upon our conduct. It is proper to observe that this subject of law may be considered, in some respects, as more properly belonging to the topic of the preceding book. Law tends, no less than creeds, catechisms, and tests, to fix the human mind in a stagnant condition, and to substitute a principle of permanence in the room of that unceasing progress which is the only salubrious element of mind. All the arguments, therefore, which were employed upon that occasion may be applied to the subject now under consideration. The fable of Procrustes presents us with a faint shadow of the perpetual effort of law. In defiance of the great principle of natural philosophy, that there are not so much as two atoms of matter of the same form through the whole universe, it endeavors to reduce the actions of men which are composed of a thousand effinescent elements, to one standard. We have already seen the tendency of this endeavor in the article of murder. Footnote. Chapter 4. End of footnote. It was in the contemplation of this system of jurisprudence that the strange maxim was invented, that strict justice would often prove the highest injustice. Footnote. Summum juice, summa injuria. End of footnote. There is no more real justice in endeavoring to reduce the actions of men into classes than there was in the scheme to which we have just alluded of reducing all men to the same stature. If, on the contrary, justice be a result flowing from the contemplation of all the circumstances of each individual case, if the only criterion of justice be general utility, the inevitable consequence is that the more we have of justice, the more we shall have of truth, virtue, and happiness. From all these considerations, we can scarcely hesitate to conclude universally that law is an institution of the most pernicious tendency. The subject will receive some additional elucidation if we consider the perniciousness of law in its immediate relation to those who practice it. If there ought to be no such thing as law, the profession of a lawyer is no doubt entitled to our disapprobation. A lawyer can scarcely fail to be a dishonest man. This is less a subject for censure than for regret. Men are, in an eminent degree, the creatures of the circumstances under which they are placed. He that is habitually goaded by the incentives of vice will not fail to be vicious. He that is perpetually conversant in quibbles, false colors, and sophistry cannot equally cultivate the generous emotions of the soul and the nice discernment of rectitude. If a single individual can be found who is but superficially tainted with a contagion, how many men, on the other hand, in whom there appeared a promise of the sublimest virtues, have by this trade been rendered indifferent to consistency or accessible to a bribe? Be it observed that these remarks apply principally to men eminent or successful in their profession. He that enters into an employment carelessly and by way of amusement is much less under its influence, though even he will not escape, than he that enters into it with ardor and devotion. Let us, however, suppose a circumstance which is perhaps altogether impossible, that a man shall be a perfectly honest lawyer. He is determined to plead no cause that he does not believe to be just, and to employ no argument that he does not apprehend to be solid. He designs, as far as his sphere extends, to strip law of its ambiguities, and to speak the manly language of reason. This man is, no doubt, highly respectable, so far as relates to himself. 
but it may be questioned whether he be not a more pernicious member of society than the dishonest lawyer. The hopes of mankind in relation to their future progress depend upon their observing the genuine effects of erroneous institutions. But this man is employed in softening and masking these effects. His conduct has a direct tendency to postpone the reign of sound policy and to render mankind tranquil in the midst of imperfection and ignorance. What is here stated, however, in favor of the dishonest lawyer, like that stated in favor of an imbecile monarch, footnote, book 5, chapter 7, end of footnote, should be considered as advanced in the way of conjecture only. As there is some pain which is requisite as the means of an overbalance of pleasure, so there may, in a few extraordinary instances, be some vice, understanding by vice, evil intention or rooted depravity, which is productive of the effects of virtue. In questions of this kind, however, it becomes us to be more than usually scrupulous and guarded. It is of the most pernicious consequence for us to confound the distinctions of virtue and vice. It can scarcely be considered as the part of a philanthropist to rejoice in the depravity of others. It is safer for us, in almost every imaginable instance, to regard every departure from enormous vice as so much gained to the cause of general happiness. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 11. End of footnote. The only principle which can be substituted in the room of law is that of reason exercising an uncontrolled jurisdiction upon the circumstances of the case. To this principle, no objection can arise on the score of wisdom. It is not to be supposed that there are not men now existing whose intellectual accomplishments rise to the level of law. Law we sometimes call the wisdom of our ancestors, but this is a strange imposition. It was as frequently the dictate of their passion, of timidity, jealousy, a monopolizing spirit, and a lust of power that knew no bounds. Are we not obliged perpetually to revise and remodel this misnamed wisdom of our ancestors, to correct it by a detection of their ignorance and a censure of their intolerance? But if men can be found among us whose wisdom is equal to the wisdom of law, it will scarcely be maintained that the truths they have to communicate will be the worse for having no authority but that which they derive from the reasons that support them. It may, however, be alleged that, if there be little difficulty in securing a current portion of wisdom, there may nevertheless be something to be feared from the passions of men. Law may be supposed to have been constructed in the tranquil serenity of the soul a suitable monitor to check the inflamed mind with which the recent memory of ills might induce us to proceed to the infliction of punishment. This is the most considerable argument that can be adduced in favor of the prevailing system, and therefore deserves a mature examination. The true answer to this objection is that nothing can be improved but in conformity to its nature. If we consult for the welfare of man, we must bear in mind the structure of man. It must be admitted that we are imperfect, ignorant, the slaves of appearances. These defects can be removed by no indirect method, but only by the introduction of knowledge. A specimen of the indirect method we have in the doctrine of spiritual infallibility. It was observed that men were liable to error, to dispute forever without coming to a decision, and to mistake in their most important interests. What was wanting was supposed to be a criterion and a judge of controversies. What was attempted was to endue truth with a visible form, and then repair to the oracle we had erected. The case respecting law is parallel to this. Men were aware of the deceitfulness of appearances and they sought a talisman to guard them from imposition. Suppose I were to determine, at the commencement of every day, upon a certain code of principles, 
to which I would conform the conduct of the day, and at the commencement of every year the conduct of the year. Suppose I were to determine that no circumstances should be allowed, by the light they afforded, to modify my conduct, lest I should become the dupe of appearance and the slave of passion. This is a just and accurate image of every system of permanence. Such systems are formed upon the idea of stopping the perpetual motion of the machine, lest it should sometimes fall into disorder. This consideration must sufficiently persuade an impartial mind that, whatever inconveniences may arise from the passions of men, the introduction of fixed laws cannot be the genuine remedy. Let us consider what would be the operation and progressive state of these passions, provided men were trusted to the guidance of their own discretion. Such is the discipline that a reasonable state of society employs with respect to man in his individual capacity. Footnote. Book 5. Chapter 20. Page 87. End of footnote. Why should it not be equally valid with respect to men acting in a collective capacity? Inexperience and zeal would prompt me to restrain my neighbor whenever he is acting wrong, and by penalties and inconveniences designedly interposed to cure him of his errors. But reason evinces the folly of this proceeding, and teaches me that, if he be not accustomed to depend upon the energies of intellect, he will never rise to the dignity of a rational being. As long as a man is held in the trammels of obedience, and habituated to look to some foreign guidance for the direction of his conduct, his understanding and the vigor of his mind will sleep. Do I desire to raise him to the energy of which he is capable? I must teach him to feel himself, to bow to no authority, to examine the principles he entertains, and render to his mind the reason of his conduct. The habits which are thus salutary to the individual will be equally salutary in the transactions of communities. Men are weak at present, because they have always been told they are weak, and must not be trusted with themselves. Take them out of their shackles, bid them inquire, reason, and judge, and you will soon find them very different beings. Tell them that they have passions, are occasionally hasty, intemperate, and injurious, but they must be trusted with themselves. Tell them that the mountains of parchment in which they have been hitherto entrenched are fit only to impose upon ages of superstition and ignorance, that henceforth we will have no dependence but upon their spontaneous justice, that, if their passions be gigantic, they must rise with gigantic energy to subdue them, that, if their decrees be iniquitous, the iniquity shall be all their own. The effect of this disposition of things will soon be visible. Mind will rise to the level of its situation. Juries and umpires will be penetrated with the magnitude of the trust reposed in them. It may be no uninstructive spectacle to survey the progressive establishment of justice in the state of things which is here recommended. At first it may be, a few decisions will be made uncommonly absurd or atrocious. But the authors of these decisions will be confounded with the unpopularity and disgrace in which they have involved themselves. In reality, whatever was the original source of law, it soon became cherished as a cloak for oppression. Its obscurity was of use to mislead the inquisitive eye of the sufferer. Its antiquity served to divert a considerable part of the odium from the perpetrator of the injustice to the author of the law, and still more to disarm that odium by the influence of superstitious awe. It was well known that unvarnished, barefaced oppression could not fail to be the victim of its own operations. To this statement, it may indeed be objected that bodies of men have often been found callous to censure, and that the disgrace, being amicably divided, is intolerable to none. In this observation there is considerable force, but it is inapplicable to the present argument. 
To this species of abuse, one of two things is indispensably necessary, either numbers or secrecy. To this abuse, therefore, it will be a sufficient remedy that each jurisdiction be considerably limited and all transactions conducted in an open and explicit manner. To proceed. The juridical decisions that were made immediately after the abolition of law would differ little from those during its empire. They would be the decisions of prejudice and habit, but habit, having lost the center about which it revolved, would diminish in the regularity of its operations. Those to whom the arbitration of any question was entrusted would frequently recollect that the whole case was committed to their deliberation, and they could not fail occasionally to examine themselves respecting the reason of those principles which had hitherto passed uncontroverted. Their understandings would grow enlarged in proportion as they felt the importance of their trust and the unbounded freedom of their investigation. Here, then, would commence an auspicious order of things, of which no understanding of man at present in existence can foretell the result, the dethronement of implicit faith and the inauguration of reason and justice. Some of the conclusions of which this state of things would be the harbinger have been already seen in the judgment that would be made of offenses against the community. Footnote, chapter 4, page 168. End of footnote. Offenses arguing a boundless variety in the depravity from which they sprung would no longer be confounded under some general name. Juries would grow as perspicacious in distinguishing, as they are now indiscriminate in confounding, the merit of actions and characters. The effects of the abolition of law, as it respects the article of property, would not be less auspicious. Nothing could be more worthy of regret than the manner in which property is at present administered, so far as relates to courts of justice. The doubtfulness of titles, the different measures of legislation as they relate to different classes of property, the tediousness of suits, and the removal of causes by appeal from court to court are a perpetual round of artifice and chicane to one part of the community, and of anguish and misery to another. Who can describe the baffled hopes, the fruitless years of expectation which thus consume away the strength and the lives of numerous individuals. In vain is the intention of a testator, while the disputes between the legal and the testamentary heir, or a mere quibble upon the phraseology of the bequest, shall supply food for endless controversy. In vain shall be all the assurances I can heap together for the establishment of my right, since the obscurity of records and the complexity of law will, almost in all cases, enable an ingenious man, who is at the same time a rich one, to dispute my tenure. The imbecility of law is strikingly illustrated by the vulgar maxim of the importance of possession. Possession could not be thus advantageous were it not for the opportunity that law affords for procrastination and evasion. Property could not be thus disputable were the persons who are called upon to decide concerning it left to the direction of their own understanding. The contention of opposing claims arises more from the jargon in which these claims are recorded than from the complexity of the subject to which they relate. The intention of a testator is much more easily settled than the quibbles to which the expression of that intention may be subjected. Those who were appointed for the decision of suits would not indeed be such gainers under the system here delineated as at present, but every other description of persons that were interested in questions of property would, no doubt, find their advantage. An observation which cannot have escaped the reader in the perusal of this chapter is that law is merely relative to the exercise of political force 
and must perish when the necessity for that force ceases, if the influence of truth do not still sooner extirpate it from the practice of mankind. End of section 42、section、43 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dykstra, Farragut, Iowa. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. Volume 2 by William Godwin. Book 7, Chapter 9 of Pardons. Their Absurdity. Their Origin. Their Abuses. Their Arbitrary Character. Destructive of Morality. There is one other topic which belongs to the subject of the present book, but which may be dismissed in a very few words, because, though it has unhappily been, in almost all cases, neglected in practice, it is a point that seems to admit of uncommonly simple and irresistible evidence. I mean the topic of pardons. The very word, to a reflecting mind, is fraught with absurdity. What is the rule that ought, in all cases, to direct my conduct? Surely justice, understanding by justice, the greatest utility of the whole mass of beings that may be influenced by my conduct. What, then, is clemency? It can be nothing but the pitiable egotism of him who imagines he can do something better than justice. Is it right that I should suffer a constraint for a certain offense? The reasonableness of my suffering must be founded in its consonance with the general welfare. He, therefore, that pardons me, iniquitously prefers the supposed interest of an individual, and utterly neglects what he owes to the whole. He bestows that which I ought not to receive, and which he has no right to give. Is it right, on the contrary, that I should not undergo the suffering in question? Will he, by rescuing me from suffering, confer a benefit on me and inflict no injury on others? He will then be a notorious delinquent if he allow me to suffer. There is, indeed, a considerable defect in this last supposition. If, while he benefits me, he inflicts no injury upon others, he is infallibly performing a public service. If I suffered in the arbitrary manner which the supposition includes, the public would sustain an unquestionable injury in the injustice that was perpetrated. And yet the man who prevents this odious injustice has been accustomed to arrogate to himself the attribute of clement and the apparently sublime, but in reality, tyrannical name of forgiveness. For, if he do no more than has been here described, instead of glory, he ought to take shame to himself as an enemy to humankind, if every action, and especially every action in which the happiness of a rational being is concerned, be susceptible of a certain rule, then caprice must be, in all cases, excluded. There can be no action which, if I neglect, I shall have discharged my duty, and, if I perform, I shall be entitled to applause. The pernicious effect of the system of pardons is peculiarly glaring, it was first invented as the miserable supplement to a sanguinary code, the atrociousness of which was so conspicuous that its ministers either dreaded the resistance of the people if it were indiscriminately executed, or themselves shrunk with unconquerable repugnance from the devastation it commanded. The system of pardons obviously associates with the system of law, for, though we may call every case, for instance, in which one man occasions the death of another by the name of murder, yet the injustice would be too great to apply to all cases the same treatment. Define murder as accurately as we please. The same consequence, the same disparity of cases, will obtrude itself. It is necessary, therefore, to have a court of reason to which the decisions of a court of law shall be brought for revisal. 
but how is this court, inexpressibly more important than the other, to be constituted? Here lies the essence of the matter. The rest is form. A jury is impaneled to tell you the generical name of the action. A judge presides to read out the volume of the law, the prescription annexed to that name. Last of all comes the court of inquiry, which is to decide whether the prescription of the dispensatory is suitable to the circumstances of this particular case. This authority we are accustomed to invest, in the first instance, with the judge, and in the last resort, with the king in council. Now, putting aside the propriety or impropriety of this particular selection, there is one grievous abuse which ought to strike the most superficial observer. These persons, with whom the principal trust is reposed, consider their functions in this respect as a matter purely incidental, exercise them with supineness, and, in many instances, with the most scanty materials to guide their judgment. This grows, in a considerable degree, out of the very name of pardon, by which we are accustomed to understand a work of supererogatory benevolence. From the manner in which pardons are dispensed inevitably flows the uncertainty of punishment. It is too evident that punishment is inflicted by no certain rules, and therefore creates no uniformity of expectation. Uniformity of treatment and constancy of expectation form the sole basis of a genuine morality. In a just form of society, this would never go beyond the sober expression of those sentiments of approbation or disapprobation with which different modes of conduct inevitably impress us. But if we at present exceed this line, it is surely an execrable refinement of injustice that should exhibit the perpetual menace of suffering unaccompanied with any certain rule foretelling its application. Not more than one-third of the offenders whom the law condemns to death in this metropolis are made to suffer the punishment that is awarded. Is it possible that each offender should not flatter himself that he shall be among the number that escapes? Such a system, to speak it truly, is a lottery of death in which each man draws his ticket for reprieve or execution as undefinable accidents shall decide. It may be asked whether the abolition of law would not produce equal uncertainty. By no means. The principles of king and council, in such cases, are very little understood, either by themselves or others. The principles of a jury of his neighbors, commissioned to pronounce upon the whole of the case, the criminal easily guesses. He has only to appeal to his own sentiments and experience. Reason is a thousand times more explicit and intelligible than law, and when we were accustomed to consult her, the uncertainty of her decisions would be such as men practiced in our present courts are totally unable to conceive. Another important consequence grows out of the system of pardons. A system of pardons is a system of unmitigated slavery. I am taught to expect a certain desirable event. From what? From the clemency, the uncontrolled, unmerited kindness of a fellow mortal. Can any lesson be more degrading? The pusillanimous servility of the man who devotes himself with everlasting obsequiousness to another, because that other having begun to be unjust, relents in his career. The ardor with which he confesses the equity of his sentence and the enormity of his deserts will constitute a tale that future ages will find it difficult to understand. What are the sentiments in this respect that are alone worthy of a rational being? Give me that, and that only, which, without injustice, you cannot refuse." More than justice, it would be disgraceful for me to ask, and for you to bestow. I stand upon the foundation of right. This is a title which brute force may refuse to acknowledge, but which all the force in the world cannot annihilate. By resisting this plea, you may prove yourself unjust, but in yielding to it, you grant me but my due. 
if all things considered i be the fit subject of a benefit the benefit is merited merit in any other sense is contradictory and absurd if you bestow upon me unmerited advantage you are a recreant from the general good i may be base enough to thank you but if i were virtuous i should condemn you these sentiments alone are consistent with true independence of mind he that is accustomed to regard virtue as an affair of favor and grace cannot be eminently virtuous if he occasionally perform an action of apparent kindness he will applaud the generosity of his sentiments and if he abstain he will acquit himself with the question may i not do what i will with my own in the same manner when he is treated benevolently by another he will in the first place be unwilling to examine strictly into the reasonableness of this treatment because benevolence as he imagines is not subject to any inflexibility of rule and in the second place he will not regard his benefactor with that erect and unembarrassed mien, that manly sense of equality which is the only unequivocal basis of virtue and happiness end of section forty three Section 44 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 8. Of Property. Chapter 1. Preliminary Observations Importance of this topic Plan for its discussion Definition Subject of the present chapter Of the next Principle of decision stated Rights of man Superfluities appreciated Love of distinction Direction which this passion is capable of receiving Of merit and reward System of popular morality on this subject Its defects the subject of property is the keystone that completes the fabric of political justice. According as our ideas respecting it are crude or correct, they will enlighten us as to the consequences of a simple form of society without government, and remove the prejudices that attach us to complexity. There is nothing that more powerfully tends to distort our judgment and opinions than erroneous notions concerning the goods of fortune. Finally, the period that must put an end to the system of coercion and punishment is intimately connected with the circumstance of properties being placed upon an equitable basis. Various abuses of the most incontrovertible nature have insinuated themselves into the administration of property. Each of these abuses might usefully be made the subject of a separate investigation. We might inquire into the vexations of this sort that are produced by the dreams of national greatness and the sumptuousness of public offices and magistrates this would lead us to a just estimate of the different kinds of taxation, landed or mercantile, having the necessaries or the luxuries of life for their subject of operation. We might examine into the abuses which have adhered to the commercial system, monopolies, charters, patents, protecting duties, prohibitions and bounties. We might consider the claims of the church, first fruits and tithes, all these disquisitions would tend to show the incalculable importance of this subject. But, excluding them all from the present inquiry, it shall be the business of what remains of this work to examine the subject in its most general principles, and by that means endeavor to discover the source, not only of the abuses above enumerated, but of others of innumerable kinds, too multifarious and subtle to enter into so brief a catalogue. The subject to which the doctrine of property relates is all those things which conduce, or may be conceived to conduce, to the benefit or pleasure of man, and which can no otherwise be applied to the use of one or more persons than by a permanent or temporary exclusion of the rest of the species. Such things in particular are food, clothing, habitation, and furniture. Upon this subject, two questions unavoidably arise. Who is the person entitled to the use of any particular article of this kind? Who is the person 
in whose hands the preservation and distribution of any number of these articles will be most justly and beneficially vested. The answer to the first of these questions is easy. Upon the principles of the present work, justice has been proved to be a rule applicable to all the concerns of man. It pronounces upon every case that can arise, and leaves nothing to the disposal of a momentary caprice. Footnote. Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 2. End footnote. There is not an article of the kinds above specified, which will not ultimately be the instrument of more benefit and happiness in one individual mode of application than in any other that can be devised. This is the application it ought to receive. We are led to the consideration of that species of rights, which was designedly postponed in an earlier division of this work. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 5, Page 80. End footnote. Every man has a right to that, the exclusive possession of which being awarded to him, a greater sum of benefit or pleasure will result than could have arisen from its being otherwise appropriated. This is the same principle as that just delivered, with a slight variation of form. If man have a right to anything, he has a right to justice. These terms, as they have ordinarily been used in moral inquiry, are, strictly and properly speaking, convertible terms. Let us see how this principle will operate in the inferences it authorizes us to make. Human beings are partakers of a common nature. What conduces to the benefit or pleasure of one man will conduce to the benefit or pleasure of another. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 3, Page 69. End footnote. Hence it follows, upon the principles of equal and impartial justice, that the good things of the world are a common stock, upon which one man has as valid a title to another to draw for what he wants. It appears in this respect, as formerly it appeared in the case of our claim to the forbearance of each other. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 5, 79. End footnote. That each man has a sphere, the limit and termination of which is marked out by the equal sphere of his neighbor. I have a right to the means of subsistence. He has an equal right. I have a right to every pleasure I can participate without injury to myself or others. His title, in this respect, is of similar extent. This view of the subject will appear the more striking if we pass and review the good things of the world. They may be divided into four classes. Subsistence, the means of intellectual and moral improvement, unexpensive gratifications, and such gratifications as are by no means essential to healthful and vigorous existence and cannot be purchased but with considerable labor and industry. It is the last class, principally, that interposes an obstacle in the way of equal distribution. It will be matter of after consideration how far and how many articles of this class would be admissible into the purest mode of social existence. Footnote, chapter 7, end footnote. But, in the meantime, it is unavoidable to remark the inferiority of this class to the three preceding. Without it, we may enjoy to a great extent activity, contentment, and cheerfulness. And in what manner are these seeming superfluities usually procured? By abridging multitudes of men, to a deplorable degree, in points of essential moment, that one man may be accommodated with sumptuous, yet strictly considered, insignificant luxuries. Supposing the alternative could fairly be brought home to a man, and it could depend upon his instant decision, by the sacrifice of these, to give to five hundred of his fellow beings leisure, independence, conscious dignity, and whatever can refine and enlarge the human understanding. It is difficult to conceive him to hesitate, but, though this alternative cannot be produced in the case of an individual, it will perhaps be found to be the true alternative, when taken at once in reference to the species. To the forming a just estimate of costly gratifications, it is necessary that we should abstract the direct pleasure on the one hand, from the pleasure they afford us, only as instruments for satisfying our love of distinction. It must be admitted in every system of morality, not tainted with monastic prejudices, but adapted to the nature of intelligent beings, that, so far as relates to ourselves, in leaving our connection with the species out of the consideration, we ought not to refuse any pleasure, except as it tends to the exclusion of some greater pleasure. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 4 Chapter 11, page 210, end footnote. But it has already been shown, 
that the difference in the pleasures of the palate between a simple and wholesome diet on the one hand and all the complexities of the most splendid table on the other is so small that few men would even think it worth the tedium that attends upon a change of services if the pleasure of the palate were the only thing in question and they had no spectator to admire their magnificence he who should form himself with the greatest care upon a system of solitary sensualism would probably come at last to a decision not very different from that which epicurus is said to have adopted in favor of fresh herbs and water from the spring footnote volume one book one chapter five page thirty three thirty four end footnote the same observation applies to the splendor of furniture equipage and dress so far as relates to the gratification of the eye this pleasure may be reaped with less trouble and in greater refinement from the beauties which nature exhibits to our observation no man if the direct pleasure were the only thing in consideration would think the difference to himself worth purchasing by the oppression of multitudes but these things though trivial in themselves are highly prized from that love of distinction which is characteristic of every human mind the creditable artisan or tradesman exerts a certain species of industry to supply his immediate wants but these are soon supplied the rest is exerted that he may wear a better coat that he may clothe his wife with gay attire that he may have not merely a shelter but a handsome habitation not merely bread and flesh to eat but that he may set it out with suitable decorum how many of these things would engage his attention if he lived in a desert island and had no spectator of his economy if we survey the appendages of our persons there is scarcely an article that is not in some respect an appeal to the goodwill of our neighbors or a refuge against their contempt it is for this that the merchant braves the perils of the ocean and the mechanical inventor brings forth the treasures of his meditation the soldier advances even to the cannon's mouth and the statesman exposes himself to the rage of an indignant people because he cannot bear to pass through life without distinction and esteem exclusively of certain higher motives which will hereafter be mentioned footnote chapter six end footnote this is the purpose of all the great exertions of mankind the man who has nothing to provide for but his animal wants scarcely ever shakes off the lethargy of his mind but the love of honor hurries us on to the most incredible achievements it must be admitted indeed that the love of distinction appears from experience in the past history of mankind to have been their ruling passion but the love of distinction is capable of different directions at present there is no more certain road to the general deference of mankind than the exhibition of wealth the poet the wit the orator the savior of his country and the ornament of his species may upon certain occasions be treated with neglect and biting contempt but the man who possesses and disburses money in profusion can scarcely fail to procure the attendance of the obsequious man and the flatterer but let us conceive this erroneous and pernicious estimate of things to be reversed let us suppose the avaricious man who is desirous of monopolizing the means of happiness and the luxurious man who expends without limitation in pampering his appetites that which in strict justice is the right of another to be contemplated with as much disapprobation as they are now beheld by a mistaken world with deference and respect let us imagine the direct and unambiguous road to public esteem to be the acquisition of talent or the practice of virtue the cultivation of some species of ingenuity or the display of some generous and expansive sentiment and that the persons who possess these talents were as conspicuously treated with affection and esteem as the wealthy are now treated with slavish attention this is merely in other words to suppose good sense and clear and correct perceptions at some time to gain the ascendancy in the world but it is plain that under the reign of such sentiments the allurements that now wait upon costly gratification would be for the most part annihilated if through the spurious and incidental recommendations it derives from the love of distinction it is now rendered to many a principal source of agreeable sensation under a different state of opinion it would not merely be reduced to its intrinsic value in point of sensation but in addition to this would be connected with ideas of injustice unpopularity and dislike 
so small is the space which costly gratifications are calculated unalterably to fill in the catalog of human happiness. It has sometimes been alleged, as an argument against the equal rights of men in the point of which we are treating, that the merits of men are different and ought to be differently rewarded. But it may be questioned whether this proposition, though true, can with any show of plausibility be applied to the present subject. Reasons have been already suggested to prove that positive institutions do not afford the best means for rewarding virtue, and that human excellence will be more effectually forwarded by those encouragements which inevitably arise from the system of the universe. Footnote, Book 5, Chapter 12, Book 6, Chapter 1, and Footnote. But, exclusively of this consideration, let us recollect, upon the grounds of what has just been stated, what sort of reward is thus proposed to exertion? If you show yourself deserving, you shall have the essence of a hundred times more food than you can eat, and a hundred times more clothes than you can wear. You shall have a patent for taking away from others the means of a happy and respectable existence, and for consuming them in riotous and unmeaning extravagance. Is this the reward that ought to be offered to virtue, or that virtue should stoop to take? The doctrine of the injustice of accumulated property has been the foundation of all religious morality. Its most energetic teachers have been irresistibly led to assert the precise truth in this respect. They have taught the rich that they hold their wealth only as a trust, that they are strictly accountable for every atom of their expenditure, that they are merely administrators, and by no means proprietors-in-chief. Footnote, Mark, chapter 10, verse 21. Acts chapter 2, verse 44, 45. See also Swift's sermon on mutual subjection. End footnote. But, while religion thus inculcated on mankind the pure principles of justice, the majority of its professors have been but too apt to treat the practice of justice not as a debt which it ought to be considered, but as an affair of spontaneous generosity and bounty. The effect which is produced by this accommodating doctrine is, to place the supply of our wants in the disposal of a few, enabling them to make a show of generosity with what is not truly their own, and to purchase the submission of the poor by the payment of a debt. Theirs is a system of clemency and charity, instead of a system of justice. It fills the rich with unreasonable pride, by the spurious denominations with which it decorates their acts, and the poor with servility by leading them to regard the slender comforts they obtain, not as their incontrovertible due, but as the good pleasure and grace of their opulent neighbors. End of section 44. Recording by Arden. Section 45 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Henry Rosales. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. Volume 2 by William Godwin. Book 8, Chapter 2. Principles of Property. Definition. Degree of Property. 1. And the Means of Subsistence and Happiness. 2. And the fruits of our labor. 3. And the labor of others. Unfavorable features of the species of property. Ground of obligation respecting it. Origin of property. Of inheritance and testation. Instances of gratuitous inequality. Legislation of titles. Limitation on the preceding reasoning. Sacredness of property. Conclusion. Having considered at large the question of the person entitled to the use of the means of benefit or pleasure, it is time that we proceed to the second question of the person, in whose hands the preservation and distribution of any of these means will be most justly and beneficially vested. An interval must inevitably occur between the production of any commodity and its consumption. Those things which are necessary for the accommodation of man in society cannot be obtained without the labor of man. When fit for his use, they do not admit of being left at random 
but require some care and vigilance should be exerted to preserve them for the period of actual consumption. They will not, in the first instance, fall into the possession of each individual in the precise proportion necessary for his consumption. Who then is to be the factor or warehouseman that is to watch over their preservation and preside at their distribution? This is strictly speaking the question of property. We do not call the person who accidentally takes his dinner at my table the proprietor of what he eats, though it is he, in the direct and obvious sense, who receives the benefit of it. Property implies some permanence of external possession and includes in it the idea of possible competitor. Of property there are three degrees. The first and simplest degree is that of my permanent right in those things, the use of which being attributed to me, a greater sum of benefit or pleasure will result than could have been arisen from their being otherwise appropriated. It is of no consequence in this case how I came into possession of them, the only necessary condition being their superior usefulness to me, and that my title to them is such as is generally acquiesced in by the community in which I live. Every man is unjust who conducts himself in such manner respecting these things as to infringe in any degree upon my power of using them at the time when the using of them will be of real importance to me. It has already appeared that one of the most essential of the rights of man is my right to the forbearance of others, not merely that they shall refrain from everything that may, by direct consequence, affect my life or the possession of my powers, but that they shall refrain from usurping upon my understanding and shall leave me a certain equal sphere for the exercise of my private judgment. This is necessary because it is possible for them to be wrong as well as for me to be so, because the exercise of the understanding is essential to the improvement of man, and because the pain and interruption I suffer are as real when they infringe in my conception only upon what is of importance to me as if the infringement had been in the utmost degree of palpable. Hence it follows that no man may, in ordinary cases, make use of my apartment, furniture, or garments, or of my food in the way of barter or loan, without having first obtained my consent. The second degree of property is the empire to which every man is entitled, over the produce of his own industry, even that part of it the use of which ought not to be appropriated to himself. It has been repeatedly shown that all the rights of man which are of this description are passive. He has no right of his option in the disposal of anything which may fall into his hands. Every shilling of his property, and even every the minutest exertion of his powers, have received their destination from the decrees of justice. He is only the steward but still he is a steward. These things must be trusted to his award, checked only by the censorial power that is vested in the general sense in favorable or unfavorable opinion of that portion of mankind among whom he resides. Man is changed from the capable subject of illimitable excellence into the vilest and most despicable thing that imagination can conceive when he is restrained from acting upon the dictates of his understanding. All man cannot individually be entitled to exercise compulsion on each other for this way would produce universal anarchy. All men cannot collectively be entitled to exercise unbounded compulsion, for this would produce universal slavery. The interference of governments, however impartially vested, is no doubt only to be restored to upon occasion of rare occurrence and indispensable urgency. It will be readily perceived that this second species of property is a less rigorous sense fundamental than the rest. It is, in one point of view, a sort of usurpation. It vests in me the preservation and dispensing of that which in point of complete and absolute right belongs to you. The third degree of property is that which occupies the most vigilant attention in the civilized states of Europe. It is a system in whatever manner established by which one man enters into the faculty of disposing of the produce of another man's industry. There is scarcely any species of wealth, expenditure, or splendor existing in any civilized country that is not in some way produced by the express manual labor and corporal industry of inhabitants of that country. The spontaneous production of the earth are few and contribute little to wealth, expenditure, or splendor. Every man may calculate in every glass of wine he drinks and every ornament he annexes to his person how many individuals have been commended to slavery and sweat, incessant drudgery, unwholesome food, continual hardship, deplorable ignorance, and brutal insensibility, that he may be supplied with these luxuries. It is a gross imposition that men are accustomed to put upon themselves when they talk of the property bequeathed to them by their ancestors. The property is produced by the daily labor of men who are now in existence. All that their ancestors 
Manchester's bequeath to them was a moldy patent which they show as a title to extort from their neighbors what the labor of those neighbors has produced. It is clear, therefore, that the third species of property is in direct contradiction to the second. The most desirable state of human society would require that the quantity of manual labor and corporal industry to be exerted, and particularly that part of which is not the uninfluenced choice of our own judgment, but is imposed upon each individual by the necessity of his affairs, should be reduced within as narrow limits as possible, for any man to enjoy the most trivial accommodation while at the same time a similar accommodation is not accessible to every other member of the community, is absolutely speaking wrong. All refinements of luxury, all inventions that tend to give enjoyment to a great number of laboring hands are directly adverse to the propagation of happiness. Every additional tax that is laid on, every new channel that is open for the expenditure of the public money, unless it be compensated, which is scarcely ever the case, by an equivalent deduction from the luxuries of the rich, is so much added to the general stock of ignorance, drudgery, and hardship. The country gentleman who, by leveling an eminence or introducing the sheet of water into the park, finds work for hundreds of industrious poor is the enemy and not as has commonly been imagined a friend of his species let us suppose that in any country there is now ten times as much industry and manual labor as there was three centuries ago except so far as this is applied to maintain an increased population it is expended in the more costly indulgences of the rich very little indeed is employed to increase the happiness or conveniences of the poor they barely subsist at present and they did as much at the remoter period of which we speak those who by fraud or force have usurped the power of buying and selling the labor of the great mass of the community are sufficiently disposed to take care that they should never do more than subsist an object of industry added to or taken from the general stock produces a momentary difference but things speedily fall back into their former state if every laboring inhabitant of great britain were able and willing today to double the quantity of his industry for a short time he would derive some advantage from the increased stock of commodities produced but the rich would speedily discover the means of monopolizing this produce as they had done the former a small part of it only could consist in commodities essential to the subsistence of man or to be fairly distributed through the community all that is luxury and superfluity would increase the accommodations of the rich and perhaps by reducing the price of luxuries augment the number of those whom such accommodations were accessible but it would afford no alleviation to the great mass of the community its more favored members would give their inferiors no greater wages for 20 hours labor suppose then they do for 10 what reason is there then this species of property should be respected because ill as the system is it will perhaps be found that it is better than any other which by any means except those of reason the love of distinction or the love of justice can be substituted in its place it is not easy to say whether misery or absurdity would be most conspicuous in a plan which should invite every man to seize upon everything he conceived himself to want if by positive institution the property of every man were equal to without a contemporary change in men's disposition and sentiment it would become unequal tomorrow the same evil would spring up with a rapid growth and we would have gained nothing by a project which while it violated every man's habits and many men's inclination would render thousands miserable we have shown and shall have occasion to show more at large how pernicious the consequence would be if government were to take the whole permanently into their hands and dispose to every man his daily bread it may even be suspect that agrarian laws and others of similar tendencies which have been invented for the purpose of keeping down the spirit of accumulation deserve to be regarded as remedies more pernicious than the disease they are intended to cure an interesting question suggests itself in this stage of discussion how far is the idea of property to be considered as the offspring of positive institution the decision of this question may prove extremely essential to the point upon which we are engaged the regulation of property by positive law may be a very exceptional means of reforming its present inequality at the same time that an equal objection may by no means lie against a proceeding the object of which shall be merely to supersede positive laws or such positive laws are peculiarly exceptionable in pursuing this inquiry it is necessary to institute a distinction between such positive laws or established practices which are often found little less efficacious than laws as are peculiar to certain ages and countries and such laws 
or practices as are common to civilized communities and may therefore be perhaps interwoven with the existence of society. The idea of property or permanent empire in those things which ought to be applied to our personal use and still more in the produce of our industry unavoidably suggests the idea of some species of law or practice by which it is guaranteed. Without this, property could not exist. Yet we have endeavored to show that the maintenance of these two kinds of property is highly beneficial. Let us consider the consequences that grow out of this position. Every man should be urged to the performance of his duty as much as possible by the instigation of reason alone. Compulsion to be exercised by one human being over another, whether individually or in the name of the community, if in any case to be resorted to, is at least to be resorted to only in cases of indispensable urgency. It is not, therefore, to be called in for the purpose of causing one individual to exert a little more or another a little less of productive industry. Neither is it to be called in for the purpose of causing the industrious individual to make the precise distribution of his produce which he ought to make. Hence it follows that, while the present erroneous opinions and prejudices respecting accumulation continue, actual accumulation will, in some degree, take place. For let it be observed that not only no well-informed community will interfere with the quantity of any man's industry or the disposal of its produce, but the members of every such well-informed community will exert themselves to turn aside the purpose of any man who shall be inclined to dictate to or restrain his neighbor in this respect. The most destructive of all excesses is that, where one man shall dictate to another or undertake to compel him to do or refrain from doing anything except as he was before stated in cases of the most indispensable urgency, otherwise than with his own consent. Hence it follows that the distribution of wealth in every community must be left to depend upon the sentiments of the individuals of that community. If in any society wealth be estimated at its true value, an accumulation and monopoly be regarded as a seals of mischief, injustice, and dishonor, instead of being treated as titles to attention and difference, in that society the accommodations of human life will tend to their level and the inequality of conditions will be destroyed. A revolution of opinions is the only means of attaining to this inestimable benefit. Every attempt to effect this purpose by means of regulation will probably be found ill-conceived and abortive. Be this as it will, every attempt to correct the distribution of wealth by individual violence is certainly to be regarded as hostile to the first principle of public security. If one individual, by means of greater ingenuity or more indefatigable industry, obtain a greater proportion of the necessaries of conveniences of life than his neighbor, and having obtained them determined to convert them into the means of permanent inequality, this proceeding is not of a sort that it would be just or wise to undertake to repress by means of coercion. If inequality Quality being thus introduced, the poorer member of the community shall be so depraved as to be willing, or so unfortunate circumstanced as to be driven, to make himself the hired servant or labored of his richer neighbor. This probably is not an evil to be corrected by the interposition of government. But, when we have gained this step, it will be difficult to set bounds to the extent of accumulation in one man, or of poverty and wretchedness in another. It has already appeared that reason requires that no man shall endeavor by individual violence to correct this inequality. Reason would probably, in a well-ordered community, be sufficient to restrain men from the attempt so to correct it. Where society exists in the simplicity which has formerly been described, accumulation itself would be restrained by the very means that restrain depredation, the good sense of the community, and the inspection of all exercised upon all. Violence, therefore, would on one hand have little to tempt it as on the other hand it would be incessantly and irresistibly repressed but if reason proved insufficient for the fundamental purpose other means must doubtless be employed it is better that one man should suffer than that the community should be destroyed general security is one of those indispensable preliminaries without which nothing good or excellent can be accomplished it is therefore right that property with all its inequalities such as it is sanctioned by the general sense of the members of any state and so long as that sanction continues unvaried should be defended if need be by means of coercion. We have already endeavored to show that coercion would probably in no case be necessary, but for the injudicious magnitude and complication of political societies. In a general and absolute sense, therefore, it cannot be vindicated. But there are duties incumbent upon us of a temporary and local nature, and we may occasionally be required, by the pressure of circumstance, to suspend and contravene principles, the most sound in their general nature, till men shall be persuaded to part with the idea of a complicated government and an extensive territory. 
coercion will be necessary as an expedient to counteract the most imminent evils. There are, however, various reasons that would incline a just man to confine the province of coercion within the severest limits. It is never to be regarded but as a temporary expedient, the necessity of having recourse to which is deeply to be regretted. It is an expedient protecting one injustice, the accumulation of property, for the sake of keeping out another evil, still more formidable and destructive. Lastly, it is to be considered that this injustice, the unequal distribution of property, the grasping and selfish spirit of individuals, is to be regarded as one of the original sources of government, and as it rises in its excess, is continually demanding and necessitating new injustice, new penalties, and new slavery. Thus far, then, it should seem the system of coercion must be permitted to extend. We should set bounds to no man's accumulation. We should repress by wise and effectual, yet moderate and humane, penalties all forcible invasions to be committed by one man upon the acquisition of another. But it may be asked, are there no various laws or practices established among civilized nations which do not, like these we have described, stopped at the toleration of unequal property, but which operate to its immediate encouragement and to the rendering this inequality still wider and more oppressive? What are we to conceive in this respect of the protection given in inheritance and testamentary bequest? There is no merit in being born the son of a rich man, rather than a poor one. That should justify us in raising this man to affluence and condemning that to invincible depression. Surely we might be apt to exclaim, it is enough to maintain men in their usurpation, for let it never be forgotten that accumulated property is usurpation. During the term of their lives, it is the most extravagant fiction which would enlarge the empire of the proprietor beyond his natural existence and enable him to dispose of events when he is himself no longer in the world. The arguments, however, that may be offered in favor of the protection given to inheritance and testamentary bequest are more forcible than might at first be imagined. We have attempted to show that men ought to be protected in the disposal of the property they have personally acquired in expanding it and the necessaries they require or the luxuries in which they think proper to indulge in transferring it in such proportions as justice shall dictate or their erroneous judgment suggests to attempt therefore to take the disposal out of their hands at the period of their decease would be an abortive and pernicious project if we prevented them from bestowing it in the open and explicit mode of bequest we could not prevent them from transferring it before the close of their lives and we should open a door to vexation and perpetual litigation most persons would be inclined to bestow their property after the period of their lives upon their children or nearest relative, where therefore they have failed to express their sentiments in this respect, it is reasonable to presume what they would have been, and this disposal of the property on the part of the community is the mildest and therefore the most justifiable interference. Where they have expressed a capricious partiality, this inequity also is, in most cases, to be protected, because, for the reasons above assigned, it cannot be prevented without exposing us to still greater inequities. But though it may possibly be true that inheritance and the privilege of testation are necessary consequences of the system of property, in the community the members of which are involved in prejudice and ignorance, it will not be difficult to find the instances in every polished country of Europe in which civil institutions, instead of granting to the inequalities of accumulation, only what could not prudently be withheld has exerted itself for the express purpose of rendering this inequalities greater and more oppressive. Such instances are the feudal system and the system of ranks, seigneurial duties, fines, conveyances, and tells, the distinctions in landed property of freehold, copyhold and manor, the establishment of vesselage, and the claim of primogeniture. We here distinctly recognize the policy of men who, having first gained a superiority by means of the inevitable openings before cited, have made use of this superiority for the purpose of conspiring to monopolize whatever their rapacity could seize, in direct opposition to every dictate of the general interest. These articles fall under the distinction brought forward in the outset of laws of practices not common to all civilized communities, but peculiar to certain ages and countries. It should seem, therefore, that these these are institutions, the abolition of which is not to be entirely trusted to the silent hostility of opinion, but they are to be abrogated by the express and positive decision of the community. For their abrogation, it is not necessary that any law or regulation should be promulgated in an operation which, say, 
the least, should always be regarded with extreme jealousy. Property under every form it can assume is upheld by the direct interference of institution, and that species which we at present contemplate must inevitably perish. The moment the protection of the state is withdrawn, of the introduction of new regulations of whatever description, it becomes the friend of man to be jealous. But we may allow ourselves to regard with a more friendly eye a proceeding which consists merely in their abolition. The conclusion, however, in this instance must not be pushed further than the premise will justify. The article enumerated will perhaps all of them be found to tally with the condition annexed. They depend for their existence upon the positive protection of the state, but there are particulars which have grown up under their countenance that are of a different sort. Such, for instance, are titles, armorial bearings, and liveries. If the community refuse to countenance feudal and seignorial claims and the other substantial privileges of an aristocracy, they must inevitably cease. But the case is different in the instances last cited. It is one thing to abolish a law, or refuse to persist in a practice that is made the engine of tyranny, and a thing of totally different sort by a positive law to prohibit action, however irrational, by which no man's security is directly invaded. It should seem unjustifiable to endeavor, by penalties to deter a man from calling himself by any name, or retiring himself, or others, with their own consent, in any manner he thinks proper. Not that these things are, as they have sometimes been represented, in their own nature trivial. We have endeavored to prove the reverse of this. They ought to be assailed with every weapon of argument and ridicule. In an enlightened community, the man who assumes to himself a pompous appellation will be considered as a fool or a madman. But fulmination and penalties are not the proper instruments to repress an ecstasy of this sort. There is another circumstance necessary to be stated, by way of qualification to the preceding conclusion. Evils often exist in a community which, though mere excrescences at first, at length become so incorporated with the principle of social existence that they cannot suddenly be separated without the risk of involving the most dreadful calamities. Feudal rights and the privileges of rank are, in themselves considered, entitled to no quarter. The inequalities of property perhaps constituted a state through which it was at least necessary for us to pass, and which constituted the true original excitement to the unfolding the powers of the human mind. But it would be difficult to show that feudality and aristocracy ever produced an overbalance of good. Yet were they to be suddenly and instantly abolished, two evils would necessarily follow. First, the abrupt reduction of thousands to a condition, the reverse of that to which they had hitherto been accustomed, a condition perhaps the most auspicious to human talent and felicity, but for which habits had wholly unfitted them, and which would be to them a continual source of dejection and suffering. It may be doubted whether the genuine cause of reform ever demands that, in its name, we should sentence whole classes of men to wretchedness. Secondly, an attempt abruptly to abolish practices which had originally no apology to plead for their introduction would be attended with as dreadful convulsion and as melancholy a series of public calamities as an attack upon the first principles of society itself. All the reasonings, therefore, which were formerly adduced under the head of revolution are applicable to the present case. Having now accomplished what was last proposed, and endeavored to ascertain in what particulars the present system of property is to be considered as a capricious offspring of positive institution, let us return to the point which led us to that inquiry. The question concerning the degree of respect to which property in general is entitled. And here it is only necessary that we should recollect the principle in which the doctrine of property is founded the sacred and indefeasible right of private judgment there are but two objects for which government can rationally be conceived to have first as a treasury of public wisdom by which individuals might in all cases with advantage be directed and which might actively lead with greater certainty in the path of happiness or secondly, instead of being forward to act itself as an umpire, that the community might fill the humbler office of guardian of the rights of private judgment and never interpose, but when one man appeared in this respect alarmingly to encroach upon another, all the arguments of this work have tended to show that the latter, and not the former, is the true end of civil institution. The first idea of property, then, is deduced from the right of private judgment. The first object of government is a preservation of this right, without permitting to every man, to considerable degree, the exercise of his own discretion. There can be no independence, no improvement, no virtue, and no happiness. This is a privilege in the highest degree sacred. 
for its maintenance no exertion and sacrifices can be too great thus deep is the foundation of the doctrine of property it is in the last resort the palladium of all that ought to be dear to us and must never be approached but with awe and veneration he that seeks to loosen the hold of this principle upon our minds and that would lead us to sanction any exceptions to it without the most deliberate and impartial consideration however right may be his intention is in that instance an enemy to the whole a condition indispensably necessary to every species of excellence is security unless i can foresee in a considerable degree the treatment i shall receive from my species and am able to predict to a certain extent what will be the limits of their irregularity and caprice i can engage in no valuable undertaking civil society maintains a greater proportion of security among men that can be found in the savage state this is one of the reasons why under the shade of civil society arts have been invented sciences perfected and the nature of man in his individual and relative capacity gradually developed one observation is it seems proper to add to the present chapter we have maintained the equal rights of men that each man has a perfect claim upon everything the possession of which will be productive of more benefit to him than injury to another has he then it will be asked a right to take it if not what sort of right is that which the person in whom it vests is not entitled to enforce the difficulty here is in the appearance and not in reality the feature specified in the present instance adheres to every department of right it is right that my action should be governed by the dictates of my own judgment and every man is an intruder who endeavors to compel me to act by his judgment instead of my own but it does not follow that i shall always do wisely or well in undertaking to repel his intrusion by force persuasion and not force is a legitimate instrument for influencing the human mind and i shall never be justifiable in having recourse to the latter while there is any rational hope of succeeding by the former add to which the criterion of morals is utility when it has once been determined that my being constituted the possessor of a certain article will be beneficial it does not follow that my attempting or even succeeding violently to put myself in possession of it will be attended with a beneficial result if i were quietly installed it may be unquestionable that that would be an absolute benefit and yet it may be true that my endeavors to put myself in possessions whether effectual or ineffectual will be attended with worse consequences than all the good that would follow from the right being done as to the object itself the doctrine of rights has no rational or legitimate connection with the practice of tumult but though i may not consistently with rectitude attempt to put myself in possessions of many things which it is right i should have yet this sort of right is by no means futile and nugatory it may prove to be a great truth resting upon irresistible evidence and may in that case be expected to make hourly progress in the convictions of mankind if it be true it is an interesting truth and may therefore be expected to germinate in the mind and produce corresponding effects upon the conduct it may appear to be truth of the nature which is accustomed to sink deep in the human understanding insensible to mix itself with all our reasonings and ultimately to produce without shadow of violence the most complete revolution in the maxims of civil society end of section 45 recording by henry rosales Section 46 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dykstra, Farragut, Iowa. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 8, Chapter 3. Benefits Attendant on a System of Equality. Contrasted with the mischiefs of the present system. 1. A Sense of Dependence. 2. The Perpetual Spectacle of Injustice, Leading Men Astray in Their Desires and perverting the integrity of their judgments. The rich are the true pensioners. 3. The discouragement of intellectual attainments. 4. The multiplication of vice, generating the crimes of the poor. 
the passions of the rich, and the misfortunes of war. 5. Depopulation Having seen the justice of an equal distribution of the good things of life, let us next proceed to consider in detail the benefits with which it would be attended. And here, with grief, it must be confessed that however great and extensive are the evils that are produced by monarchies and courts, footnote, book five, end of footnote, by the imposture of priests, footnote, book six, end of footnote, and the iniquity of criminal laws, footnote, book seven, end of footnote, all these are imbecile and impotent compared with the evils that arise out of the established administration of property. Its first effect is that we have already mentioned. Footnote. Chapter 1, page 206. End of footnote. A sense of dependence. It is true that courts are mean-spirited, intriguing, and servile, and that this disposition is transferred by contagion from them to all ranks of society but accumulation brings home a servile and truckling spirit by no circuitous method to every house in the nation. Observe the pauper fawning with abject vileness upon his rich benefactor, speechless with sensations of gratitude for having received that which he ought to have claimed, not indeed with arrogance or a dictatorial and overbearing temper, but with the spirit of a man discussing with a man and resting his cause only on the justice of his claim. Observe the servants that follow in a rich man's train, watchful of his looks, anticipating his commands, not daring to reply to his insolence, all their time and their efforts under the direction of his caprice. Observe the tradesman, how he studies the passions of his customers, not to correct, but to pamper them the vileness of his flattery, and the systematical constancy with which he exaggerates the merit of his commodities. Observe the practices of a popular election, where the great mass are purchased by obsequiousness, by intemperance and bribery, or driven by unmanly threats of poverty and persecution. Indeed, the age of chivalry is not gone. Footnote. Burke's Reflections. End of footnote. The feudal spirit still survives that reduced the great mass of mankind to the rank of slaves and cattle for the service of a few. We have heard much of visionary and theoretical improvements. It would indeed be visionary to expect integrity from mankind while they are thus subjected to hourly corruption and bred from father to son to sell their independence and their conscience for the vile rewards that oppression has to bestow. No man can be either useful to others or happy in himself who is a stranger to the grace of firmness, or who is not habituated to prefer the dictates of his own understanding to the tyranny of command and the allurements of temptation. Here again, as upon a former occasion, footnote, Chapter 1, page 206, end of footnote. Religion comes in to illustrate our thesis. Religion was the generous abolition of men who let their imagination loose on the grandest subjects and wandered without restraint in the unbounded field of inquiry. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, if they brought home imperfect ideas of the sublimest views that intellect can furnish. In this instance, religion teaches that the pure perfection of man is to arm himself against the power of sublunary enticements and sublunary terrors, that he must suffer no artificial wants, sensuality, or fear to come in competition with the dictates of rectitude and reflection. But to expect a constancy of this sort from the human species under the present system is an extravagant speculation. The inquirer after truth and the benefactor of mankind will be desirous of removing from them those external impressions by which their evil propensities are cherished. The true object that should be kept in view is to extirpate all ideas of condescension and superiority, 
to oblige every man to feel that the kindness he exerts is what he is bound to perform, and to examine whether the assistance he asks be what he has a right to claim. A second evil that arises out of the established administration of property is the continual spectacle of injustice it exhibits. The effect of this consists partly in the creation of wrong propensities, and partly in a hostility to right ones. There is nothing more pernicious to the human mind than the love of opulence, essentially active when the original cravings of appetite have been satisfied, we necessarily fix on some object of pursuit, benevolent or personal, and in the latter case, on the attainment of some excellence or something which shall command the esteem and deference of others. Few propensities, absolutely considered, can be more valuable than this. But the established administration of property directs it into the channel of the acquisition of wealth. The ostentation of the rich perpetually goads the spectator to the desire of opulence. Wealth, by the sentiments of servility and dependence it produces, makes the rich man stand forward as the principal object of general esteem and deference. In vain are sobriety, integrity, and industry. In vain the sublimest powers of mind and the most ardent benevolence if their possessor be narrow in his circumstances. To acquire wealth and to display it is therefore the universal passion. The whole structure of human society is made a system of the narrowest selfishness. If the state of society were such that self-love and benevolence were apparently reconciled as to their object, a man might then set out with the desire of eminence, and yet become every day more generous and philanthropical in his views. But the passion we are here describing is accustomed to be gratified at every step by inhumanly trampling upon the interest of others. Wealth is acquired by overreaching our neighbor, and is spent in insulting him. The spectacle of injustice which the established administration of property exhibits operates also in the way of hostility to right propensities. If you would cherish in any man the love of rectitude, you must see that its principles be impressed on him, not only by words but actions. It happens, perhaps, during the period of education that maxims of integrity and consistency are repeatedly enforced, and the preceptor gives no quarter to the base suggestions of selfishness and cunning. But how is the lesson that has been read to the pupil confounded and reversed when he enters upon the scene of the world? If he ask, Why is this man honored? The ready answer is, Because he is rich. If he inquire further, why is he rich? The answer, in most cases, is from the accident of birth, or from a minute and sordid attention to the cares of gain. Humanity weeps over the distresses of the peasantry in all civilized nations, and when she turns from this spectacle to behold the luxury of their lords, gross, imperious, and prodigal, her sensations certainly are not less acute. This spectacle is the school in which mankind have been educated. They have been accustomed to the sight of injustice, oppression, and iniquity, till their feelings are made callous and their understandings incapable of apprehending the principles of virtue. In beginning to point out the evils of accumulated property, we compared the extent of those evils with the correspondent evils of monarchies and courts. Footnote page 212, and a footnote. No circumstances under the latter have excited a more pointed disapprobation than pensions and pecuniary corruption, by means of which hundreds of individuals are rewarded, not for serving, but betraying the public, and the hard earnings of industry are employed to fatten the servile adherence of despotism. But the rent roll of the lands of England is a much more formidable pension list than that which is supposed to be employed in the purchase of ministerial majorities. 
all riches, and especially hereditary riches, are to be considered as the salary of a sinecure office, where the laborer and the manufacturer perform the duties, and the principal spends the income in luxury and idleness. Footnote. This idea is to be found in an essay on the right of property in land, published about 12 years ago by an ingenious inhabitant of North Britain. Part 1, Section 3, Paragraph 38 and 39. The reasonings of this author have sometimes considerable merit, though he has by no means gone to the source of the evil. End of footnote. Hereditary wealth is, in reality, a premium paid to idleness, an immense annuity expended to retain mankind in brutality and ignorance. The poor are kept in ignorance by the want of leisure. The rich are furnished indeed with the means of cultivation and literature, but they are paid for being dissipated and indolent. The most powerful means that malignity could have invented are employed to prevent them from improving their talents and becoming useful to the public. This leads us to observe, thirdly, that the established administration of property is the true leveling system with respect to the human species, by as much as the cultivation of intellect is more valuable and more characteristic of man than the gratifications of vanity or appetite. Accumulated property treads the powers of thought in the dust, extinguishes the sparks of genius, and reduces the great mass of mankind to be immersed in sordid cares. Besides depriving the rich, as we have already said, of the most salubrious and effectual motives to activity, if superfluity were banished, the necessity for the greater part of the manual industry of mankind would be superseded, and the rest being amicably shared among the active and vigorous members of the community, would be burdensome to none. Every man would have a frugal yet wholesome diet. Every man would go forth to that moderate exercise of his corporeal functions that would give hilarity to the spirits. None would be made torpid with fatigue, but all would have leisure to cultivate the kindly and philanthropical affections, and to let loose his faculties in the search of intellectual improvement. It might be amusing to some readers to recollect the authorities, if the citation of authorities were a proper mode of reasoning, by which the system of accumulated property is openly attacked. The best known is Plato in his treatise of A Republic. His steps have been followed by Sir Thomas More in his Utopia. Specimens of very powerful reasoning on the same side may be found in Gulliver's Travels, particularly Part 4, Chapter 6. Mabley, in his book De la Legislation, has displayed at large the advantages of equality, and then quits the subject in despair from an opinion of the incorrigibleness of human depravity. Wallace, the contemporary and antagonist of Hume, in a treatise entitled Various Prospects of Mankind, Nature, and Providence, is copious in his eulogium of the same system, and deserts it only from fear of the earth becoming too populous. See below, chapter 9. The great practical authorities are Crete, Sparta, Peru, and Paraguay. We should swell the list to an inconvenient size if we added examples where an approach only to these principles was attempted, and authors who have incidentally confirmed a doctrine so interesting and clear as never to have been wholly eradicated from any human understanding. It would be trifling to object that the systems of Plato and others are full of imperfections. This rather strengthens their authority, since the evidence of the truth they maintained was so great as still to preserve its hold on their understandings, though they knew not how to remove the difficulties that attended it. What a contrast does this scene present to the present state of society, where the peasant and the laborer work till their understandings are benumbed with toil, their sinews contracted and made callous by being forever on the stretch, 
and their bodies invaded with infirmities and surrendered to an untimely grave. What is the fruit they obtain from this disproportion and unceasing toil? In the evening they return to a family famished with hunger, exposed half-naked to the inclemencies of the sky, hardly sheltered, and denied the slenderest instruction, unless in a few instances where it is dispensed by the hands of ostentatious charity, and the first lesson communicated is unprincipled servility. All this while their rich neighbor, but we visited him before. Footnote. Page 220. End of footnote. How rapid would be the advances of intellect if all men were admitted into the field of knowledge. At present, 99 persons in a 100 are no more excited to any regular exertions of general and curious thought than the brutes themselves. What would be the state of public mind in a nation where all were wise, all had laid aside the shackles of prejudice and implicit faith, all adopted with fearless confidence the suggestions of reason, and the lethargy of the soul was dismissed forever. It is to be presumed that the inequality of mind would, in a certain degree, be permanent, but it is reasonable to believe that the geniuses of such an age would greatly surpass the utmost exertions of intellect hitherto known. Genius would not be depressed with false wants and niggardly patronage. It would not exert itself with the sense of neglect and oppression rankling in its bosom. It would be delivered from those apprehensions that perpetually recall us to the thought of personal emolument, and of consequence would expatiate freely among sentiments of generosity and public good. From ideas of intellectual, let us turn to moral improvement. And here it is obvious that the great occasions of crime would be cut off forever. Footnote. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 3. End of footnote. The fruitful source of crimes consists in this circumstance. One man's possessing in abundance that of which another man is destitute. We must change the nature of mind before we can prevent it from being powerfully influenced by this circumstance, when brought strongly home to its perceptions by the nature of its situation. Man must cease to have senses. The pleasures of appetite and vanity must cease to gratify before he can look on tamely at the monopoly of these pleasures. He must cease to have a sense of justice before he can clearly and fully approve this mixed scene of superfluity and want. It is true that the proper method of curing this inequality is by reason and not by violence, but the immediate tendency of the established administration is to persuade men that reason is impotent. The injustice of which they complain is upheld by force and they are too easily induced by force to attempt its correction. All they endeavor is the partial correction of an injustice which education tells them is necessary, but more powerful reason affirms to be tyrannical. Force grew out of monopoly. It might accidentally have occurred among savages whose appetites exceeded their supply, or whose passions were inflamed by the presence of the object of their desire, but it would gradually have died away as reason and civilization advanced. Accumulated property has fixed its empire, and henceforth all is an open contention of the strength and cunning of one party against the strength and cunning of the other. In this case, the violent and premature struggles of the necessitous are undoubtedly an evil. They tend to defeat the very cause in the success of which they are most deeply interested. They tend to procrastinate the triumph of justice. But the true crime, in every instance, is in the selfish and partial propensities of men, thinking only of themselves, and despising the emolument of others. And of these, the rich have their share. The spirit of oppression, the spirit of servility, and the spirit of fraud, these are the immediate growth of the established administration of property. They are alike hostile to intellectual and moral improvement. 
The other vices of envy, malice, and revenge are their inseparable companions. In a state of society where men lived in the midst of plenty, and where all shared alike the bounties of nature, these sentiments would inevitably expire. The narrow principle of selfishness would vanish, no man being obliged to guard his little store or provide with anxiety and pain for his restless wants, each would lose his individual existence in the thought of the general good. No man would be an enemy to his neighbor, for they would have no subject of contention, and of consequence philanthropy would resume the empire which reason assigns her. Mind would be delivered from her perpetual anxiety about corporeal support, and free to expatiate in the field of thought which is congenial to her. Each would assist the inquiries of all. Let us fix our attention for a moment upon the alteration of principles and habits that immediately grows out of an unequal distribution of property. Till it was thus distributed, men felt what their wants required, and sought the supply of those wants. All that was more than this was regarded as indifferent. But no sooner is accumulation introduced than they begin to study a variety of methods for disposing of their superfluity with least emolument to their neighbor, or, in other words, by which it shall appear to be most their own. They do not long continue to buy commodities before they begin to buy men. He that possesses, or is the spectator of superfluity, soon discovers the hold which it affords him on the minds of others. Hence the passions of vanity and ostentation. Hence the despotic manners of such as recollect with complacence the rank they occupy, and the restless ambition of those whose attention is engrossed by the possible future. Ambition is, of all the passions of the human mind, the most extensive in its ravages. It adds district to district and kingdom to kingdom. It spreads bloodshed and calamity and conquest over the face of the earth. But the passion itself, as well as the means of gratifying it, is the produce of the prevailing administration of property. Footnote, Book 5, Chapter 16. End of footnote. It is only by means of accumulation that one man obtains an unresisted sway over multitudes of others. It is by means of a certain distribution of income that the present governments of the world are retained in existence. Nothing more easy than to plunge nations so organized into war. But if Europe were at present covered with inhabitants, all of them possessing confidence, and none of them superfluity, what could induce its different countries to engage in hostility? If you would lead men to war, you must exhibit certain allurements. If you be not enabled by a system already prevailing, and which derives force from prescription, to hire them to your purposes, you must bring over each individual by dint of persuasion. How hopeless a task by such means to excite mankind to murder each other! It is clear, then, that war, in all its aggravations, is the growth of unequal property, as long as this source of jealousy and corruption shall remain, it is visionary to talk of universal peace. As soon as the source shall be dried up, it will be impossible to exclude the consequence. It is accumulation that forms men into one common mass and makes them fit to be played upon like a brute machine. Were this stumbling block removed, each man would be united to his neighbor in love and mutual kindness a thousand times more than now. But each man would think and judge for himself. Let then the advocates for the prevailing administration at least consider what it is for which they plead, and be well assured that they have arguments in its favor which will weigh against these disadvantages. There is one other circumstance which, though inferior to those above enumerated, deserves to be mentioned. This is population. 
It has been calculated that the average cultivation of Europe might be so improved as to maintain five times her present number of inhabitants. Footnote. Essay on Property, Part 1, Section 3, Paragraph 35. End of footnote. There is a principle in human society by which population is perpetually kept down to the level of the means of subsistence. Thus, among the wandering tribes of America and Asia, we never find, through the lapse of ages, that population has so increased as to render necessary the cultivation of the earth. Thus, among the civilized nations of Europe, by means of territorial monopoly, the sources of subsistence are kept within a certain limit, and, if the population became overstocked, the lower ranks of the inhabitants would be still more incapable of procuring for themselves the necessaries of life. There are, no doubt, extraordinary concurrences of circumstances by means of which changes are occasionally introduced in this respect. But, in ordinary cases, the standard of population is held in a manner stationary for centuries. Thus, the established administration of property may be considered as strangling a considerable portion of our children in their cradle. Whatever may be the value of the life of man, or rather, whatever would be his capability of happiness in a free and equal state of society, the system we are here opposing may be considered as arresting upon the threshold of existence, four-fifths of that value and that happiness. End of section 46. Section 47 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 7, Chapter 4. Objection to this system from the frailty of the human mind. Recapitulation. Objection stated. General answer to this objection. Particular answer. Influence of public opinion upon the conduct of individuals. Having proceeded thus far in our investigation, it may be proper to recapitulate the principles already established. The discussion under each of its branches, as it relates to the equality of men, footnote, chapter 1, 3, 30, volume 2, end footnote, and the inequalities of property, footnote, chapter 2, end footnote, may be considered as a discussion either of right or duty, and, in that respect, runs parallel to the two great heads of which we treated in our original development of the principles of society. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 4, 5. End footnote. I have a right to the assistance of my neighbor. He has a right that it should not be extorted from him by force. It is his duty to afford me the supply of which I stand in need. It is my duty not to violate his province in determining, first, whether he is to supply me, and, secondly, in what degree. Equality of conditions, or, in other words, an equal admission to the means of improvement and pleasure, is a law rigorously enjoined upon mankind by the voice of justice. All other changes in society are good, only as they are fragments of this, or steps to its attainment. All other existing abuses are to be deprecated only as they serve to increase and perpetuate the inequality of conditions. We have, however, arrived at another truth not less evident than this. Equality of conditions cannot be produced by individual compulsion, and ought not to be produced by compulsion in the name of the whole. There remains, therefore, but one mode of arriving at this great end of justice, and most essential improvement of society, and that consists in rendering the cession, by him that has, to him that wants, an unrestrained and voluntary action. There remain but two instruments for producing this volition, the illumination of the understanding, and the love of distinction. These instruments have commonly been supposed wholly inadequate to their object. It has usually been treated as the most visionary of all systems, to expect the rich to sell all that they have and give to the poor. Footnote. Mark, chapter 10, verse 21. End footnote. It is one thing to convince men that a given conduct, on their part, would be most conducive to the general interest, and another to persuade them, actively to postpone, to considerations of general interest, 
every idea of personal ambition or pleasure. The sober calculator will often doubt whether it be reasonable, in consistence with the nature of a human being, to expect from him such a sacrifice, and the man of a lively and impetuous temper, even when satisfied that it is his duty, will be in hourly danger of deserting it, at the invitation of some allurement, too powerful for mortal frailty to resist. There is certainly considerable force in this statement, and there is good reason to believe, though the human mind be unquestionably accessible to disinterested motives, footnote, volume 1, book 4, chapter 10, end footnote, that virtue would be in most instances an impracticable refinement, were it not that self-love and social, however different in themselves, are found upon strict examination to prescribe the same system of conduct. But this observation by no means removes the difficulty intended to be suggested in the objection, though frugality, moderation, and plainness may be the joint dictate of these two authorities, yet it is the property of the human mind to be swayed by things present more than by things absent. In affairs of religion, we often find men indulging themselves in offenses of small gratification, in spite of all the threats that can be held out to them of eternal damnation. It is in vain that, for the most part, you would preach the pleasures of abstinence amidst the profusion of a feast, or the unsubstantialness of fame and power, to him who is tortured with the goadings of ambition. The case is similar to that of the exacerbations of grief, the attempt to cure which by the consolations of philosophy has been a source of inexhaustible ridicule. The answer to these remarks has been anticipated. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 5, Section 3, End Footnote. The ridicule lies in supposing the endeavor to cure a man of his weakness, to consist in one phlegmatic and solitary expostulation, instead of conceiving it to be accompanied with the vigor of conscious truth, and the progressive regularity of a course of instruction. Let us take up the subject in a view, in some degree varying from that in which it was formerly considered. We have endeavored to establish, in the commencement of the present book, the principles of justice, relative to the distribution of the goods of fortune. Let us inquire whether the principles there delivered can be made productive of conviction to the rich, whether they can be made productive of conviction, in cases not immediately connected with personal interest, and whether they can be made productive of conviction to the poor. Is it possible for a rich man to see that the costly gratifications in which he indulges are comparatively of little value, and that he may arrive at everything that is most essential in happiness or pleasure by means of the three other sources formerly enumerated? Footnote. Chapter 1, page 204. End footnote. Subsistence, unexpensive gratifications, and the means of intellectual and moral improvement. Is it possible for him to understand the calculation in every glass that he drinks and every ornament that he annexes to his person, of how many individuals have been condemned to slavery and sweat, incessant drudgery, unwholesome food, continual hardships, deplorable ignorance, and brutal insensibility, that he may be supplied with these luxuries? Footnote, chapter 2, page 209. End footnote. Is it possible for a man to have these ideas so repeatedly suggested to his mind, so strongly impressed, and so perpetually haunting him, as finally to induce a rich man to desire, with respect to personal gratifications, to live as if he were a poor one. It is not conceivable, but that every one of these questions must be answered in the affirmative. Be it observed, by the way, that the motives for a rich man to live as if he were a poor one are very inferior now to what they would be when a general sympathy upon this subject had taken place, and a general illumination had diffused itself. If then it be possible for a rich man, from the mere apprehensions of justice, voluntarily to desire to live as if he were a poor one, we shall have still less hesitation in affirming that a sentiment of justice in this matter may be made productive of conviction, in cases not immediately connected with personal interest, and of conviction to the poor. Undoubtedly an apprehension of the demands of justice in this respect has some tendency to the instigation of violence and tumult were we not to suppose the gradual development of this impression to be accompanied with a proportionable improvement of the mind in other respects, and a slow but incessant melioration of the institutions and practices of society. With this supposition, it could not however fail to happen, that, in proportion as the prejudices and ignorance of the great mass of society declined, the credit of wealth, and the reverent admiration with which it is now contemplated, must also decline. But in proportion as it lost credit, 
with the great mass of society, it would relax its hold upon the minds of those who possess it, or have the means of acquiring it. We have already seen, footnote, chapter 1, page 205, end footnote, that the great incitement to the acquisition of wealth is the love of distinction. Suppose then that, instead of the false glare which wealth through the present puerility of the human mind, reflects on its possessor, whose conduct in amassing and monopolizing it, were seen in its true light. We should not then demand his punishment, but we should look on him as a man uninitiated in the plainest sentiments of reason. He would not be pointed at with the finger, or hooted as he passed along through the resorts of men, but he would be conscious that he was looked upon as the meanest of mankind. He would be incited to the same assiduity in hiding his acquisitions then, as he employs in displaying them now. He would be regarded with no terror, for his conduct would appear too absurd to excite imitation. Add to which, his acquisitions would be small, as the independent spirit and sound discretion of mankind would allow but little chance of his being able to retain them in his service, as now, by generously rewarding them with a part of the fruit of their own labors. Thus it appears, with irresistible probability, when the subject of wealth shall be understood, and correct ideas respecting it familiarized to the human mind, that the present disparity of conditions will subside, by a gradual and incessant progress, into its true level. End of section 47. Recording by Arden. Section 48 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 8, Chapter 5. Objection to this system from the question of permanence. Grounds of the Objection. Its Serious Import. Nature of the Equality Under Consideration. As Produced by a Stricter Sense of Justice and a purer theory of happiness. The change we are here contemplating consists in the disposition of every member of the community, voluntarily to resign that which would be productive of a much higher degree of benefit and pleasure when possessed by his neighbor than when occupied by himself. Undoubtedly, this state of society is remote from the modes of thinking and acting which at present prevail. A long period of time must probably elapse before it can be brought entirely into practice, all we have been attempting to establish is that such a state of society is agreeable to reason and prescribed by justice, and that, of consequence, the progress of science and political truth among mankind is closely connected with its introduction. The inherent tendency of intellect is to improvement. If therefore this inherent tendency be suffered to operate, and no concussion of nature or inundation of barbarism arrest its course, the state of society we have been describing must, at some time, arrive. But it has frequently been said that if an equality of conditions could be introduced today, it would be destroyed tomorrow. It is impossible to reduce the varieties of the human mind to such a uniformity as this system demands. One man will be more industrious than another. One man will be provident and avaricious, and another dissipated and thoughtless. Misery and confusion would be the result of an attempt to equalize, in the first instance, and the old vices and monopolies would succeed, in the second. All that the rich could purchase by the most generous sacrifice would be a period of barbarism, from which the ideas and regulations of civil society must recommence, as from a new infancy. Upon this statement, it is first to be remarked that, if true, it presents to us a picture, in the highest degree, melancholy and discouraging. It discovers a disease, to which it is probable there is no remedy. Human knowledge must proceed. What we see and admire we shall at some time or other seek to attain. Such is the inevitable law of our nature. It is impossible not to see the beauty of equality, and not to be charmed with the benefits it appears to promise. It is impossible not to regret the unbounded mischiefs and distress that grow out of the opposite system. The consequence is sure. Man, according to these reasoners, is prompted, for some time, to advance with success. But after that, in the very act of pursuing further improvement, he necessarily plunges beyond the compass of his powers, and has his petty career to begin afresh, always pursuing what is beautiful, always frustrated in his object, always involved in calamities by the very means he employs to escape them. Secondly, it is to be observed 
that there is a wide difference between the equality here spoken of and the equality which is frequently constituted a subject of discussion among mankind. This is not an equality introduced by force, or maintained by the laws and regulations of a positive institution. It is not the result of accident, of the authority of a chief magistrate, or the over-earnest persuasion of a few enlightened thinkers, but is produced by the serious and deliberate conviction of the public at large. It is one thing for men to be held to a certain system, by the force of laws, and the vigilance of those who administer them, and a thing entirely different, to be held by the firm and habitual persuasion of their own minds. We can readily conceive their finding means to elude the former, but it is not so easy to comprehend a disobedience to the latter. If the force of truth shall be strong enough, gradually to wean men from the most rooted habits, and to introduce a mode of society so remote from that which at present exists, it will also probably be strong enough to hold them in the course they have commenced, and to prevent the return of vices which have once been extirpated. This probability will be increased if we recollect the two principles which must have led men into such a system of action, a stricter sense of justice, and a purer theory of happiness. Equality of conditions cannot begin to assume a fixed appearance in human society till the sentiment becomes deeply impressed, as well as widely diffused, that the genuine wants of any man constitute his only just claim to the ultimate appropriation and the consumption of any species of commodity. It must previously be seen that the claims of one man are originally of the same extent as the claims of another, and that the only difference which can arise must relate to extraordinary infirmity, or the particular object of utility which any individual is engaged in promoting. It must be felt that the most fundamental and noxious of all kinds of injustice is for one man actively to withhold from his neighbors the most indispensable benefits, for the sake of some trivial accommodation to himself. Men who are habituated to these views can scarcely be tempted to monopolize, and the sense of the community respecting him who yields to the temptation will be so decisive in its tenor and unequivocal in its manifestation as to afford small encouragement to perseverance or imitation. A spontaneous equality of conditions also implies a purer theory of happiness than has hitherto obtained. Men will cease to regard with complacence the happiness that consists in splendor and ostentation, of which the true object, however disguised, is to insult our neighbors and to feed our own vanity, with the recollection of the goods that we possess, and from which, though endowed with an equal claim, they are debarred. They will cease to derive pleasure from the empire to be possessed over others, or the base servility and terror with which they may address us. They will be contented, for the most part, with the means of healthful existence and of unexpensive pleasure. They will find the highest gratification in promoting and contemplating the general happiness. They will regard superfluities, absolutely considered, with no impatience of desire, and will abhor the idea of obtaining them through the medium of oppression and injustice. This conduct they would be induced to observe, even were their own gratification only in view, and, instead of repining at the want of exorbitant indulgences, they will stand astonished that men could ever have found gratification in that which was visibly stamped and contaminated with the badge of extortion. End of section 48. Recording by Arden. Section 49 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 8, Chapter 6. Objection to this system from the allurements of sloth. Objection proposed. Such a state of society preceded by great intellectual improvement. The manual labor required will be small. Universality of the love of distinction. Operation of this motive under the system in question. Finally superseded by a better motive. Another objection which has been urged against a system which counteracts the accumulation of property is that it would put an end to industry. We behold, in commercial countries, the miracles that are operated by the love of gain. Their inhabitants cover the sea with their fleets, astonish mankind by the refinements of their ingenuity, hold vast continents in subjection, and distant parts of the world, by their arms, are able to defy the most powerful confederacies, and, 
oppressed with taxes and debts, seem to acquire fresh prosperity under their accumulated burthens. Shall we lightly part with a motive which appears so great and stupendous in its influence? Once establish it as a principle in society, that no man is to apply to his personal use more than his necessities require, and every man will become indifferent to the exertions which now call forth the energy of his faculties. Once establish it as a principle, that each man, without being compelled to exert his own powers, is entitled to partake of the superfluity of his neighbor, and indolence will speedily become universal. Such a society must either starve, or be obliged, in its own defense, to return to that system of monopoly and sordid interest, which theoretical reasoners will forever arraign to no purpose. In reply to this objection, the reader must again be reminded that the equality for which we are pleading is an equality which would succeed to a state of great intellectual improvement. So bold a revolution cannot take place in human affairs till the general mind has been highly cultivated. Hasty and undigested tumults may be produced by a superficial idea of equalization, but it is only a clear and calm conviction of justice, of justice mutually to be rendered and received, of happiness to be produced by the desertion of our most rooted habits, that can introduce an invariable system of this sort. Attempts, without this preparation, will be productive only of confusion. Their effect will be momentary, and a new and more barbarous inequality will succeed. Each man, with unaltered appetite, will watch the opportunity, to gratify his love of power or of distinction, by usurping on his inattentive neighbors. Is it to be believed, then, that a state of so great intellectual improvement can be the forerunner of universal ignorance and brutality. Savages, it is true, are subject to the weakness of indolence. But civilized and refined states are the theater of a peculiar activity. It is thought, acuteness of disquisition, an ardor of pursuit that set the corporeal faculties at work. Thought begets thought. Nothing, perhaps, can put a stop to the advances of mind but oppression. But here, so far from being oppressed, every man is equal every man independent and at his ease. It has been observed that the introduction of a republican government is attended with public enthusiasm and irresistible enterprise. Is it to be believed that equality, the true republicanism, will be less effectual? It is true that in republics this spirit, sooner or later, is found to languish. Republicanism is not a remedy that strikes at the root of the evil. Injustice, oppression, and misery can find an abode in those seeming happy seats. But what shall stop the progress of ardor and improvement where the monopoly of property is unknown? This argument will be strengthened if we reflect on the amount of labor that a state of equality will require. What is this quantity of exertion from which the objection supposes many individuals to shrink? It is so light as rather to assume the guise of agreeable relaxation and gentle exercise than of labor. In such a community, scarcely anyone can be expected, in consequence of his situation, or avocations, to consider himself as exempted from the obligation to manual industry. There will be no rich man to recline in indolence, and fatten upon the labor of his fellows. The mathematician, the poet, and the philosopher will derive a new stock of cheerfulness and energy from the recurring labor that makes them feel they are men. There will be no persons devoted to the manufacture of trinkets and luxuries, and none whose office it should be to keep in motion the complicated machine of government, tax gatherers, beetles, excisemen, tide waiters, clerks, and secretaries. There will be neither fleets nor armies, neither courtiers nor lackeys. It is the unnecessary employments that at present occupy the great mass of every civilized nation, while the peasant labors incessantly to maintain them in a state more pernicious than idleness. It may be computed that not more than one-twentieth of the inhabitants of England is substantially employed in the labors of agriculture. Add to this that the nature of agriculture is such as to give full occupation in some parts of the year, and to leave other parts comparatively vacant. We may consider the latter as equivalent to a labor which, under the direction of sufficient skill, might suffice, in a simple state of society, for the fabrication of tools, for weaving, and the occupation of tailors, bakers, and butchers. The object in the present state of society is to multiply labor. In another state, it will be to simplify it. A vast disproportion of the wealth of the community has been thrown into the hands of a few, and ingenuity has been continually upon the stretch to find ways in which it may be expended. In the feudal times, 
the great lord invited the poor to come and eat of the produce of his estate upon condition of wearing his livery and forming themselves in rank and file to do honor to his well-born guests. Now that exchanges are more facilitated, he has quitted this inartificial mode and obliges the men who are maintained from his income to exert their ingenuity and industry in return. Thus, in the instance just mentioned, he pays the tailor to cut his clothes to pieces, that he may sew them together again, and to decorate them with stitching and various ornaments, without which they would be, in no respect, less convenient and useful. We are imagining, in the present case, a state of the most rigid simplicity. From the sketch which has been given, it seems by no means impossible that the labor of every twentieth man in the community would be sufficient to supply to the rest all the absolute necessaries of life. If then this labor, instead of being performed by so small a number, were amicably divided among the whole, it would occupy the twentieth part of every man's time. Let us compute that the industry of a laboring man engrosses ten hours in every day, which, when we have deducted his hours of rest, recreation, and meals, seems an ample allowance. It follows that half an hour a day, employed in manual labor by every member of the community, would sufficiently supply the whole with necessaries. Who is there that would shrink from this degree of industry? Who is there that sees the incessant industry exerted in this city and island, and would believe that, with half an hour's industry per diem, the sum of happiness to the community at large might be much greater than at present? Is it possible to contemplate this fair and generous picture of independence and virtue, where every man would have ample leisure for the noblest energies of mind, without feeling our very souls refreshed with admiration and hope. When we talk of men sinking into idleness, if they be not excited by the stimulus of gain, we seem to have little considered the motives that at present govern the human mind. We are deceived by the apparent mercenariness of mankind, and imagine that the accumulation of wealth is their great object. But it has sufficiently appeared that the present ruling passion of man is the love of distinction. Footnote. Chapter 1, page 205, and footnote. There is no doubt a class in society that is perpetually urged by hunger and need, and has no leisure for motives less gross and material. But is the class next above them less industrious than they? Will any man affirm that the mind of the peasant is as far removed from inaction and sloth as the mind of the general or the statesman, of the natural philosopher who macerates himself with perpetual study, or the poet? the bard of Mantua, for example, who can never believe that he has sufficiently revised, reconsidered, and polished his compositions. In reality, those by whom this reasoning has been urged have mistaken the nature of their own objection. They did not suppose that men could be roused into action only by the love of gain, but they conceive that, in a state of equality, men would have nothing to occupy their attention. What degree of truth there is in this idea, we shall presently have occasion to estimate. Footnote. Chapter 7, 8, end footnote. Meanwhile, it is sufficiently obvious that the motives which arise from the love of distinction are by no means cut off by a state of society incompatible with the accumulation of property. Men, no longer able to acquire the esteem or avoid the contempt of their neighbors by circumstances of dress and furniture, will divert the passion for distinction into another channel. They will avoid the reproach of indolence as carefully as they now avoid the reproach of poverty. The only persons who at present neglect the effect which their appearance and manners may produce are those whose faces are ground with famine and distress. But, in a state of equal society, no man will be oppressed, and, of consequence, the more delicate affections will have time to expand themselves. The general mind having, as we have already shown, arrived at a high degree of improvement, the impulse that carries it into action will be stronger. The fervor of public spirit will be great. Leisure will be multiplied and the leisure of a cultivated understanding is the precise period in which great designs, designs the tendency of which is to secure applause and esteem, are conceived. In tranquil leisure, it is impossible for any but the sublimest mind to exist without the passion for distinction. This passion, no longer permitted to lose itself in indirect channels and useless wanderings, will seek the noblest course and perpetually fructify the seeds of public good. Mind though it will perhaps at no time arrive at the termination of its possible discoveries and improvements, will nevertheless advance with a rapidity and firmness of progression, of which we are at present unable to conceive the idea. The love of fame is no doubt a delusion. This, like every other delusion, 
will take its turn to be detected and abjured. It is an airy phantom, which will indeed afford us an imperfect pleasure so long as we worship it, but will always, in a considerable degree, disappoint us and will not stand the test of examination. We ought to love nothing but a substantial happiness, that happiness which will bear the test of recollection, and which no clearness of perception and improvement of understanding will tend to undermine. If there be any principle more substantial than the rest, it is justice, a principle that rests upon this single postulatum that man and man are beings of the same nature, and susceptible under certain limitations of the same advantages. Whether the benefit which is added to the common stock proceed from you or me is a pitiful distinction. Fame, therefore, is an unsubstantial and delusive pursuit. If it signify an opinion entertained of me greater than I deserve, to desire it is vicious. If it be the precise mirror of my character, it is valuable only as a means, inasmuch as I shall be able, most essentially, to benefit those who best know the extent of my capacity and the rectitude of my intentions. The love of fame, when it perishes in minds formed under the present system, often gives place to a principle still more reprehensible. Selfishness is the habit that grows out of monopoly. When therefore selfishness ceases to seek its gratification in public exertion, it too often narrows into some frigid conception of personal pleasure, perhaps sensual, perhaps intellectual. But this cannot be the process where monopoly is banished. Selfishness has there no kindly circumstances to foster it. Truth, the overpowering truth of general good, then seizes us irresistibly. It is impossible we should want motives, so long as we see clearly how multitudes and ages may be benefited by our exertions. How causes and effects are connected in an endless chain, so that no honest effort can be lost, but will operate to good, centuries after its author is consigned to the grave. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 10, End Footnote. This will be the general passion, and all will be animated by the example of all. End of Section 49 Recording by Arden Section 50 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 8, Chapter 7 Objection to this System from the Benefits of Luxury Nature of the Objection Extent of its Influence Luxury, a Stage to be Passed Through Meanings of the Term Luxury Distinguished Application The objections we have hitherto examined attack the practicability of a system of equality. But there are not wanting reasoners the tendency of whose arguments is to show that omitting the practicability it is not even desirable. One of the objections they advance is as follows. They lay it down as a maxim in the first instance, and the truth of this maxim we shall not contend with them. Quote, that refinement is better than ignorance. It is better to be a man than a brute. Those attributes, therefore, which separate the man from the brute are most worthy of our affection and cultivation. Elegance of taste, refinement of sentiment, depth of penetration, and largeness of science are among the noblest ornaments of man. But all these, unquote, say they, quote, are connected with inequality. They are the growth of luxury. It is luxury by which palaces are built and cities peopled. It is for the purpose of obtaining a share of the luxury, which he witnesses in his richer neighbors, that the artificer exerts the refinements of his skill. To this cause we are indebted for the arts of architecture, painting, music, and poetry. Art would never have been cultivated if a state of inequality had not enabled some men to purchase and excited others to acquire the talent which was necessary to sell. 
in a state of equality we must always have remained and with equality restored we must again become barbarians thus we see as in the system of optimism disorder selfishness monopoly and distress all of them seeming discords contributing to the admirable harmony and magnificence of the whole the intellectual improvement and enlargement we witness and hope for was worth purchasing at the expense of partial injustice and distress End quote. note the great champion of this doctrine of optimism is mandeville it is not however easy to determine whether he is seriously or only ironically the defender of the present system of society his practical work the fable of the bees is highly worthy the attention of every man who would learn profoundly to philosophize upon human affairs no author has displayed in stronger terms the deformity of existing abuses or proved more satisfactorily how inseparably these abuses are connected together hume in essays part two essay two has endeavoured to communicate to the mandevillian system his own lustre and brilliancy of colouring but it has unfortunately happened that what he adds in beauty he has subtracted from profoundness the profoundness of hume which has never been surpassed and which ranks him with the most illustrious and venerable of men, is for the most part the profoundness of logical distinction rather than of moral analysis. End of note. This view of the subject, under various forms, has been very extensive in its effects. It probably contributed to make Rousseau an advocate of the savage state, undoubtedly we must not permit ourselves to think slightly of the mischiefs that accrue from a state of inequality if it be necessary that the great mass of mankind should be condemned to slavery and stranger still to ignorance that a few may be enlightened certainly those moralists are not to be blamed who doubted whether perpetual rudeness were not preferable to such a gift fortunately this is by no means the real alternative Perhaps a state of luxury, such as is here described, and a state of inequality, might be a stage through which it was necessary to pass, in order to arrive at the goal of civilization. The only security we can ultimately have for an equality of conditions is a general persuasion of the iniquity of accumulation and the uselessness of wealth in the purchase of happiness. But this persuasion could not be established in a savage state, nor indeed can it be maintained if we should fall back into barbarism. It was the spectacle of inequality that first excited the grossness of barbarians to persevering exertion as a means of acquiring. It was persevering exertion that first gave the reality and the sense of that leisure which has served the purposes of literature and art. But though inequality were necessary as the prelude to civilization, it is not necessary to its support. We may throw down the scaffolding when the edifice is complete. We have at large endeavored to show that the love of our fellow men, the love of distinction, and whatever motive is most allied to the energies of the human mind, will remain when the enchantments of wealth are dissolved he who has tasted the pleasures of refinement and knowledge will not relapse into ignorance the better to understand the futility of the present objection it may be proper to enter into a more accurate consideration of the sense of the term luxury it depends upon the meaning in which it is understood to determine whether it is to be regarded as a virtue or a vice if we understand by a luxury something which is to be enjoyed exclusively by some at the expense of undue privations and a partial burthen upon others to indulge ourselves in luxury is then a vice but if we understand by luxury which is frequently the case every accommodation which is not absolutely necessary to maintain us in sound and healthful existence the procuring and communicating luxuries may then be virtuous the end of virtue is to add to the sum of pleasurable sensation the beacon and regulator of virtue 
is impartiality, that we shall not give that exertion to procure the pleasure of an individual, which might have been employed in procuring the pleasure of many individuals. Within these limits every man is laudably employed, who procures to himself or his neighbor a real accession of pleasure, and he is censurable who neglects any occasion of being so employed. We ought not to study that we may live, but to live that we may replenish existence with the greatest number of unalloyed, exquisite, and substantial enjoyments. Let us apply these reflections to the state of equality we have endeavored to delineate. It appeared, in that delineation, that the labor of half an hour per diem on the part of every individual in the community would probably be sufficient to procure for all the necessaries of life. This quantity of industry, therefore, though prescribed by no law and enforced by no direct penalty, would be most powerfully imposed upon the strong in intellect by a sense of justice, and upon the weak by a sense of shame. After this, how would men spend the remainder of their time? Not probably in idleness, nor all men the whole of their time in the pursuit of intellectual attainments. There are many things, the fruit of human industry, which, though not to be classed among the necessaries of life, are highly conducive to our well-being. The criterion of these things will appear when we have ascertained what those accommodations are which will give us real pleasure, after the insinuations of vanity and ostentation shall have been dismissed. A considerable portion of time would probably be dedicated, in an enlightened community, to the production of such accommodations. A labor of this sort is perhaps not inconsistent with the most desirable state of human existence. Laborious employment is a calamity now, because it's imperiously prescribed upon men as the condition of their existence, and because it shuts them out from a fair participation in the means of knowledge and improvement. When it shall be rendered, in the strictest sense, voluntary, when it shall cease to interfere with our improvement, and rather become part of it, or at worst be converted into a source of amusement and variety, it may then be no longer a calamity but a benefit. Thus it appears that a state of equality need not be a state of stoical simplicity, but is compatible with considerable accommodation, and even, in some sense, with splendor. At least, if by splendor we understand copiousness of accommodation, and variety of invention for the purposes of accommodation, those persons, therefore, may be concluded to have small appearance of reason, who confound such a state with the state of the savage, or who suppose that the acquisition of the former is to be considered as having a tendency to lead to the latter. End of section 50 Read by Sandra in Montreal, August 2021. Section 51 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 8, Chapter 8. Objection to this system from the inflexibility of its restrictions. Objection stated. Natural and moral independence distinguished. Tendency of restriction properly so called. The system of equality, not a system of restriction. An objection that has often been urged against a system of equality is that it is inconsistent with personal independence. Every man, according to this scheme, is a passive instrument in the hands of the community. He must eat and drink and play and sleep at the bidding of others. He has no habitation, no period at which he can retreat into himself and not ask another's leave. He has nothing that he can call his own, not even his time or his person. Under the appearance of a perfect freedom from oppression and tyranny, he is in reality subjected to the most unlimited slavery. To understand the force of this objection, it is necessary that we should distinguish two sorts of independence, one of which may be denominated natural, and the other moral. Natural independence, a freedom from all constraint, except that of reasons and inducements presented to the understanding, 
is of the utmost importance to the welfare and improvement of mind. Moral independence, on the contrary, is always injurious. The dependence, which is essential, in this respect, to the wholesome temperament of society, includes in its articles, that are, no doubt, unpalatable to a multitude of the present race of mankind, but that owe their unpopularity only to weakness and vice. It includes a censure to be exercised by every individual over the actions of another, a promptness to inquire into and to judge them. Why should we shrink from this? What could be more beneficial than for each man to derive assistance for correcting and molding his conduct from the perspicacity of his neighbors? The reason that this species of censure is at present exercised with illiberality is because it is exercised clandestinely and because we submit to its operation with impatience and aversion. Moral independence is always injurious, for, as has abundantly appeared in the course of the present inquiry, there is no situation in which I can be placed where it is not incumbent upon me to adopt a certain conduct in preference to all others, and, of consequence, where I shall not prove an ill member of society, if I act in any other than a particular manner. The attachment that is felt by the present race of mankind to independence in this respect, and the desire to act as they please, without being accountable to the principles of reason, are highly detrimental to the general welfare. But, if we ought never to act independently of the principles of reason, and, in no instance, to shrink from the candid examination of another, it is nevertheless essential that we should, at all times, be free to cultivate the individuality and follow the dictates of our own judgment. If there be anything in the idea of equality that infringes this principle, the objection ought probably to be conclusive. If the scheme be, as it has often been represented, a scheme of government, constraint, and regulation, it is, no doubt, in direct hostility with the principles of this work. But the truth is, that a system of equality requires no restrictions or superintendents. There is no need of common labor, meals, or magazines. These are feeble and mistaken instruments for restraining the conduct without making conquest of the judgment. If you cannot bring over the hearts of the community to your party, expect no success from brute regulations. If you can, regulation is unnecessary. Such a system was well enough adapted to the military constitution of Sparta, but it is wholly unworthy of men enlisted in no cause but that of reason and justice. Beware of reducing men to the state of machines. Govern them through no medium but that of inclination and conviction. Can there be a good reason for men's eating together, except where they are prompted to it by the impulse of their own minds? Ought I to come at a certain hour from the museum where I am working, the retreat in which I meditate, or the observatory where I remark the phenomena of nature? to a certain hall appropriated to the office of eating. Instead of eating, as reason bids me, at the time and place most suited to my avocations. Why have common magazines? For the purpose of carrying our provisions to a certain distance, that we may afterwards bring them back again. Or is this precaution really necessary, after all that has been said, to guard us against the knavery and covetousness of our associates? Appendix of cooperation, cohabitation, and marriage, advantages of social refinement, of individuality, evils of cooperation, ideas of the future state of cooperation, its limits, its legitimate province, evils of cohabitation, of the received system of marriage, consequences of their abolition, a promiscuous commerce of the sexes estimated, inconstancy estimated, Education need not be a subject of positive institution, of the division of labor. It is a curious subject to inquire into the due medium between individuality and concert. On the one hand, it is to be observed that human beings are formed for society. Without society, we shall probably be deprived of the most eminent enjoyments of which our nature is susceptible. In society, no man, possessing the genuine marks of a man, can stand alone. Our opinions, our tempers, and our habits are modified by those of each other. This is by no means the mere operation of arguments and persuasives. It occurs in that insensible and gradual way, which no resolution can enable us wholly to counteract. He that would attempt to counteract it by insulating himself will fall into a worse error than that which he seeks to avoid. He will divest himself of the character of a man, and be incapable of judging of his fellow men, or of reasoning upon human affairs. On the other hand, 
Individuality is of the very essence of intellectual excellence. He that resigns himself wholly to sympathy and imitation can possess little of mental strength or accuracy. The system of his life is a species of sensual dereliction. He is like a captive in the garden of Armida. He may revel in the midst of a thousand delights, but he is incapable of the enterprise of a hero or the severity of a philosopher. He lives forgetting and forgot. He has deserted his station in human society. Mankind cannot be benefited by him. He neither animates them to exertion, nor leads them forward to unexpected improvement. When his country or his species call for him, he is not found in his rank. They can owe him no obligations, and, if one spark of a generous spirit remain within him, he will view his proceedings with no complacency. The truly venerable and the truly happy must have the fortitude to maintain his individuality. If he indulge in the gratifications and cultivate the feelings of man, he must at the same time be strenuous in following the train of his disquisitions and exercising the powers of his understanding. The objectors of a former chapter, footnote, chapter 5, end footnote, were partly in the right when they spoke of the endless variety of mind. It would be absurd to say that we are not capable of truth, of evidence, and agreement. In these respects, so far as mind is in a state of progressive improvement, we are perpetually coming nearer to each other. But there are subjects about which we shall continually differ, and ought to differ. The ideas, associations, and circumstances of each man are properly his own, and it is a pernicious system that would lead us to require all men, however different their circumstances, to act by a precise general rule. Add to this that, by the doctrine of progressive improvement, we shall always be erroneous, though we shall every day become less erroneous. The proper method for hastening the decline of error and producing uniformity of judgment is not by brute force, by laws, or by imitation, but on the contrary, by exciting every man to think for himself. From these principles, it appears that everything that is usually understood by the term cooperation is, in some degree, an evil. A man in solitude is obliged to sacrifice or postpone the execution of his best thoughts, in compliance with his necessities or his frailties. How many admirable designs have perished in the conception by means of this circumstance? It is still worse when a man is also obliged to consult the convenience of others. If I be expected to eat or to work in conjunction with my neighbor, it must either be at a time most convenient to me, or to him, or to neither of us. We cannot be reduced to a clockwork uniformity. Hence it follows that all supererogatory cooperation is carefully to be avoided, common labor and common meals. But what shall we say to a cooperation that seems dictated by the nature of the work to be performed? It ought to be diminished. There is probably considerably more of injury in the concert of industry than of sympathies. At present, it is unreasonable to doubt that the consideration of the evil of cooperation is, in certain urgent cases, to be postponed to that urgency. Whether, by the nature of things, cooperation of some sort will always be necessary is a question we are scarcely competent to decide. At present, to pull down a tree, to cut a canal, to navigate a vessel, require the labor of many. Will they always require the labor of many? When we recollect the complicated machines of human contrivance, various sorts of mills, of weaving engines, steam engines, are we not astonished at the compendium of labor they produce? Who shall say where the species of improvement must stop? At present, such inventions alarm the laboring part of the community, and they may be productive of temporary distress, though they conduce in the sequel to the most important interests of the multitude. But, in a state of equal labor, their utility will be liable to no dispute. Hereafter it is by no means clear that the most extensive operations will not be within the reach of one man, or, to make use of a familiar instance, that a plow may not be turned into a field, and perform its office without the need of superintendence. It was in this sense that the celebrated Franklin conjectured that mind would one day become omnipotent over matter. Footnote. I have no authority to quote for this expression, but the conversation of Dr. Price. I am happy to find, upon inquiry, that Mr. William Morgan, the nephew of Dr. Price, an editor of his works, distinctly recollects to have heard it from his uncle. End footnote. The conclusion of the progress which has here been sketched is something like a final close to the necessity of manual labor. It may be instructive in such cases 
to observe how the sublime geniuses of former times anticipated what seems likely to be the future improvement of mankind. It was one of the laws of Lycurgus that no Spartan should be employed in manual labor. For this purpose, under his system, it was necessary that they should be plentifully supplied with slaves devoted to drudgery, matter, or, to speak more accurately, the certain and unintermitting laws of the universe will be the helots of the period we are contemplating. We shall end in this respect, O immortal legislator, at the point from which you began. To return to the subject of cooperation, it may be a curious speculation to attend to the progressive steps by which this feature of human society may be expected to decline. For example, shall we have concerts of music? The miserable state of mechanism of the majority of the performers is so conspicuous as to be even at this day a topic of mortification and ridicule. Will it not be practicable hereafter for one man to perform the whole? Shall we have theatrical exhibitions? This seems to include an absurd and vicious cooperation. It may be doubted whether men will hereafter come forward in any mode, formally to repeat words and ideas that are not their own. It may be doubted whether any musical performer will habitually execute the compositions of others. We yield supinely to the superior merit of our predecessors, because we are accustomed to indulge the inactivity of our faculties. All formal repetition of other men's ideas seems to be a scheme for imprisoning, for so long a time, the operations of our own mind. It borders, perhaps in this respect, upon a breach of sincerity, which requires that we should give immediate utterance to every useful and valuable idea that occurs. Having ventured to state these hints and conjectures, let us endeavor to mark the limits of individuality. Every man that receives an impression from any external object has the current of his own thoughts modified by force, and yet, without external impressions, we should be nothing. Every man that reads the composition of another suffers the succession of his ideas to be, in a considerable degree, under the direction of his author. But it does not seem as if this would ever form a sufficient objection against reading. One man will always have stored up reflections and facts that another wants, and mature and digested discourse will perhaps always, in equal circumstances, be superior to that which is extempore. Conversation is a species of cooperation, one or the other party always yielding to have his ideas guided by the other. Yet conversation, and the intercourse of mind with mind, seem to be the most fertile sources of improvement. It is here as it is with punishment. He that, in the gentlest manner, undertakes to reason another out of his vices, will probably occasion pain. But this species of punishment ought, upon no account, to be superseded. Let not these views of the future individuality of man be misapprehended or overstrained. We ought to be able to do without one another. He is the most perfect man, to whom society is not a necessary of life, but a luxury, innocent and enviable, in which he joyfully indulges. Such a man will not fly to society, as to something requisite for the consuming of his time, or the refuge of his weakness. In society he will find pleasure. The temper of his mind will prepare him for friendship and for love, but he will resort with a scarcely inferior eagerness to solitude and will find in it the highest complacence and the purest delight. Another article which belongs to the subject of cooperation is cohabitation. The evils attendant on this practice are obvious. In order to the human understanding's being successfully cultivated, it is necessary that the intellectual operations of men should be independent of each other. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 3, Page 137. End footnote. We should avoid such practices as are calculated to melt our opinions into a common mold. Cohabitation is also hostile to that fortitude which should accustom a man, in his actions as well as in his opinions, to judge for himself and feel competent to the discharge of his own duties. Add to this that it is absurd to expect the inclinations and wishes of two human beings to coincide through any long period of time. To oblige them to act and to live together is to subject them to some inevitable portion of thwarting, bickering, and unhappiness. This cannot be otherwise, so long as men shall continue to vary in their habits, their preferences, and their views. No man is always cheerful and kind, and it is better that his fits of irritation should subside of themselves, since the mischief in that case is more limited, and since the jarring of opposite tempers, and the suggestions of a wounded pride, tend inexpressibly 
to increase the irritation. When I seek to correct the defects of a stranger, it is with urbanity and good humor. I have no idea of convincing him through the medium of surliness and invective. But something of this kind inevitably obtains, where the intercourse is too unremitted. The subject of cohabitation is particularly interesting, as it includes in it the subject of marriage. It will therefore be proper to pursue the inquiry in greater detail. The evil of marriage, as it is practiced in European countries, extends further than we have yet described. The method is, for a thoughtless and romantic youth of each sex, to come together, to see each other, for a few times, and under circumstances full of delusion, and then to vow eternal attachment. What is the consequence of this? In almost every instance they find themselves deceived. They are reduced to make the best of an irretrievable mistake. They are led to conceive it their wisest policy to shut their eyes upon realities, happy if, by any perversion of intellect, they can persuade themselves that they were right in their first crude opinion of each other. Thus the institution of marriage is made a system of fraud, and men who carefully mislead their judgments in the daily affair of their life must be expected to have a crippled judgment in every other concern. Add to this that marriage, as now understood, is a monopoly, and the worst of monopolies. So long as two human beings are forbidden, by positive institution, to follow the dictates of their own mind, prejudice will be alive and vigorous. So long as I seek, by despotic and artificial means, to maintain my possession of a woman, I am guilty of the most odious selfishness. Over this imaginary prize men watch with perpetual jealousy, and one man finds his desire and his capacity to circumvent as much excited as the other is excited to traverse his projects and frustrate his hopes. As long as this state of society continues, philanthropy will be crossed and checked in a thousand ways, and the still augmenting stream of abuse will continue to flow. The abolition of the present system of marriage appears to involve no evils. We are apt to represent that abolition to ourselves as the harbinger of brutal lust and depravity. But it really happens in this, as in other cases, that the positive laws which are made to restrain our vices irritate and multiply them. Not to say that the same sentiments of justice and happiness, which, in a state of equality, would destroy our relish for expensive gratifications, might be expected to decrease our inordinate appetites of every kind and to lead us universally to prefer the pleasures of intellect to the pleasures of sense. It is a question of some moment whether the intercourse of the sexes, in a reasonable state of society, would be promiscuous, or whether each man would select for himself a partner, to whom he will adhere as long as that adherence shall continue to be the choice of both parties. Probability seems to be greatly in favor of the latter. Perhaps this side of the alternative is most favorable to population. Perhaps it would suggest itself in preference to the man who would wish to maintain the several propensities of his frame, in the order due to their relative importance, and to prevent a merely sensual appetite from engrossing excessive attention. It is scarcely to be imagined that this commerce, in any state of society, will be stripped of its adjuncts, and that men will as willingly hold it with a woman whose personal and mental qualities they disapprove, as with one of a different description. But it is the nature of the human mind to persist, for a certain length of time, in its opinion or choice. The parties, therefore, having acted upon selection, are not likely to forget this selection when the interview is over. Friendship, if by friendship we understand that affection for an individual which is measured singly by what we know of his worth, is one of the most exquisite gratifications, perhaps one of the most improving exercises of a rational mind. Friendship, therefore, may be expected to come in aid of the sexual intercourse, to refine its grossness and increase its delight. All these arguments are calculated to determine our judgment in favor of marriage as a salutary and respectable institution, but not of that species of marriage in which there is no room for repentance, and to which liberty and hope are equally strangers. Admitting these principles, therefore, as the basis of the sexual commerce, what opinion ought we form respecting infidelity to this attachment? Certainly no ties ought to be imposed upon either party, preventing them from quitting the attachment whenever their judgment directs them to quit it. With respect to such infidelities as are compatible with an intention to adhere to it, the point of principal importance is a determination to have recourse to no species of disguise. In ordinary cases, and where the periods of absence are of no long duration, it would seem that any inconstancy would reflect some portion of discredit on the person that practiced it. It would argue 
that the person's propensities were not under that kind of subordination, which virtue and self-government appear to prescribe. But inconstancy, like any other temporary dereliction, would not be found incompatible with a character of uncommon excellence. What, at present, renders it, in many instances, peculiarly loathsome, is its being practiced in a clandestine manner. It leads to a train of falsehood and a concerted hypocrisy, than which there is scarcely anything that more eminently deprives and degrades the human mind. The mutual kindness of persons of an opposite sex will, in such a state, fall under the same system as any other species of friendship. Exclusively of groundless and obstinate attachments, it will be impossible for me to live in the world without finding in one man a worth superior to that of another. To this man, I shall feel kindness, in exact proportion to my apprehension of his worth. The case will be the same with respect to the other sex. I shall assiduously cultivate the intercourse of that woman, whose moral and intellectual accomplishments strike me in the most powerful manner. But, it may happen, that other men will feel for her the same preference that I do. This will create no difficulty. We may all enjoy her conversation, and, her choice being declared, we shall all be wise enough to consider the sexual commerce as unessential to our regard. It is a mark of the extreme depravity of our present habits, that we are inclined to suppose the sexual commerce necessary to the advantages arising from the purest friendship. It is by no means indispensable that the female to whom each man attaches himself in that matter should appear to each the most deserving and excellent of her sex. Let us consider the way in which this state of society will modify education. It may be imagined that the abolition of the present system of marriage would make education, in a certain sense, the affair of the public, though if there be any truth in the reasonings of this work, to provide for it by the positive institutions of a community would be extremely inconsistent with the true principles of an intellectual nature. Footnote, Book 6, Chapter 8, End Footnote. Education may be regarded as consisting of various branches. First, the personal cares which the helpless state of an infant requires. These will probably devolve upon the mother, unless, by frequent parturition, or by the nature of these cares, that be found to render her share of the burthen unequal, and then it will be amicably and willingly participated by others. Secondly, food and other necessary supplies. These will easily find their true level and spontaneously flow from the quarter in which they abound to the quarter that is deficient. Lastly, the term education may be used to signify instruction. The task of instruction under such a form of society will be greatly simplified and altered from what it is at present. It will then scarcely be thought more necessary to make boys slaves than to make men so. The business will not then be to bring forward so many adepts in the eggshell that the vanity of parents may be flattered by hearing their praises. No man will think of vexing with premature learning the feeble and inexperienced, lest, when they come to years of discretion, they should refuse to be learned. The mind will be suffered to expand itself, in proportion as occasion and impression shall excite it, and not tortured and enervated by being cast in a particular mold. No creature in human form will be expected to learn anything but because he desires it and has some conception of its value, and every man, in proportion to his capacity, will be ready to furnish such general hints and comprehensive views as will suffice for the guidance and encouragement of him who studies from the impulse of desire. These observations lead us to the consideration of one additional difficulty, which relates to the division of labor. Shall each man manufacture his tools, furniture, and accommodations? This would perhaps be a tedious operation. Every man performs the task to which he is accustomed, more skillfully, and in a shorter time than another. It is reasonable that you should make for me, that which perhaps I should be three or four times as long in making, and should make imperfectly at last. Shall we then introduce barter and exchange? By no means. The moment I require any further reason for supplying you than the cogency of your claim, the moment, in addition to the dictates of benevolence, I demand a prospect of reciprocal advantage to myself. There is an end of that political justice and pure society of which we treat. The division of labor, as it has been developed by commercial writers, is the offspring of avarice. It has been found that ten persons can make 240 times as many pins in a day as one person. Footnote. Smith's Wealth of Nations, Book 1, Chapter 1. End footnote. This refinement is the growth of monopoly. 
The object is to see into how vast a surface the industry of the lower classes may be beaten, the more completely to gild over the indolent and the proud. The ingenuity of the merchant is wedded by new improvements of this sort to transport more of the wealth of the powerful into his coffers. The practicability of effecting a compendium of labor by this means will be greatly diminished when men shall learn to deny themselves partial superfluities. The utility of such a saving of labor, where labor shall be changed from a burthen into an amusement, will scarcely balance the evils of so extensive a cooperation. From what has been said, it appears that there will be a division of labor. If we compare the society in question with the state of the solitaire and the savage, but it will produce an extensive simplification of labor if we compare it with that to which we are at present accustomed in civilized Europe. End of section 51. Recording by Arden. Section 52 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin Book 8, Chapter 9 Objection to this system from the principle of population Objection stated Opinions that have been entertained on this subject Population adapted to find its own level Precautions that have been exerted to check it Conclusion an author who has speculated widely upon subjects of government, footnote, Wallace, Various Prospects of Mankind, Nature and Providence, 1761, end footnote, has recommended equality, or, which was rather his idea, a community of goods to be maintained by the vigilance of the state, as a complete remedy for the usurpation and distress which are, at present, the most powerful enemies of humankind for the vices which infect education in some instances, and the neglect it encounters in more, for all the turbulence of passion and all the injustice of selfishness. But, after having exhibited this brilliant picture, he finds an argument that demolishes the whole and restores him to indifference or despair in the excessive population that would ensue. The question of population, as it relates to the science of politics and society, is considerably curious. Several writers upon these topics have treated it in a way calculated to produce a very gloomy impression, and have placed precautions to counteract the multiplication of the human species among the most important objects of civil prudence. These precautions appear to have occupied much attention in several ancient nations, among whom there prevailed the great solicitude that the number of citizens in the state should suffer no augmentation. In modern times, a contrary opinion has frequently obtained, and the populousness of a country has been said to constitute its true wealth and prosperity. Perhaps, however, express precautions in either kind are superfluous and nugatory. There is a principle in the nature of human society by means of which everything seems to tend to its level and to proceed in the most auspicious way when least interfered with by the mode of regulation. In a certain stage of the social progress, population seems rapidly to increase. This appears to be the case in the United States of America. In a subsequent stage, it undergoes little change, either in the way of increase or diminution. This is the case in the more civilized countries of Europe. The number of inhabitants in a country will perhaps never be found, in the ordinary course of affairs, greatly to increase, beyond the facility of subsistence. Nothing is more easy than to account for this circumstance. So long as there is a facility of subsistence, men will be encouraged to early marriages and to a careful rearing of their children. In America, it is said, men congratulate themselves upon the increase of their families, as upon a new accession of wealth. The labor of their children, even in an early stage, soon redeems, and even repays with interest, the expense and effort of rearing them. In such countries, the wages of the laborer are high, for the number of laborers bears no proportion to the demand and to the general spirit of enterprise. In many European countries, on the other hand, a large family has become a proverbial expression for an uncommon degree of poverty and wretchedness. The price of labor in any state, so long as the spirit of accumulation shall prevail, is an infallible barometer of the state of its population. It is impossible where the price of labor is greatly reduced, 
and an added population threatens a still further reduction, that man should not be considerably under the influence of fear, respecting an early marriage, and a numerous family. There are various methods by the practice of which population may be checked, by the exposing of children, as among the ancients, and, at this day, in China, by the art of procuring abortion, as it is said to subsist in the island of Ceylon, by a promiscuous intercourse of the sexes, which is found extremely hostile to the multiplication of the species, or lastly, by systematical abstinence, such as must be supposed, in some degree, to prevail in monasteries of either sex. But, without any express institution of this kind, the encouragement or discouragement that arises from the general state of a community will probably be found to be all-powerful in its operation. Supposing, however, that population were not thus adapted to find its own level, it is obvious to remark upon the objection of this chapter that to reason thus is to foresee difficulties at a great distance. Three-fourths of the habitable globe are now uncultivated. The improvements to be made in cultivation and the augmentations the earth is capable of receiving in the article of productiveness cannot, as yet, be reduced to any limits of calculation. Myriads of centuries of still increasing population may pass away, and the earth be yet found sufficient for the support of its inhabitants. It were idle, therefore, to conceive discouragement from so distant a contingency. The rational anticipations of human improvement are unlimited, not eternal. The very globe that we inhabit, and the solar system, may, for anything that we know, be subject to decay. Physical casualties of different denominations may interfere with the progressive nature of intellect. But, putting these out of the question, it is certainly most reasonable to commit so remote a danger to the chance of such remedies, remedies of which perhaps we may, at this time, not have the smallest idea, as shall suggest themselves at a period sufficiently early for their practical application. Appendix Of Health and the Prolongation of Human Life Omnipotence of Mind Application of this principle to the animal frame. Causes of decrepitude. Theory of voluntary and involuntary action. Present utility of these reasonings. Recapitulation. Application to the future state of society. The question respecting population is, in some degree, connected with the subject of health and longevity. It may therefore be allowed us to make use of this occasion for indulging in certain speculations upon this article. What follows must be considered as eminently a deviation into the land of conjecture. If it be false, it leaves the system to which it is appended, in all sound reason, as impregnable as ever. Let us then, in this place, return to the sublime conjecture of Franklin, a man habitually conversant with the system of the external universe, and by no means propense to extravagant speculations, that mind will one day become omnipotent over matter. Footnote. Chapter 8. Appendix, page 241. The authors, who have published their conjectures respecting the possibility of extending the term of human life, are many. The most illustrious of these is probably Lord Bacon. The most recent is Condorcet, in his Outlines of a History of the Progress of the Human Mind, published since the first appearance of this work. These authors, however, have inclined to rest their hopes rather upon the growing perfection of art than, as is here done, upon the immediate and unavoidable operation of an improved intellect. End footnote. The sense which he annexed to this expression seems to have related to the improvements of human invention in relation to machines and the compendium of labor. But if the power of intellect can be established over all other matter, are we not inevitably led to ask, why not over the matter of our own bodies? If over matter, at however great a distance, why not over matter which, ignorant as we may be of the tie that connects it with the thinking principle, we seem always to carry about with us, and which is our medium of communication with the external universe. The different cases in which thought modifies the structure and members of the human body are obvious to all. First, they are modified by our voluntary thoughts or design. We desire to stretch out our hand, and it is stretched out. We perform a thousand operations of the same species every day, and their familiarity annihilates the wonder. They are not in themselves less wonderful than any of these modifications we are least accustomed to conceive. Secondly, mind modifies body involuntarily. To omit, for the present, 
what has been offered upon this subject by way of hypothesis and inference. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 9, End Footnote. There are many instances in which this fact presents itself in the most unequivocal manner. Has not a sudden piece of good news been frequently found to dissipate a corporeal indisposition? Is it not still more usual for mental impressions to produce indisposition, and even what is called a broken heart? And shall we believe that that which is so powerful in mischief can be altogether impotent for happiness? How common is the remark that those accidents which are to the indolent a source of disease are forgotten and extirpated in the busy inactive? I walk twenty miles in an indolent and half-determined temper, and I am extremely fatigued. I walk twenty miles, full of ardor, and with a motive that engrosses my soul, and I arrive as fresh and alert as when I began my journey. Emotion, excited by some unexpected word, by a letter that is delivered to us, occasions the most extraordinary revolutions in our frame, accelerates the circulation, causes the heart to palpitate, the tongue to refuse its office, and has been known to occasion death by extreme anguish or extreme joy. There is nothing of which the physician is more frequently aware than of the power of the mind in assisting or retarding convalescence. Why is it that a mature man loses that elasticity of limb which characterizes the heedless gaiety of youth? The origin of this appears to be that he desists from youthful habits. He assumes an air of dignity, incompatible with the lightness of childish sallies. He is visited and vexed with the cares that rise out of our mistaken institutions, and his heart is no longer satisfied and gay. His limbs become stiff, unwieldy, and awkward. This is the forerunner of old age and of death. A habit peculiarly favorable to corporeal vigor is cheerfulness. Every time that our mind becomes morbid, vacant, and melancholy, our external frame falls into disorder. Listlessness of thought is the brother of death. But cheerfulness gives new elasticity to our limbs and circulation to our juices. Nothing can long be stagnant in the frame of him whose heart is tranquil and his imagination active. A further requisite in the case of which we treat is clear and distinct apprehension. Disease seems perhaps in all instances to be the concomitant of confusion. When reason resigns the helm, and our ideas fluctuate without order or direction, we sleep. Delirium and insanity are of the same nature. Fainting appears principally to consist in a relaxation of intellect, so that the ideas seem to mix in painful disorder, and nothing is distinguished. He that continues to act or is led to a renewal of action with perspicuity and decision, is almost inevitably a man in health. The surest source of cheerfulness is benevolence. To a youthful mind, while everything strikes with its novelty, the individual situation must be peculiarly unfortunate. If gaiety of thought be not produced, or, when interrupted, do not speedily return with its healing virtue. But novelty is a fading charm and perpetually decreases, Hence the approach of inanity and listlessness. After we have made a certain round, life delights no more. A death-like apathy invades us. Thus the aged are generally cold and indifferent. Nothing interests their attention, or rouses their sluggishness. How should it be otherwise? The objects of human pursuit are commonly frigid and contemptible, and the mistake comes at last to be detected. But virtue is a charm that never fades. The mind that overflows with kindness and sympathy will always be cheerful. The man who is perpetually busied in contemplations of public good can scarcely be inactive. Add to this that a benevolent temper is peculiarly irreconcilable with those sentiments of anxiety, discontent, rage, revenge, and despair, which so powerfully corrode the frame, and hourly consign their miserable victims to an untimely grave. Thus far we have discoursed of a negative power which, if sufficiently exercised, would it is to be presumed, eminently tend to the prolongation of human life. But there is a power of another description, which seems entitled to our attention in this respect. We have frequently had occasion to point out the distinction between our voluntary and involuntary motions. Footnote. Volume 1. Book 1. Chapter 5. Book 4. Chapter 7. 10. End footnote. We have seen that they are continually running into each other our involuntary motions gradually becoming subject to the power of volition, and our voluntary motions degenerating into involuntary. We concluded in an early part of this work, footnote, 
Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 5, Section 2, End Footnote. And that, as it should seem, was sufficient reason that the true perfection of man was to attain as nearly as possible to the perfectly voluntary state that we ought to be, upon all occasions, prepared to render a reason of our actions and should remove ourselves to the furthest distance from the state of mere inanimate machines, acted upon by causes of which they have no understanding. Our involuntary motions are frequently found gradually to become subject to the power of volition. It seems impossible to set limits to this species of metamorphosis. Its reality cannot be questioned when we consider that every motion of the human frame was originally involuntary. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 9, Page 193. End footnote. Is it not then highly probable, in the process of human improvement, that we may finally obtain an empire over every articulation of our frame? The circulation of the blood is a motion, in our present state, eminently involuntary. Yet nothing is more obvious than that certain thoughts and states of the thinking faculty are calculated to affect this process. Reasons have been adduced which seem to lead to an opinion that thought and animal motion are, in all cases, to be considered as antecedent and consequent. Footnote. Volume 1. Book 4. Chapter 9. End footnote. We can now, perhaps by an effort of the mind, correct certain commencing irregularities of the system, and forbid, in circumstances where those phenomena would otherwise appear, the heart to palpitate and the limbs to tremble. The voluntary power of some men over their animal frame is found to extend to various articles in which other men are impotent. A further probability will be reflected upon these conjectures if we recollect the picture which was formerly exhibited. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 9, Page 197, End Footnote, of the rapidity of the succession of ideas. If we can have a series of 320 ideas in a second of time, why should it be supposed that we may not hereafter arrive at the skill of carrying on a great number of contemporaneous processes without disorder? Nothing can be more irreconcilable to analogy than to conclude, because a certain species of power is beyond the train of our present observations, that it is beyond the limits of the human mind. Footnote, Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 8, End Footnote. We talk familiarly, indeed, of the extent of our faculties, and our vanity prompts us to suppose that we have reached the goal of human capacity. But there is little plausibility in so arrogant an assumption. If it could have been told to the savage inhabitants of Europe in the times of Theseus and Achilles that man was capable of predicting eclipses and weighing the air, of reducing to settled rules the phenomena of nature so that no prodigies should remain, and of measuring the distance and size of the heavenly bodies, this would not have appeared to them less incredible than if we had told them of the possibility of maintaining the human body in perpetual youth and vigor. But we have not only this analogy, showing that the discovery in question forms, as it were, a regular branch of the acquisitions that belong to an intellectual nature. But, in addition to this, we seem to have a glimpse of the manner in which the acquisition will be secured. One remark may be proper in this place. If the remedies here proposed tend to a total extirpation of the infirmities of our nature, then, though we should not be able to promise them an early or complete success, we may probably find them of some utility. They may contribute to prolong our vigor, if not to immortalize it, and which is of more consequence, to make us live while we live. Every time the mind is invaded with anguish and gloom, the frame becomes disordered. Every time languor and indifference creep upon us, our functions fall into decay. In proportion as we cultivate fortitude and equanimity, our circulations will be cheerful. In proportion as we cultivate a kind and benevolent propensity, we may be secure of finding something to interest and engage us. Medicine may reasonably be stated to consist of two branches, animal and intellectual. The latter of these has been infinitely too much neglected. It cannot be employed to the purposes of a profession, or where it has been incidentally so employed. It has been artificially and indirectly not in an open and avowed manner. Herein the patient must minister to himself. Footnote. Shakespeare. Macbeth. Act 5. End footnote. It would no doubt be of extreme moment to us to be thoroughly acquainted with the power of motives, perseverance, and what is called resolution in this respect. 
The sum of the arguments which have been here offered amounts to a species of presumption that the term of human life may be prolonged, and that by the immediate operation of intellect, beyond any limits which we are able to assign, it would be idle to talk of the absolute immortality of man. Eternity and immortality are phrases to which it is impossible for us to annex any distinct ideas, and the more we attempt to explain them, the more we shall find ourselves involved in contradiction. To apply these remarks to the subject of population, one tendency of a cultivated and virtuous mind is to diminish our eagerness for the gratifications of the senses. They please at present by their novelty, that is, because we know not how to estimate them. They decay in the decline of life indirectly, because the system refuses them, but directly and principally because they no longer excite the ardor of the mind. The gratifications of sense please at present by their imposture. We soon learn to despise the mere animal function, which, apart from the delusions of intellect, would be nearly the same in all cases, and to value it only as it happens to be relieved by personal charms or mental excellence. The men therefore whom we are supposing to exist, when the earth shall refuse itself to a more extended population, will probably cease to propagate. The whole will be a people of men, and not of children. Generation will not succeed generation, nor truth have, in a certain degree, to recommence her career every thirty years. Other improvements may be expected to keep pace with those of health and longevity. There will be no war, no crimes, no administration of justice, as it is called, and no government. Beside this, there will be neither disease, anguish, melancholy, nor resentment. Every man will seek, with ineffable ardor, the good of all. Mind will be active and eager, yet never disappointed. Men will see the progressive advancement of virtue and good, and feel that, if things occasionally happen contrary to their hopes, the miscarriage itself was a necessary part of that progress. They will know that they are members of the chain, that each has his several utility, and they will not feel indifferent to that utility. They will be eager to inquire into the good that already exists, the means by which it was produced, and the greater good that is yet in store. They will never want motives for exertion. For that benefit which a man thoroughly understands and earnestly loves, he cannot refrain from endeavoring to promote. Before we dismiss this subject, it is proper once again to remind the reader that the substance of this appendix is given only as matter of probable conjecture, and that the leading argument of this division of the work is altogether independent of its truth or falsehood. End of section 52. Recording by Arden. Section 53 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Henry Rosales. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness, Volume 2, by William Godwin. Book 8, Chapter 10, Reflections Numeral 1. Supposed Danger in Dissemination Leveling Principles Idea of Massacre Qualification of this Idea Skeptical Suggestions Means of Suppressing Inquiry Nature of Political Science Numeral 2. Political Duties 1. Of those who are qualified for public instructors Temper Sincerity. Pernicious effects of dissemination in this case. 2. Of the rich and great. Many of them may be expected to be advocates of equality. Conduct which their interest as a body prescribes. 3. The friends of equality in general. Importance of a mild and benevolent proceeding. Numeral 3. Connections between liberty and equality. Cause of equality will perpetually advance. Symptoms of its progress. Idea of its future success. Conclusion. We have now taken a general survey of the system of equality, and there remains only a state of a few incidental remarks with which it may be proper to wind up the subject. No idea has excited greater horror in the minds of multitude of persons than that of the mischiefs that will ensue from the dissemination of what they call leveling principles. They believe, 
that these principles will inevitably ferment in the minds of the vulgar, and that the attempts to carry them into execution will be attended with every species of calamity. They represent to themselves the uninformed and uncivilized parts of mankind, as let loose from restraints and hurried into every kind of excess. Knowledge and taste, the improvements of intellect, the discoveries of sages, the beauties of poetry and art are trampled underfoot and extinguished by barbarians. It is another inundation of Goths and Vandals, with this bitter aggravation that the viper that stings us to death was fostered in our own bosom. They conceive the scene as beginning in massacre. They suppose all that is great, preeminent, and illustrious as ranking among the first victims, such as are distinguished by peculiar refinements of manner or energy of understanding and virtue, will be the inevitable objects of envy and jealousy such as intrepidly exert themselves to succor the persecuted, or to declare the public what they are least inclined, but is most necessary for them to hear, will be marked out for assassination. Whatever may be the abstract recommendations of the system of equality, we must not allow ourselves any such partiality upon a subject in which the welfare of the species is involved, as should induce us to shrink from a due attention to the ideas here exhibited. Massacre is a too possible attendant upon revolution, and massacre is perhaps the most hateful scene, allowing for its momentary duration that any imagination can suggest. The fearful, hopeless expectation of the defeated, and the bloodhound fury of their conquerors, is a complication of mischief that all which has been told to infernal regions can scarcely surpass. The cold-blooded massacres that are perpetrated under the name of criminal justice fall short of these in some of their most frightful aggravations. The ministers and instruments of law, have by custom reconciled their minds to the dreadful task they perform, and often bear their parts to the most shocking enormities without being sensible to the passions allied to the enormities. They do not always accompany their murders with the rudeness of an insulting triumph, and as they conduct themselves in a certain sort, by known principles of injustice, the evil we have reason to apprehend has its limits. But the instruments of massacres are discharged from every restraint, Whatever their caprice dictates, their hands are instantly employed to perpetrate. Their eyes emit flashes of cruelty and rage. They pursue their victims from street to street and from house to house. They tear them from the arms of their fathers and their wives. They glut themselves with barbarity and utter shouts of horrid joy at the spectacles of torture. In answer to this representation, it has sometimes been alleged by the friends of reform that the advantages possessed by a system of liberties are so great as to be worthy purchasing at any price, that the evils of the most sanguinary revolution are temporary, that the vices of despotism, which few pens indeed have ventured to record in all their demerits, are scarcely less atrocious in their hour of their commission, and infinitely more terrible by their extent and duration. And finally, that the crimes perpetrated in a revolutionary movement can in no just estimate be imputed to the innovators, that they were endangered by the preceding oppression and ought to be regarded as the last struggles of expiring tyranny. But, not to repeat the arguments that have already been fully exhibited, it must be recollected that the benefits which innovators may seem to promise are not to be regarded as certain. After all, it may not be utterly impossible that in the nature of man will always remain, for the most part, unaltered, and that he will be found incapable of that degree of knowledge and constancy, which seem essential to a liberal democracy or a pure equality. However cogent may be the arguments for the practicality of human improvement, is it then justifiable upon the merits of predictions to expose mankind to the greatest calamities? Who that has a just conception of the nature of human understanding will vindicate such a proceeding? A careful inquirer is always detecting his past errors. Each year of his life produces a severe comment upon the opinions of the last. He suspects all judgment and is certain of none. We wander in the midst of appearances, and plausible appearances are to be found on all sides. The wisest men perhaps have generally proved the most confirmed skeptics. Speculations, therefore, upon the new modes in which human affairs may be combined, different from any that occur in the history of past ages, may seem fitter to amuse of acuteness and leisure than to be depended on in deciding the dearest interest of mankind. Proceedings, the effects of which have been verified by experiences, furnish a sure ground of dependence that the most labored reason can afford us in regard to schemes as yet untried. 
Undoubtedly, in the views here detailed there is considerable force, and it would be well if persons who are eager to effect abrupt change in human society would give them attentive consideration. They do not, however, sufficiently apply to the question proposed to be examined. Our inquiry was not respecting revolution, but disquisition. We are not concerned to vindicate any species of violence. We do not assume that leveling principles are to be acted upon through the medium of force. We have simply affirmed that he who is persuaded of their truth ought to endeavor to render them a subject of attention. To be convinced of this, we only have to consider the enormous and unquestionable political evils that are daily before our eyes, and the probability there is that, by temperate investigation, these evils may be undermined with little or no to military concussion. In every affair of human life, we are obliged to act upon a single probability, and therefore, while it is highly worthy of a conscientious philanthropist to recollect the universal uncertainty of opinion, he is bound not to abstain from acting, with caution and sobriety upon the judgments of his understanding, from a fear lest, at the time that he intends to produce benefits, he should unintentionally be the occasion of evil. But there is another consideration worth of serious attention in this place. Granting, for a moment, the utmost weight to the objections of those who remind us of the mischiefs of political experiments, it is proper to ask, can we suppress discussion? Can we arrest the progress of the inquiring mind? If we can, it must be by the most unmitigated despotism. Intellect has a perpetual tendency to proceed. It cannot be held back, but by a power that counteracts its genuine tendency through every moment of its existence. Tyrannical and sanguinary must be the measures employed for this purpose. Miserable and disgustful must be the scene they produce. Their results will be barbarism, ignorance, superstition, servility, hypocrisy. This is the alternative, so far as there is any alternative in their choice, to which those who are empowered to consult for the general welfare must inevitably resort if the suppression of inquiry be the genuine dictate of public interest. Such has been, for the most part, the policy of government through every age of the world. Have we slaves? We assiduously retain them in ignorance. Have we colonies and dependencies? The great effort of our care is to keep them from being populous and prosperous. Have we subjects? It is by impotence and misery that we endeavor to render them supple. Plenty is fit only to make them unmanageable disobedient, and mutinous. If this were the true philosophies of social institutions, well might we shrink from it with horror. How tremendous an abortion would the human species be, if all that tended to invigorate their understandings tended to make them unprincipled and profligated. In the meantime, it ought not to be forgotten that to say that a knowledge of political truth can be injurious to the true interest of mankind is to affirm and express contradiction. Political truth is that science which teaches us to weigh in the balance of an accurate judgment, the different proceedings that may be adopted, for the purpose of giving welfare and prosperity to communities of men. The only way in which discussion can be reasonable object of terror is by its power of giving to falsehood. Under certain circumstances, the speciousness of truth, or by that partial propagation, the tendency of which is to be intoxicated and misled those understandings that, by an adequate instruction, would have been sobered and enlightened. These considerations will scarcely permit us to doubt that it is the duty of governments to maintain the most inflexible neutrality, and of individuals to publish the truth with which they appear to be acquainted. The more truth is discovered, the more it is known in its true dimensions, and not in parts. The less is it possible that it should coalesce with, or leave room for the effects of error. The true philanthropist, instead of suppressing discussion, will be eager to take a share in the scene, to exert the full strength of his faculties in investigation, and to contribute by his exertion to render the operation of inquiry at once perspicuous and profound. The condition of the human species at the present hour is critical and alarming. We are not without grounds of reasonable hope that the issue will be uncommonly beneficial. There is, however, much to apprehend from the narrow views and angry passions of the contending parties. Every interval that can be gained, provided it is not an interval of torpor and indifference, is perhaps to be considered in the light of an advantage. Meanwhile, 
In proportion as the just apprehension of explosion shall increase, there are high duties incumbent upon every branch of the community. First, upon those who are fitted to be precursors to their fellows in the discovery of truth. They are bound to be active, indefatigable, and disinterested. It is incumbent upon them to abstain from inflammatory language and expressions of acrimony and resentment. It is absurd in any government to erect itself into a court of criticism in this respect and to establish a criterion of liberty and decorum. But, for that very reason, it is doubly incumbent on those who communicate their thoughts to the public to exercise a rigid censor over themselves. The lessons of liberty and equality are lessons of good will to all order of men. They free the peasant from the inequity that depresses his mind, and the privilege from the luxury and despotism which he is corrupted. It is disgraceful to those who teach these lessons if they stain their benignity by showing that that benignity has not become the inmate of their hearts. Nor is it less necessary that they should express themselves with explicitness and sincerity. No maxim can be more suspicious than that which teaches us to consult the temper of the times, and tell only as much as we can imagine our contemporaries will be able to bear. This practice is at present almost universal, and it will perhaps not be difficult to observe its pernicious effects. We retell and mangle truth. We impact it to our fellows, not with the liberal measures with which we have received it, but with such parsimony as our own miserable prudence may chance to prescribe. That we may deceive others with a tranquil conscience, we begin with deceiving ourselves. We put shackles upon our mind, and dare not trust ourselves at large in the pursuit of truth. This practice seems to have been greatly promoted by the machinations of party and the desire of one wise and adventurous leader to lead a troop of weak, timid, and selfish adherents in his train. There can scarcely be a sufficient reason why I should not declare in any assembly upon the face of the earth that I am a Republican. There is no more reason to apprehend that, being a Republican under a monarchical government, I shall enter into a desperate faction to invade the public tranquility than if I were monarchical under a republic. Every community of men, as well as every individual, must govern itself according to its ideas of justice. What I should desire is not by violence to change its institutions, but by discussions to change its ideas. I have no concern. If I would study merely the public good, with factions or intrigue, but simply to promulgate the truth and to wait the tranquil progress and conviction. If there be any assembly that cannot bear this of such an assembly, I ought to be no member. It probably happens much oftener than we are willing to imagine that the post of honor, or which is better, the post of utility, is a private station. The dissimulation here censored, beside its ill effect upon him who practices it, and, by degrading and unnerving his character, upon society at large, has a particular ill consequence with respect to the point we are considering. It lays a mine and prepares an explosion. This is a tendency of all unnatural restraint. The unfettered progress of investigation is perhaps always salutary. Its advances are gradual, and each step prepares the general mind for that which is to follow. They are sudden and unprepared, and therefore necessarily partial. Emanations of Truth that have the greatest tendency to deprive men of their sobriety and self-command. Reserve in this respect is calculated at once to give a rugged and angry tone to the multitude, whenever they shall happen to discover what is thus concealed and to mislead the disputaries of political power. It soothes them into false security and prompts them to maintain an inauspicious obstinacy. Having considered what it is that belongs in such a crisis to the enlightened and wise, let us next turn our attention to a very different class of society, the rich and great. And here, in the first place, it may be remarked that it is a false calculation that leads us universally to despair of having these for the advocates of political justice. Mankind are not so miserably selfish as satirists and couturiers have supposed. We perhaps have never engaged in any action of moment without having inquired what is the decision of justice respecting it. We are at all times anxious to satisfy ourselves that what our inclination led us to do is innocence and right to be done. Since therefore justice occupies so large a share in the contemplation of the human mind, it cannot reasonably be doubted 
that a strong and commanding view of justice would prove a powerful motive to influence the choice of that description of men we are now considering. But that virtue which, for whatever reason, we have chosen, soon becomes recommended to us by a thousand other reasons. We find in it reputation, honor, and self-complacency. In addition to the recommendations it derives from impartial justice, the rich and great are far from callous to views of general felicity, when such views are brought before them with that evidence and attraction of which they are susceptible. From one dreadful disadvantage their minds are free. They have not been soared with unrelenting tyranny or narrowed by the perpetual pressure of distress. They are peculiarly qualified to judge of the emptiness of that pomp and those gratifications, which are always most admired when they are seen from a distance. They will frequently be found considerably indifferent to these things, unless confirmed by habit and rendered inveterate by age. If he show them the attractions of gallantry and magnanimity in resigning them, they will often be resigned without reluctance. Wherever accident of any sort has introduced an active mind, their enterprise is a necessary consequence. And there are few persons so inactive as to sit down forever in the supine enjoyment of the indulgences to which they were born. The same spirit that has led forth the young nobility of successive ages to encounter the hardships of a camp might render them the champions of the cause of equality. Nor is it to be believed that the consideration of superior virtue in this latter exertion will be without its effect. But let us suppose a considerable party of the rich and great to be actuated by no view but to their emolument and ease. It is not difficult to show them that their interests in this sense will admit of no more than a temperate and yielding resistance. To such we may say, it is in vain for you to fight against truth. It is like endeavoring with the human hand to stop the inroad of the ocean. Be wise betimes. Seek your safety in concession. If you will not come over to the standard of political justice, temporize at least with an enemy whom you cannot overcome. Much, inexpressibly much, depends upon you. If your proceedings be moderate and judicious, it is not probable that you will suffer the privation, even of that injurious indulgence and accommodation to which you are so strongly attached. The genuine progress of political improvement is kind and attentive to the sentiments of all. It changes the opinions of men by insensible degrees, produces nothing by shock and abruptness, and is far from requiring the calamity of any. Confiscation and the prescription of bodies of men form no branch of its story. These evils, which by wise and sober men will always be regretted, will in all probability never occur unless brought on by your indiscretion and obstinacy. Even in the very tempest and the fury of explosion, if such an event shall arise, it may perhaps still be in your power to make advantageous conditions, and to be little or nothing suffers by the change. Above all, do not be lulled into a rash and headlong security. Do not imagine that innovation is not at hand, or that the spirit of innovation can be defeated. We have already seen how much the hypocrisy and instability of the wise and enlightened of the present day, those who confess much and have a confused view of still more, but dare not examine the whole with a steady of unshrinking eyes, are calculated to increase the security. But there is a danger still more palpable. Do not be misled by the unthinking and seemingly general cry of those who have no fixed principles. Addresses have been found in every age, a very uncertain criterion of the future conduct of a people. Do not count upon the numerous trains of your adherents, retainers, and servants. They afford a feeble dependence. They are men, and cannot be unconcerned as to the interest and claims of mankind. Some of them will adhere to you, as long as a sordid interest seems to draw them in that direction. But the moment yours shall appear to be the losing cause, the same interest will carry them over to the enemy's standard. They will disappear like the morning mists. Can it be supposed that you are incapable of receiving impression from another argument? Will you feel no compunction at the thought of resisting the greatest of all benefits? Are you content to be regarded by your impartial contemporaries and to be recollected as long as your memory shall endure as the obstinate adversary of philanthropy and justice? Can you reconcile it to your own minds that for a sordid interest, for the cause of a general corruption and abuse, you shall be found active in stifling truth and strangling the newborn happiness of mankind?
would it were possible to make this argument felt by the enlightened and accomplished by advocates of aristocracy that they could be persuaded to consult neither passion nor prejudice nor the reveries of imagination in deciding so momentous a question we know i would say the truth will be triumphant even though you refuse to be her ally we do not fear your enmity but our hearts bleed to see such gallantry talent and virtue employed in perpetuating the calamities of mankind we recollect with grief that the lustries of your merits shall fill distant generations with astonishment they will not be less astonished that you could be made the dupes of prejudice and deliberately surrender the larger portion of the good you might have achieved and the unqualified affection that might have pursued your memory footnote while this sheet is in the press of a third impression, I received the intelligence of the death of Burke, who was principally in the author's mind. While he penned this preceding sentence, in all that is most exalted in talents, I regard him as inferior of no man ever adjourned to the face of earth, and I can find for him every few equals. In subtlety of discrimination, in magnitude of conception, in sagacity and profoundness of judgment, he was never surpassed. But his characteristic excellencies were vividness and justness of painting, and that boundless wealth of imagination that adored the most ungrateful subjects, and heightened the most interesting. Of this wealth he was too lavish, and though it is impossible for the man of taste not to derive gratification from almost every one of his images and metaphors while it passes before him, yet their exuberance subtracts in no inconsiderable degree from the irresistibleness and rapidity of general effect, which is the highest excellence of composition. No impartial man can recall Burke to his mind without confessing the grandeur and integrity of his feelings of morality and being convinced that he was so eminently both a patriot and philanthropist. His excellencies, however, were somewhat tinctured with a vein of dark and saturnine temper, so that the same man strangely united the degree of the rude character of his native island with an urbanity and a susceptibility of the kinder affection that have rarely been paralleled. But his principal defect consisted in this, that the false estimate as to the things entitled to our difference. End of footnote. To the general mass of the adherents of equality, it may be proper to address a few words. If there be any force in the arguments of this work, we seem authorized to deduce thus much from them, that truth is irresistible. Let then this axiom be the rudder of an undertaking. Let us not precipitately endeavor to accomplish that today, which the dissemination of truth will make unavoidable tomorrow. Let us not overanxiously watch for occasions and events, of particular events the ascendancy of truth is independent. Let us anxiously refrain from violence, Force is not conviction, and is extremely unworthy of the cause of justice. Let us admit into our bosom neither contempt, animosity, resentment, nor revenge. The cause of justice is just the cause of humanity. Its advocates should be penetrated with a universal goodwill. We should love this cause, for it conduces the general happiness of mankind. We should love it. For there is not a man that lives who, in the natural and tranquil progress of things, will not be made happier by its approach. The most powerful circumstance by which it has been retarded is the mistake of its adherence. The air of ruggedness, brutishness, and inflexibility which they have given to that which, in itself, is all benignity. Nothing less than this could have prevented the great mass of inquiries from bestowing upon it a patient examination. Be it the care of the now increasing advocates of equality to remove this obstacle to the success of their cause. We have but two plain duties, which, if we set out right, it is not easy to mistake. The first is an unwearied attention to the great instrument of justice, reason. We should communicate our sentiment with the utmost frankness. We should endeavor to press them upon the attention of others. and this, we should give way to no discouragement. We should sharpen our intellectual weapons, add to the stock of our knowledge, be pervaded with a sense of magnitude of our cause, and perpetually add to that calm presence of mind and self-possession which most enable us to do justice to our principles. Our second duty is tranquility. It will not be right to pass over a question that will inevitably suggest itself to the mind of the reader. If an equalization of condition be to take place not by law, regulation or public institution 
but only through the private conviction of individuals. Start a footnote. Admiration, which could alone render the aristocracy with whom he lived unjust to his worth, and some degree infected his own mind. He therefore sought wealth and plunged in expense, instead of cultivating the simplicity of independence, and he entangled himself with a petty combination of political men, instead of reserving his illustrious talents unwarped for the advancement of intellect and the service of mankind. He has unfortunately left us a memorable example of the power of a corrupt system of government to undermine and divert from your genuine purposes the noblest faculties that have yet been exhibited to the observation of the world. End of footnote. In what manner shall it begin? In answering this question, it is not necessary to prove so simple a proposition as that all republicanism, all reduction of rank and immunities, strongly tends towards an equalization of conditions. If men go on to improve in discernment, and this they certainly will with peculiar rapidity, when the ill-constructed governments which now retard their progress are removed, the same arguments which showed them the injustice of ranks will show them the injustice of one man's wanting that which, while it is in the possession of another, conduces in no respect to his well-being. It is a common error to imagine that this injustice will be felt only by the lower orders who suffer from it. And from thence to conclude that it can only be corrected by violence, but in answer to this, it may, in the first place, be observed that all suffer from it, the rich who engross, as well as the poor who want. Secondly, it has been endeavored to be shown, in the course of the present work, that men are not so entirely governed by self-interest, as has frequently been supposed. It appears, if possible, still more clearly, that the selfish are not governed solely by sensual gratification or the love of gain, but that the desire of eminence and distinction is, in different forms, an universal passion. Thirdly and principally, the progress of truth is the most powerful of all causes. Nothing can be more improbable than to imagine that theory, in the best sense of the word, is not essentially connected with practice. That which we can be persuaded clearly and distinctly to approve will inevitably modify our conduct. When men shall habitually perceive the folly of individual splendor, and when their neighbors are impressed with a similar disdain, it will be impossible they should pursue the means of it with the same avidity as before. It will not be difficult to trace, in the progress of modern Europe from barbarism to refinement, a tendency towards the equalization of conditions. In the feudal times, as now in India and other parts of the world, men were born to a certain station, and it was nearly impossible for a peasant to rise to the rank of a noble. Except the nobles, there were no men that were rich. For commerce, either external or internal, had scarcely an existence. Commerce was one engine for throwing down this seemingly impregnable barrier and shocking the prejudices of nobles, who were sufficiently willing to believe that their retainers were a different species of being from themselves. Learning was another and more powerful engine. In all ages of the church, we see men of the basis origin rising to the highest eminence. Commerce proved that others could rise to wealth besides those who were cased in mail. But learning proved that the lowborn were capable of surpassing their lords. The progressive effect of these ideas may easily be traced. Long after learning began to unfold its powers, its Voltaire still submitted to those obsequious manners and servile dedications, which no man reviews at the present day without astonishment. It is but lately that men have known that intellectual excellence can accomplish its purpose without a patron. At present, among the civilized and well-informed, a man of slender income, but of great intellectual powers and a firm and virtuous mind, is constantly received with attention and difference, and his purse-proud neighbor, who should attempt to treat him superciliously, is sure to encounter a general disapprobation. The inhabitants of distant villages, where long-established prejudices are slowly destroyed, would be astonished to see how comparatively small a share of wealth has in determining the degree of attention with which men are treated in enlightened circles. These, no doubt, are but slight indications. It is with morality in this respect as it is with politics. The progress is at first so slow as for the most part to elude the observation of mankind, nor can it be adequately perceived by the contemplation and comparison of events during a considerable portion of time. After a certain interval, the scene is more fully unfolded, 
and the advances appeared more rapid and decisive. While wealth was everything, it was to be expected that men would acquire it, though at the expense of conscience and integrity. The abstract ideas of justice had not yet been so concentrated to be able to overpower what dazzles the eyes, or promises a momentary gratification. In proportion, as the monopolies of rank and corporation are abolished, the value of superfluity will decline. In proportion, as republicanism gains ground, men will be estimate for what they are, and not for their accidental appendages. Let us reflect on the gradual consequences of this revolution of opinion. Liberality of dealing will be among its earliest results, and, of consequence, accumulation will become less frequent and enormous. Men will not be disposed, as now, to take advantage of each other's distresses. They will not consider how much they can extort, but how much it is reasonable to require. The master tradesman who employs laborers under him will be disposed to give a more ample reward to their industry, which he is at present enabled to tax, chiefly by the accidental advantage of possessing a capital. Liberality on the part of his employer will complete in the mind of the artisan. What ideas of political justice will probably have begun? He will no longer spend the surplus of his earnings in that dissipation, which is one of the principal of those causes that at present subject him to the arbitrary pleasure of a superior. He will escape from the irresolution of slavery and the fetters of despair, and perceive that independence and ease are scarcely less within his reach than that of any other member of the community. This is an obvious step towards the still further progression, in which the laborer will receive entire whatever the consumer may be required to pay, without having a capitalist, an idle and useless monopolizer, as he will then be found to fatten upon his spoils. The same sentiments that led to liberality of dealing will also lead to liberality of distribution. The trader, who is unwilling to grow rich by extorting from his customers or his workmen, will also refuse to become rich by the not inferior injustice of withholding from his indigent neighbor the gratuitous supply of which he stands in need. The habit which was created in the former case of being contented with the moderate gains is closely connected with the habit of being contented with a slender accumulation. He that is not anxious to add to his heap will not be reluctant by a benevolent distribution to prevent its increase. Wealth was at one period almost a single object of pursuit that presented itself to the gross and uncultivated mind. Various objects will hereafter divide men's attention, the love of liberty, the love of equality, the pursuits of art, and the desire of knowledge. These objects will not, as now, be confined to a few, but will gradually be laid open to all. The love of liberty obviously leads to a sentiment of union, and a disposition to sympathize in the concerns of others. The general diffusion of truth will be productive of general improvement, and men will daily approximate towards those views according to which every object will be appreciated at its true value. Add to which, that the improvement of which we speak is public, and not individual. The progress is the progress of all. Each man will find his sentiments of justice and rectitude echoed by the sentiments of his neighbors. Apostasy will be made imminently improbable, because the apostasy will incur not only his own censor, but the censor of every beholder. One objection may perhaps be inferred from the consideration. If the inevitable progress of improvement insensibly led towards equality, what need was there to purposing it to a specific object to men's consideration? The answer to this objection is easy. The improvements in question consist in the knowledge of truth, but our knowledge will be very imperfect, so long as this great branch of universal justice falls to constitute a part of it. All truth is useful. Can this truth, which is perhaps the most fundamental of all moral principles, be without its benefit? Whatever be the object towards which mind irresistibly advances, it is of no mean importance to us have a distinct view of that object. Our advances will thus become accelerated. It is a well-known principle of morality that he who proposes perfection to himself, though he will inevitably fall short of what he pursues, will make a more rapid progress than he who is contented to aim only at what is imperfect. The benefits to be derived in the internal from a view of equality at one of the great objects to which we are tending are exceedingly conspicuous. Such a view will strongly conduce to make us disinterested, now will teach us to look with contempt upon mercantile speculation. Commercial prosperity and the cares of gain 
it will impress us with a just apprehension of what it is of which man is capable, and in which his perfection consists, and will fix our ambition and activity upon the worthiest objects. Intellect cannot arrive at any great and illustrious attainment. However, much the nature of intellect may carry us towards it, without feeling some presages of its approach, and it is reasonable to believe that the earlier these presages are introduced and the more distinct they are made, the more auspicious will be the event. The End End of Section 53 Recording by Henry Rosales End of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness Volume 2 by William Godwin